What exactly is a strange game? A strange game is a definition I've made up that fits as a loosely defined genre of games that feel kind of off. Something that feels kind of obscure, unnerving, or just have that aura of being kind of unusual compared to other games. This feeling is especially strong in older or more obscure title is, but it's like a sixth sense. Something that just makes your skin crawl or makes you feel weird for some reason. The definition is loose and basically fits to whatever game I'm talking about at a current moment, but I've accumulated quite a collection of strange games I've talked about in 2023 alone. This is a compilation of those very strange games for your enjoyment. Sit back and relax, prepare to analyze everything, or use it for sleep aid, because here are 2023's strangest games. I've been trying to think of an exceptionally witty and clever metaphor to sum up this game in a single sentence, but with this game, that's a completely impossible task. This is a game where you can explore alien ruins, pilot a drill to break through a wall, interact with an ancient alien script to open up sacred compartments, which leads you to a movie theater, which is leads you to a void where you don a mech suit and shoot a bunch of eyes with laser blasts, that leads you to a meeting with your therapist where she congratulates you on becoming a god. And the title of the game is permanently changed. This all happens within 10 minutes of playing the game. This is Indigo Parallel, an indie game released in November of 2022. It was developed by one single developer over the course of about 4 or 5 years, Chris Danlian. All of this, and this, and this, was developed by one man tirelessly working on the Unity engine year on and year out. If you take anything away from this video, it's to buy and play this game. I don't care if it ruins my watch rate, go buy this game on Steam right now, because it's so much better of an experience to play it and be completely blindsided rather than me explaining anything at all. But, I don't mind explaining it to you. I hope you're comfortable, because I have quite a bit to say. The sole developer, Chris, is an interesting guy. He was entrenched in the television industry before leaving to pursue game development. Indigo isn't his first game, mind you. He had one prior that I haven't played, because trying to get the Quest 2 to connect to the computer is kind of like trying to rig your microwave to explode. So, what's this game about? Exploring the Steam page, we're told that we play the role of Tom, someone who is hopelessly in love with someone named Daisy. Who is Tom? This is Tom. Maybe. Who is Daisy? This is Daisy. Maybe. If it wasn't obvious enough, this game is very psychedelic and a lot to take in at once. Don't just take my word for it, the Steam page describes it as such. Take Chris's word for it. The term psychedelic is tossed around more than a blunt, but the term can't be more accurate when its direct inspiration is LSD Dream Emulator. Dream Emulator was an original PlayStation game hailed as a cult classic after it came out only in Japan. It rejects the typical idea of what a video game is and could be by restricting how much the player can do. All you're able to do is just move around and sometimes interact with objects. It's much more of an interactable art gallery than a traditional video game. There isn't really a core objective. Indigo Parallel wears this inspiration on its sleeve. Despite being made in the obviously more advanced Unity engine, all you must do is walk around and interact with the E key or left mouse button to flick switches and press buttons to progress. Even a cursory glance at both games reveal just how closely it follows in LSD's footsteps. Colors are intentionally garishly mishmashed without any consideration to balance or complementing. We've got piss yellows, puke greens, other disgusting colors brought front and center to make you feel as uneasy as possible. The texture work is doing a lot of the heavy lifting for said uncomfortable feeling. Flesh and body parts and mechanical tubes and platings are bolted together haphazardly. Let's talk about this wall for example. These little cubes are clumped together like Lovecraftian sardines. The faint hues of distorted flesh almost reach through the screen to assault your nose. The eyes, I think they're eyes, perhaps they're chocolate starfish, are always watching you. Eyes are something that constantly show up. You're always being watched in some form, either by floating eyes in the distance or part of the fantastical landscapes you're walking through. Distorted faces are something you're gonna have to get used to. Eyes, mouths, and lips take great interest in observing you wherever you choose to go. The environments you walk around easily switch from theme to theme like the tide of the ocean. 
Ancient temples, movie theaters, forests, and space all merge and blend into each other with a way that clashes so offensively that it wraps back around to being seamless. The backgrounds and foregrounds are often stock photos woven around and above you. Everything about this game makes you feel small and insignificant in the face of the impressive breadth of the world around. Tom's delusions about religion and being observed and judged are at the forefront of his mind, which loops into the steps he takes around it. He's always being pursued by the Buddha, haunted by ghosts formed from his scattered and shattered memories of the people he once knew. <laughs> Something about how intentionally low poly everything is makes everything feel uncertain. Like you don't quite know how to picture everything and you have to use your imagination to try and piece it together. It's not that high graphics quality is something of a detriment for the themes and visuals presented, but I feel that's something a lot of games kind of lose. Having to go with the flow and build upon what's almost there versus having a nearly accurate picture of what's going on. At least that's how I feel. I didn't grow up with a PS1, so this exact graphical style isn't something I have any real nostalgic attachment to. I grew up with the Game Boy Advance and PS2, so I enjoyed teetering the line of the peak of the sprite arts on the handheld and the bridge between the low poly 90s and more realistic proportions and details of the mid 2000s. But somehow this game makes me feel nostalgic for an era I was never even a part of. There's something so palpably poignant about the world Chris was able to craft that makes me appreciative that I get to walk around in Tom's shoes and experience his world, and homesick for a place I've never been to. It's all haunting to experience. Seeing the inside of Tom's mind just reminds us of how human we all are, and how inhuman it can look from an outsider's perspective. It's darkly immersive in a way very few things in media tend to be. However, the stellar visuals are not the only contributing factor to that immersion. Rather than explaining how the music sounds, I'll just let the clips speak for themselves. The music was composed primarily by Decim One? Decim One? Someone quite experienced in the field of music. Don't just take my word for it, here's his YouTube channel talking about it. Hi, Future Peter editing this. I was planning on having a whole segment commenting on a video I'm pretty sure was on his channel talking about the music making process and what instruments he used and whatnot, but for the life of me, I cannot find it. I did not have the foresight to archive it just in case. <sighs> moment of silence for the monumental bra moment that has occurred. What I can say about the music that is good, really good. Putting it lightly, Indigo Parallel, or IP for short, makes good use of its three and a half hour total runtime album length for a very, very interesting experience. Along with each area looking different, it also sounds different. There's a unique track for each location, which does wonders for feeling distinct from one another. Several maps even have the music changed during gameplay progression as well. Making such a large album for such an independent game is no small feat, much less making it all consistently unnerving to listen to on its own. We've established the general vibe and feeling of playing the game, but how does the game operate? Only being able to interact with some buttons and running around doesn't sound too scintillating, but let me reel you back in by explaining it draws heavy inspiration from how the Stanley Parable plays. How do Stanley Parable play? I, I have no idea, I've never played it. Uh, let me try and explain. You always start a playthrough in the same spot this little industrial locker room. This is a game highly dependent on your choices, which path you take and how you choose to interact with objects determine where you end up. Sometimes small choices at a computer terminal determine what areas you must crawl through, which determine what ending you'll get and how you'll get it. There are three endings, I'm pretty sure there's three endings, but they don't play out in the same way. This ending here will either have you be addressed by a stock photo eye monster of a man or a woman determinant of how far you are in the game and what events you've checked off. To punctuate my point, if you get this ending under any circumstances, the title of the game outright changes from Indigo Parallel to Indigo Perpendicular, and it stays like that until you reset your game for the main menu. 
for the love of John, do not accidentally press this button unless you know exactly what you're doing, or start back from square one. Do not make the same mistakes I did. The word non-linear is thrown around a lot because of Steam's lack of quality control for indie games, but with this game, I think there's really something to be said about how it runs with the concept. It runs like these TV guys on legs. Your runs start out the same, but with more events and endings experienced, you can shorten the distances between different events, and have events that were previously discoverable change positions and layouts. Places you've seen many times hold new items you can interact with. Puzzles will be different, there will be a new object or item to touch that challenge how much you really know about the area you thought you explored fully. Things are never the same twice. That is the design philosophy I want you to become very acquainted with. Take it out to dinner, take long walks with it on the beach, get married to it. You can only get so comfortable going through the game because you absolutely don't know what to expect from it at any given moment. And it works phenomenally well with how you can start back in the same room and see how the room is altered and changed by your events. If you're wondering what actions lead to which exact outcomes, you are on your own. I honestly have no idea, you should either ask the developer himself, or just play the game and find out. Or flowchart, you might want a flowchart, that helps too. This is a game begging to be explored from top to bottom and critically analyzed. I've alluded to many times the lands we explore, the mental manifestations of Tom, but we don't really know anything about Tom, do we? What are the environments and the characters in if there isn't any story to tie it all together? As you'd imagine, the narrative is just as scattered and delightfully delirious as the world created, so let me explain. I've shown what Tom might be, but who really is Tom? If the narration is to be believed, he was seemingly an ordinary guy working a boring office job for a company that specializes in some kind of virtual reality augmentation technology. One day, Tom became completely obsessed with the story he was writing. So obsessed that he stopped showing up for work and his health, both physical and mental, began to rapidly decline. When he was on the brink of exhaustion, he found that all the pages he had written down for were actually blank. At his wit's end, he was convinced by his computer monitor to throw himself off the balcony onto the floor, which he does. There's a lot of questions raised by this brief backstory. Tom's history of working in VR could easily pass the entire game as some sort of digital simulation, and there is some narration to back up that example. However, there is just as much, if not more, evidence to side with the second theory, that Tom is experiencing a severe mental breakdown and it all has to do with Daisy. Daisy is the woman Tom is furiously infatuated with. We can hear conversations with her and Tom about needing him to take some kind of prescription pills, which heavily implies that she's either someone incredibly close to him and would know that kind of information, or some kind of psychologist prescribing him. We know those two are close enough to the point where they can know intimate details about each other's lives, so perhaps Tom's worsening mental condition is presenting tremendous strain on their relationship, which takes his already worsening headspace into a much more scalogical direction. The story is about as confusing as you would think it is for a game like this. The LSD of its PS1 inspiration has been swapped out with whatever antipsychotic pills Tom's refusing to take. Or he might be taking them, I, I don't know. You must understand that every piece of evidence that leans one way is counterbalanced by another piece of evidence hinting and implying the complete opposite thing. It's all a very roundabout way of saying, if you were expecting this to have a linear story, what were you thinking? I must tell you that I've shared maybe one-fifth of what the game has to offer in total. I've talked about one ending and a handful of the different locations the game has to offer. I would be remiss if I didn't keep something secret so I could entice you to play it on your own time. The secrets, oh yeah, the secrets! There are so many different secret areas and items to find that are all hinted at with a Steam achievement and nothing else. I've gotten all the endings and seen about three-fourths of all the locations, but I haven't even gotten most of the achievements. There isn't a lot of documentation on the game, given its obscurity, so who knows? Maybe you'll be the first to find something only the developer knows about. The game took me about 5 hours to get all the endings, which is a lot more impressive than it may sound. A single developer making the game off the chain and meant to be replayed tends to make games that aren't very long, but you can easily spend hours and hours getting lost in the worlds Chris has crafted. I don't want to spoil anything else, so I'll cut some of that discussion here. What do I rate this game in full? Well, there are some issues I should speak about, because this isn't a perfect game. What are its main issues? Well, there's two of them I should bring up. Well, for one, it just... Yeah, the technical issues are something that might depend on your machine, but for me, trying to get the some things to work proved very tricky. 
The game ran fine on its default settings of 60 FPS and high quality textures, but for some reason OBS would not record longer than one minute of usable footage at a time before it instantly got bottlenecked. Shadowplay was how I got most of my footage, but I must warn you that the game can be a little unpredictable. It isn't uncommon to sometimes experience bugs or just the game outright crashing, which might be hard to document because of the game's nature. There was one part on the screen that I kept shaking that if I moved my mouse it would shake, but I had to keep moving it for 5 minutes and to this day I honestly don't know if that was intentional or the bug just kept me from progressing. Outright game breaking bugs are few and very far in between. The game's frequent autosaves mitigate your progress being wiped or halted, thankfully, and Chris continues to make regular bug faces update to this day. I sort of expected some things to be rougher on the edges given the game's solo nature, but it's still a little frustrating nonetheless when you're incredibly immersed in an area then the whole program freaks out and you must try and remember how to get back there and try and redo the puzzle. The second issue I have is a little bit more subjective. As much as I admire the inspirations it takes from LSD and Stanley Parable, they do sometimes feel a little on the nose. Last week on my community posts, I've been posting out of context screenshots, not that the context would make it any more explainable, and just about everyone assumed I was covering LSD Dream Simulator. So it wasn't so much that it was taking gameplay inspirations from LSD as it was just kind of lifting some things directly from it. I, I mean, you see the Grey Man at some point, it's a little obvious, which might not be everyone's cup of tea. This is a game following in the footsteps rather than carving out a 100% distinct identity for itself. I don't mean to imply it's some kind of copycat, but just to explain that it wears its inspirations on its sleeve, which I don't entirely think is a bad thing. Not everyone is looking for brand new experiences. It's totally okay to be comfortable indulging in something you already like. I haven't personally played Stanley Parable, but from the testimonies from my friends who have, they said it's pretty similar narrative structure-wise, what was starting off in a similar area and having branching paths and endings and decisions that massively impact your further playing experience. Oh yeah, Indigo Parallel has achievements too. Not a whole host of them, but enough to point you in directions you might not have seen otherwise. Honestly, those are my two biggest issues with the game. I think that Indigo Parallel is an incredibly strong and underappreciated game that deserves so much more love than it currently has. The game teaches us not to become too self-absorbed in our own heads, to not neglect the real world in favor of our fantasies because it's easier to retreat to somewhere when we have the full control. The hostile and puzzling lands of Tom's mind could easily represent his confusion and inability to connect with people but also himself. The human mind can be a beautiful, creative organ, but it can also be a terrifying, isolating organ. How we're able to see the world might not always be in our direct control but sometimes people just need to speak to each other and take something that puts them where they need to be. Doing the best they can do by being the best they can be. Tom isn't being granted the ability to sustain a happy positive life because of his invasive delusions and growing misopathy, but most of us are granted with that. We can put it to good use by understanding ourselves and the world around us, and if we can't, that's what other people are there for. Don't be Tom be yourself. And Indigo Parallel kind of helped me realize that. At the end of the day, standing where I'm standing, flaws and all, I must rate Indigo Parallel 4 out of 5 stars. Hats off to you, Chris. I'm delighted I got to experience this game blind, and I can only hope that others heed my words and felt what I felt by playing the games themselves. It's my goal with this channel to talk about and play as many strange, unnerving, and creepy games as possible, so stick around the channel and stay tuned for more weekly uploads. Until then, have a lovely rest of your day. Blaze Blue doesn't make any sense. Despite stylistically missing the E, you're required to toss aside your understanding of the English language and simply accept that the pronunciation is Blaze Blue. It's the strongest ringing endorsement to the stupendous success of a series of four fighting games can immediately filter out anyone who hasn't played any of them by how they pronounce the title of the franchise. That might seem impressive if you're paying attention to what I'm saying, provided you aren't one of the many who are still in disbelief at the runtime of this video. For any newcomers, I typically indulge in the comfortable video length of over 20 minutes, less than 40, which makes my departure from that format something I must address immediately. As lengthy and wordy as this entire project ends up being, I feel that every minute is necessary, critical, to explain my understanding, interpretations, analysis, and opinions about this gargantuan franchise that has become an exponentially more favored and colossal pillar in my life. I have spent countless hours per week 
playing the games, reading wikis, listening to its music, reading its additional adaptations in the form of novels and manga, watching and reading developer interviews, and contacting people in the community for second opinions. My earlier drafts of the script were not able to account for the lengths I would go to and how long I would end up speaking on specific subjects relating to the franchise, which is reflected in how long it took to craft the very first part of what will be end up becoming a video series retrospective and analysis made up of four different videos. Number one being what you're watching right at this moment. Not you. You don't count. I plan, at least for the moment I am writing this script, to have a dedicated video for each main installment of the franchise. This video will be for Calamity Trigger, the next for Continuum Shift, the one after that, Chrono Phantasma, then finish with Central Fiction. I'm unsure if supplementary material like manga and the anime adaptation will have their own dedicated sections in other projects or be mentioned as part of a mandatory cursory glance for comparison. So consider the full review of games like x plays Crossplays? I don't know. Up in the air until further notice. I also can't promise any release dates for those future three videos. This one video took quite a bit of time, and the other three will only end up longer and more thorough. I understand my lack of 100% concrete planning and structure might sometimes become troublesome down the line, so I understand some confusion from my audience. I must refute that and say there is no higher form of flattery than imitation, and I have been inspired by Blaze Blue's experimental and impulsive nature by going with the flow and doing what feels right in the moment, as much as I can while balancing proper formatting and the pacing I've elected to follow, ideally. The structure of all four videos shall go as follows. Each topic has its own dedicated section slash chapter listed in the description below with an allotted timestamp to indicate when they begin and end. Some topics are obviously linked together through what I mentioned from previous segments, but I have intentionally crafted this video not to discourage anyone from jumping from whatever topics they please whenever they want. Just don't be upset when you don't understand certain segments, because you've likely skipped over some information I've provided. If you aren't interested in hearing me explain something like development history or the basic mechanics of the game, your experience won't be too mucked. I do ask that people in the comments section be careful with talking about story events or details featured in later games. These games are fairly old and their stories have been told, but I am specifically judging Calamity Trigger on its own merits, so please don't be confused when I don't mention something that was explained later on. I will repeat some points from other segments to help color my arguments, but I don't advertise that as a problem given the length of the video. You will certainly forget at least one of the times I mentioned something because of the segmentation of the chapters. The game's modes are the primary feature of discussion, but other topics such as a brief history of the game's development and a breakdown of the game's characters and story after I've engaged with their respective modes will be present, then punctuated by a conclusion after everything is addressed adequately. The main goal present of this video is a retrospective from my own perspective and experience, but my aim is twofold. I want someone who has never played this game or series to walk away with at least a half-decent understanding of the game, and hopefully a desire to play it afterwards. Or at least play Central Fiction. No one plays it the ones online. This series of videos will appease people who are only interested in specific segments, and those who opt to start from the very beginning and reach the conclusion while you play this in the background while playing Minecraft or falling asleep. Of course, there will be complimentary visuals to make this a satisfying and entertaining piece to watch, but still caters to people who prefer an auditory experience. I should take this time to mention during the introduction that I am not an expert or even a seasoned fighting game player. Please understand that my closest equivalent is Mortal Kombat, which is not a very apt comparison given their wildly different mechanics. For a lot of terminology and discussions of game balance and matchups I don't offhandedly know, I am consulting two primary sources. The Dustloop Wiki, which acts as a hub for just about all information you could want for Blaze Blue's Punisher, Arc System Works games, and some friends on Discord who are more knowledgeable in the culture and topics than I. I highly recommend you make as much fun of me as you want for being a noob, both because commenting boosts my video's performance in the hell on earth that is the YouTube algorithm and I always welcome critique and insight. I felt the need to disclose that info at the start to warn that this is perspective of a relative newcomer to the genre. I typically detest asking for the typical content creator platitudes right at the start of a video. If you've seen my other videos, which you should turn into by the way, you'll know that. 
But given the extraordinary length of this script, editing, footage recording, and project in its entirety, I feel I am at least a little justified in asking, if you like this or similar content from me, you are more than welcome to subscribe and share the video to anyone you feel would enjoy it. As much as I would like to shill Patreon, I am not relevant enough to have an account yet. This is also my endorsement, this video is not sponsored, though, so don't expect any obnoxious abrupt cutoffs to talk about a subpar razor. I do ask that you understand that I am only human, and simply cannot speak about every single small detail this game has to offer. I'm confident that I can cover the essentials and everything I really had to say something about, but there will likely be small details I've overlooked, either by choice of omission or I simply forgot to mention something really funny. It wouldn't be spectacularly entertaining to cover every single bit of dialogue or comb over frame data, so just look on Dustloop in the wiki if you want that. I have a limited amount of time to put into the scripting, recording, and editing of this project, so I ask that you understand. If not for me and the sake of my health, then the sake of my hands and ass, which have been in jeopardy during the creation of this titanic project. They're quite sore, as you can imagine. One last thing, for the sake of the review, I will primarily be talking about and showcasing footage from the Steam release of Calamity Trigger, as well as contrasting with the Xbox 360 release of the same game. All footage you see will be of Calamity Trigger, will come from the PC version, because my religion does not allow console capture cards. So just listen closely when I have to talk about the 360 version. There is a significant reason why I've chosen the topics that I have, that will be explained later. Without further delay, allow me to take you on a journey through the Azure, and talk extensively about Blaze Blue Calamity Trigger, henceforth referred to as CT for simplicity. In the begotten times of the late 2000s, the fighting game genre was in an interesting place. Coinciding with the rapid increase in technology at the time, many fighters chose to become three-dimensional and stick that way, see franchises like Mortal Kombat. 2D fighters were still very much a thing, especially with titles like Street Fighter, but they made the jump to 2.5D, typically involving three-dimensionally modeled characters fighting on a two-dimensional plane. I'm hardly alone in saying that a lot of 3D models tend to show their age quickly, if not immediately at launch. Which wasn't the issue for sprite-based fighters, most relevant to this topic, Guilty Gear. Published by Arc System Works, the creator of just about half of the relevant fighting game in the last decade, and developed by the quote, Red Team, Guilty Gear was their flagship franchise, until it wasn't. This series' development and history is worthy of its own separate coverage, but for now, understand that Guilty Gear got into some hot water when the company that sort of owned it, Sammy, merged with Sega. The whole situation is confusing and not very well documented in English, as I understand it. So, Arc System were technically allowed to make another game, but it couldn't include a lot of the content from newer installments, which would have had disastrous consequences for the ongoing story. Well, they did make an alternative, but... Alternative is perhaps too kind of a word for overture. Godfather, Grand Theft Auto. This ain't even out yet. This over in Japan, read the back hood. See that? That's them Japanese signals. Yeah, I know how we do it, but like that. Instead, Arc System got it together a team, henceforth called Team Blue, of returning and new developers to create a new franchise entirely, spearheaded by company regular Mori Toshimichi. If it helps, imagine Mori as a sort of Tetsuya Nomura figure in the company, previously designing characters until he got the green light for producing his own games. Blades Blue vaguely existed as a series of concepts for a JRPG, as reports claim, so the complicated story and off-the-wall character designs were very much kept intact during the game's shift of genres. Mori would serve as a director, producer, concept, and system designer, illustrator, scenario writer, just about every role in the team Mori had a part in fulfilling for the original arcade release, which would then turn into home console ports a year later. Much of the story and several of the character designs were inspired from Mori's childhood, one of the characters even coming from his middle school ideas. By now, Guilty Gear's mechanics had become very complicated, so they began designing Blaze Blue with a more newcomer-friendly mentality, which is darkly comical considering how astronomically poorly of a job CT does with that, which I will comment more on later. 
Given how much similar DNA the two franchises share with each other, it's no surprise that several characters resemble each other, sometimes in design or mechanics. CT was released in arcades in the year 2008 in Japan, and then home console versions on Xbox 360 and PS3 a year later. Exact sales numbers are difficult to come by, but an old GameFAQs thread I found from 13 years ago claimed that it sold at least 65,000 units in the first month, which is surprising. At least until Guilty Gear was put to bed, Blaze Blue was here to stay. Several other games and expansions would come our way to the west after the Japanese arcades. The description for the Steam page even reads, the first high-res 2D fighter from the creators of Guilty Gear, so the segue was only natural. Anyone who has played the Steam release of CT will know that it was released at the startling late date of 2014. Just a year before Central Fiction, or CF, the final game in the franchise, was released in arcades. But you don't often see the Steam version come into conversation. This can be for several reasons. Most obviously, CT's time in the sun had long since been relinquished. Much like a vampire, CT's popularity as a multiplayer experience crumbled once Continuum Shift and its expanded versions came onto the scene, acting as colossal improvements over its sister game. The second reason why is a little bit more curious. The Steam port is bad, like horrendously bad. It's a kind of terrible thing that raises the eyebrow, both in horror and confusion. Like, how did you mess this up? Legitimately how? It has been some time since I've last programmed anything, but what had to go wrong in the IDE for this semi-aborted port to come to light? <sighs> Being semi-connected to Sega will just do that, I guess. The complicated narrative of Blaze Blue is so meta and all-encompassing that it even affects the release schedule of its games. CT had an original PC port in 2010 for Windows Live, which held the dreaded Games for Windows Live's attachment issue. For the Steam port, they decided to strip the online capabilities and remove Games for Windows Live, an effect they had questionable success in. While I agree that the networking was not something they should have taken the lion's share of time implementing, given that it had already died by the time the game's sequel had come out, I don't think the team responsible for the port knew how deep they were digging because there is an astronomical amount of issues with this release, some of which are present before even installing the game. CT is a whopping 12 gigabytes, which is two-thirds of Continuum Shift and Chrono Phantasma's enhanced versions combined. A cursory glance at Steam forums revealed there are dozens of duplicated files and folders that could be safely deleted to achieve the intended file size of around 6.5 gigabytes. There are several other bugs that prevent the game from even launching. Those are a little bit less fun to fix. When you can launch it, make sure to plug your ears because the animated opening is not subject to the in-game volume options and will blow out your eardrums without manually messing with your computer's sound. The sound in general is an issue with this port. Cutscenes are often out of sync with the dialogue and visuals. Story mode has a very prominent bug where background music simply does not play during most events. Do you have any idea what that guy's done? If you do, then you- I know. I know that. Jeez. How many of you got involved with a boundary? It might seem like nitpicks that I'm selecting from a hat, but with more and more of these bugs at a time do serious damage to the immersion of the game, which affects the overall playing experience. Especially since the home console release nearly a decade prior have none of these issues. If you do want to play CT, I would recommend finding it for home consoles, or the PSP port a few days later. If you can tolerate Android phone graphics, that is. <laughs> this is all within just booting up the game, mind you, and there are dozens of critical issues. But perhaps none more some troublesome this one right here. There's an option to enable the FPS counter of the game, and look how unstable it is. I can't understate how critical, how objectively, ostensibly important it is for fighting games to not be struggling to run 30 frames per second. Without stable performance, how can you even ensure your button inputs are properly registered? How can you face an opponent if the game can't correctly keep up with all the movements happening? Your expectation ability to improve learning specific characters has been extremely kneecapped, no, crippled, 
crippled by the inconsistent ability to pull off the most basic string of combos and moves. Running at 30 frames mean the game is only checking inputs at half the speed as intended, which makes pulling off those inputs feel demonstrably luck-based and highly inconsistent, which makes progression for learning each character's playstyle and inputs a complete joke, and not a particularly funny one. Everyone who has played this game seriously against another player has not used the Steam version, instead typically played the PS3 version, or literally anything else if they want to avoid the headache of having to pray the game functions without stopping everything for tech support. The Steam port isn't the only option, but it is the most available option because the older console ports are not being supported. The Xbox and PS3 versions don't seem to be available when I looked on their online marketplaces, and my PS3 is somewhere in storage. I really can't verify, I'm not digging that thing out. Hope you like finding discs on eBay. There are still so many mechanics that need explaining that simply cannot be pulled off reliably under the constraints of this version. So for all future footage and references, keep in mind that it isn't my general lack of skill that always acts as a barrier for understanding, but that the game sometimes doesn't register button inputs. That's what I tell myself at least. Providing all buttons aren't working as intended, that is. In my experience, buttons will sometimes just stop working, which requires restarting the game entirely. I failed to capture it, but I was practicing with Jin, the B button just unbound itself and would not function until I reset the game. Many users are unable to fix the frame rate past 31, which is disastrous. I seriously don't know how this error occurred, or why this port was still deemed acceptable enough to be put on the store page. How is one to fix the inconsistent frame rate? For me, it sort of seemed to fix itself temporarily when I booted up the game again and then went back to 30 frames later, until I reset my computer altogether. The inconsistent nature of the frames is represented by me always keeping the counter on, to show how flexible it becomes without constantly reminding people of it. Just look in the upper left hand corner to see why my footage is somehow choppy. This is all through just booting up the game. I haven't even been able to mention the mechanics the game has to offer without offensively terrible bugs and poor performance wrecking the entire experience. No other PC port of a BlazBlue game offers this poor of an experience because they weren't ported from a shoddy PC versions from forever ago. I'm unsure of the performance of that original PC version, but my gut telling me gutting games for Windows Live certainly didn't help. For comparison, Central Fiction, or CF, is running at a perfect 60 frames, despite coming out several years later and being the most demanding game, and not being incredibly well optimized either. Continuum Shift Extend, another late PC port of an older game released in the same year, is also at a stable 60. Oh yeah, no achievements either. Hope you're not one of those guys who like Steam achievements, because there are none. I even booted up a couple Guilty Gear games to see how they perform, and none of the issues are present. Street Fighter 4 doesn't even have this issue. I apologize for speaking about this issue for so long, but it's important that I create an understanding of where the fighting game scene was during CT's release, which was released during a major drought of popular fighting games. CT, and mostly Street Fighter 4, were responsible for a huge resurgence in the genre. This tidbit will not be relevant until years later when I release a central fiction video. But remember Blaze Blue's release schedule with Street Fighters. I promise it will come up again in a couple years. Don't worry about it. Even with some of the more questionable and downright diabolical mechanics, Blaze Blue's place in history for the genre and, by extension, video games is something I tremendously respect, and it's such a damn shame to see it so poorly represented by a lackluster PC port when it should be celebrated like its peers. It's devastating. I should probably start speaking about the actual gameplay now. For this segment, I will be combining my explanations and detailing the basic functions of each of the game's 12 playable characters, as well as the fundamentals of controls and inputs, given how comorbid the two topics are. Heading into training mode, we're given a shuriken to select any character we would like. Something curious is that when you enter the selection menu, you have to press as the select button to cancel an action, because every other button except start acts as a confirmation button, which is a quirk of fighting games being developed for the arcade cabinets first. The start button activates the character's color menu to choose from 20 different color schemes. Unfortunately, you can't see the wonderful sprites on screen within this menu, 
So choosing each color palette becomes a game of seeing the three primary colors and just hoping it's a good combination when you enter a round or a rebel, as the game calls it, and enter a rebel. You're able to choose whatever stage you want with whatever music you want, from the OP theme, character themes, etc. No matter how much it fits or clashes, which is a tremendous boon for aiding the game's overall swelling feeling of customization. Choosing a character, their color, setting the music and stage tickles my monkey brain enough to get me fully immersed before even throwing a single punch. Blaze Blue is often called a three and a half buttons fighting game, and that isn't for no reason. Each character has three primary attacks, light, medium, and heavy. Each of these are represented by a game-specific button on the command list, A, B, and C, respectively. Rather than have the controller-specific button representation of moves, this was something I struggled with when I first played the game in 2015, but it rapidly became muscle memory once I stopped trying to associate each of those buttons with the recording button on my Xbox controller because trying to get your brain to remember that C equals B during intensive gameplay is not going to stick well. Technically, you can bind whatever button you want to different attacks, but I strongly don't recommend doing this, at least on purpose. Clicking the controls menu often leads to misinputs replacing a button because it immediately puts your cursor on an attack button rather than the button to close the menu and not change anything which is an infuriating design quirk that happened to me so often because the option is directly beneath the command list menu, which you will be pulling up extremely frequently. You can be forgiven for trying the button equivalency strategy first because this game completely lacks any sort of tutorial mode. The manual, which comes with digitally with the Steam version, is the closest resource the game has to offer any sort of strategy, and it only consists of how to pull off button commands and guarding. There was bonus DVDs that showed some basic tutorials on the special edition, but are we really gonna take that? Really? Wanna buy the special edition just to learn how to play the game? Yeah, no thanks, bud. The method that helped me remember what button does want is to ditch the letters all together and simply think of it as a shape, a triangle, or a square. I'll be using the Xbox controller buttons as a representation, and you can just pretend these are the PlayStation buttons if that is your preferred controller. If you're wondering how it works on keyboard, you're on your own. I know one person who plays CF with a keyboard, and he's completely psychotic. You know who you are, you Hakuman-obsessed goddamn nutjob. The keyboard is responsive enough to function, you should be really be using a controller, if only to the sake of your hands. And the D-pad, for the love of god, pretend your left analog stick does not exist. But keep the right stick in mind for later. What you need to do is just remember the light attack is the leftmost button, medium is the topmost button, and the heavy attack is the rightmost button. If you remember this triangle, any controller will work after getting used to it because of the ABC button is the same layout. You will be able to string all three forms of attack together naturally as your thumb becomes accustomed. But what of the downmost? Is downmost a word? Bottommost? What are the downmost button? That is button D, the drive button. The drive button isn't always an attack, but rather a character-specific function intended to combine with every other attack button mentioned or to alter their effects. This mechanic is drastically easier to explain case by case with each character, so I'll save that for later for their segments. Our triangle metaphor has sort of morphed into a square by now with the fourth button introduced, but the key muscle memory is still our guiding key for stringing together combos without feeling lost and confused. This metaphor can apply to every single character in the game, as well as future characters in the franchise. Blaze Blue is a lot more dependent on understanding individual character structures rather than baseline core mechanics to win fights. But the building block fundamentals are without question the most foundational knowledge one should be equipped with. The trigger buttons on the back can be bound to whatever you'd like, but you'll come to notice the block button, or how there isn't a block button. You simply have to hold back to block an opponent's attack. I highly recommend crouching blocks for all attacks that aren't aerial, then regular blocks because there are multiple points to hit a character, either from standing, crouching, or above. This isn't Smash Bros. Blocking is a huge component of preventing you being trapped in a corner forever. You must take advantage of the momentary slip-ups and block vital attacks to retaliate. We know what pressing down and backwards on the D-pad, but what about forward and up? Forward moves your character, obviously, but double tapping makes them drop bricks and run forward, most of the time. Doing this while you're in the air by pressing up makes you air dash, either to close or greaten the distance between you or your opponent. 
Blocking is fun and all, but some attacks can't safely be blocked all the time. So what are you to do other than just hope you can dodge it? This is where Barrier comes into play. Essentially a stronger block, but activated by pressing AB, which means the leftmost and rightmost buttons. It protects you far more, but at a deadly cost. Every character has a limited amount of Barrier, so you must use it sparingly. Because if you run completely out of Barrier, you can't use it anymore. You enter a pitiful state where you take 1.5 multiplied damage from everything in the game which can effectively render the battle instantly over in your opponent's favor if your character already has a smaller amount of health, because not all of them are made equally. I would be remiss if I didn't mention Barrier Burst, a last minute mechanic to completely stop a combo happening against you that throws your opponent off, at the cost of reducing all your barrier for the rebel, which is shockingly dire. Barrier Burst is a recurring mechanic to the series, but the insane punishment has been drastically softened since CT introduced it. You will come to notice that a lot of brutally punishing mechanics and moves that are fixed or nearly overhauled in future installments. There are other methods for dealing with character guarding too much, however. Simply grab them by pressing BC, which will interrupt their stalling and do some light damage. There are several more mechanics, but none of them can be adequately be explained without first introducing the heat gauge which is the bars at the bottom of the screen. It's called heat, but in practice the community calls it meter, so I will be referring to it as such. The first of these mechanics that use meter is the distortion drive, which appear at the end of a character's command list, which are usually incredibly powerful attacks or an effect that drastically alters normal attacks. These typically consume about 50% of the meter, but there is a much more powerful special attack called astral heat. Drives can be activated if your meter is half full, but Astrals have an insane requirement that bar them from being any more useful than a stylish round finisher than a real competitive edge. Your meter must be 100% full, it must happen when you are one round away from finishing attorney, and the opponent's health must be below 20%. What does 20% of health look like? Beats me. Values are represented visually, so doing this might not prove super useful consistently. It's overall a much safer bet to remember and use the distortion attacks, which can be activated with much less meter more consistently. If your foe's health is so comically low that a tiny poke could end them instead of remembering a complicated input, which one are you, would you pick? The safer option, naturally. But you do miss out on the incredibly visually stunning attacks and an incredibly satisfying conclusion to a match. Oh yeah, most characters can't even use astrals until you beat their arcade mode. They don't even appear on the command list menu until then, so you could add that for reasons of why not to use Astral Heat ever. Your meter can also be used defensively. You can use an attack that prevents you from being stuck against a combo, or use a Rapid Cancel, a mechanic lifted from Guilty Gear, which was called the Roman Cancel. Biggest difference is the name, it allows you to cancel an attack that would otherwise lead you to a disadvantageous situation. Do you remember a couple minutes ago when I told you to remember the right stick? Well, hope you did, because the right stick is about to save our entire gameplay experience. A lot of fighting games intended for newer players often include a simplified way to pull off combo strings, usually labeled as some kind of stylish or easy mode, or as critics of Street Fighter VI would call it, the woke controls. CT is no different. The right stick is bound to several combos automatically at launch, which means you can pull off distortions by flicking the right stick to the left. The other games aren't nearly as concerned with these kind of controls, but CF does have a downside of those combos dealing less damage in exchange for being easier to pull off. The manual even calls the right stick Easy Specials. There are ways to achieve similar outcomes with several other games, but I think this mentality of encouraging people to find shortcuts around precise inputs does more damage to someone trying to learn the genre than help or forbid they play another game in the series later. Skipping the ability to learn from manipulating your thumb on the d-pad proves dire to learning how each character functions down to a T, especially facing another player who has intimate knowledge of the game. Some may call it a crutch, some may call it a helpful tool, but it's quite telling that future installments don't encourage this mentality further than CT did, at least as a toggleable option over a baked-in mechanic. There are so many questionable design choices in this game that have been largely dubbed as Kusoge, I think it's how you say it, which literally translates to game. CT is far from the only example of this term being applied to a fighting game, but what's important to note is that despite some of its more insane factors, 
The term is typically used for games that aren't very solid or consistent on a technical level, but are still fun and enjoyable to play nonetheless. This isn't something to be ignored. Even if things are rocky, the core gameplay still feels satisfying to engage with on some level. Unless you play against Arakune or New 13, then you'll wish the game never came out. Even if the networking for player v player is completely dead in the game, it still holds some level of respect as the groundwork for something better to come, which simply wouldn't have been possible without CT being the way it was. How could you know what to improve if you don't receive any feedback? There was obvious playtesting performed, but playtesting doesn't always capture smaller details avid players will be able to catch on to. It's something about the development slash work environment that sometimes presents an obstructed view of the bigger picture. Though there are some things I am positively shocked about made it to the final release. None of the combos or mechanics are terribly complicated, in fact they're relatively simple, which is intentional. Blaze Blue, if proven successful enough during release, could be headed as a franchise, so it was important not to alienate new players by making them learn loads of complicated moves right off the bat. Many players came from Guilty Gear, so it might be understandable why they would choose not to include a tutorial, as not to patronize people who would have been first in line to try the game. Except that's dumb. The tutorial modes have always been optional. If pleasing older fans was the sole focus, then I would say they failed on that basis in a lot of respects because some characters have so much similar DNA baked into their combos. Ragna is just sole bad guy, but worse. Tager is just Potemkin, but unplayable. Jin is just Kai if he were Yankee scum. That, combined with the overall simplified system compared to Accent Core Plus, the most recent GG game of the time, might have felt like a step down to a lot of players who dared not sully their hot red bloods with some blue blood. CT was received quite warmly and became fairly acclaimed during release, mostly for its graphics, animation, and story. Wouldn't surprise me here that a lot of people experienced with the genre weren't super interested in trying something so obviously made for new people. The two franchises share a friendly rivalry rooted in a love for the genre, filled with banter and pokes, but it wasn't uncommon for many people to feel apprehensive at the start because of the hot water GG was settled in during release. Which is morbidly ironic now, considering Strive has made waves as the biggest fighting game with the most amount of secondaries, and Blaze Blue is... uh... Oh right, I've almost forgot to mention. Training mode's input system is actually insane. All of your previous inputs are kept on the bottom of the screen. It was intended to practice, but it just becomes completely unintelligible because inputs you performed several moves ago are still on screen. You need to keep your eyes on the bottom right to know exactly what inputs you have performed and follow it as it scrolls to the left. I don't know about anyone else, but this is nearly impossible to keep up with. Why are basic movement inputs given just as much focus as me trying to press quarter or half circles to get my specials out? I think it's ridiculous and doesn't encourage people to go just beyond memorizing the command list to learn their preferred character. CF has a live representation of your d-pad gate in exact inputs right in the middle of the screen, so your attention isn't nearly as divided as it would be otherwise. This keeps your head in the fight and allows your brain to make the proper associations, button combinations, and muscle memory for each character. And speaking of character, I should probably mention them. Let me go one by one. It's been like 25 minutes have yet to mention how a single character plays? Leave a like for that one, lads. Our main protagonist. He's on the box art, all the marketing. That's right. Soul bad guy. Uh, sorry. <clears throat> Dante. No, Ichigo. Okay, uh... Titus? Okay, look, Ragna isn't exactly subtle. From his absurdly sized blade, spiky white hair, and Kevin Smith pants, this guy screams edgy protagonist, which gives you a pretty good idea of how he plays without knowing any of his moves. He's got the punches, kicks, sweeping slashes, culminating a bare bones, but effective mix-up close range fighter, benefit of the rushdown cloth he and Soul are cut from. But there's more to him than meets the eye. He isn't quite the generic protagonist you might think he is when you sneak glimpses of his personality, and the same applies for his gameplay. Where Rogan differs is his drive. All of his drive attacks are slow but hugely powerful slashes that drain the opponent's health to restore some of his own, which partially makes up for his smaller health pool. Combined with gaining meter extremely quickly, Ragna can sap a large amount of health and execute powerful attacks to deal considerable damage. This is exacerbated by Bloodcane, his dragon install form that slowly drains his health but powers up all his drive attacks, which gain him more health. 
If that all sounds a little basic, it's because it is. Ragna, being the guy in the box art, is about as simple as they come for Blaze Blue terms, which is hardly a bad thing. You need to start somewhere, and there is no better choice than Silver Titus. Where Ragna really struggles is range. He's all close range and doesn't have an effective way to deal with being zoned out by projectiles aside from Carnage Scissors, which sucks so bad you don't even want to use it. Really unfortunate he is contrasted with New 13, the game's resident zoner, an infinitely better character in battle. I didn't actually start with Ragna when I first played. I chose Arakune, which is really dark considering how demonstrably cracked he is in comparison. The funniest thing about Ragna is that most of his neutrals are kinda ass, except his B attack. Those Kevin Smith pants are legitimately more of a threat than his drives, purely because of how wide an arc he casts. Maybe I was wrong the whole time, the pants really are more deadly than the amount of Seether he can control. Overall, he's just an okay character in the grand scheme of fights because he has decent neutral and ways to close the gap, but struggles when he isn't close enough to people to breathe down their necks which all of the best people in the game are able to smack you from afar, which throws quite a wrench. Speaking of range, another beginner character, but with one major difference. He's good. More than that, he's got range. Jin's attacks focus on keeping your foe exactly where you want them, with a range of ways to close or widen the distance with lightning fast speed. His drive involves freezing people in ice, a la Sub-Zero in Mortal Kombat. Where the ice comes into play isn't just for more powerful attacks, but to interrupt people in the middle of their combos, which allows you to set up on them at a moment's notice. You can catch people lunging at you and stop them dead in their tracks with a drive attack from close range or mid range. It isn't so much the ice defines him in the context of a fight as his ability to put you where he wants you, and following up with a series of lengthy attacks, or to keep you stuck in the ice cycle. So many of his attacks are comfortable close up or at a distance, which makes him viable on either front and able to deal with people who specialize in range or close quarters. He doesn't deal quite as much damage as his edgier brother, but he makes up for that with the fact he has much more finesse and room to counterplay people. Jin is one of the few characters that can be explained pretty concisely because he does something not a lot of other choices can say. He works properly and has ways to not get instantly flatlined when taken out of his comfort zone. A lot of these overviews kind of tend to be me explaining the weird quirk each character has, but Jin is fortunate enough not to need that. Dustloop says it best, Jin is just plain good. I struggled to write anything down because it took me a lot of practice to understand what Noelle was all about, but I think I got it. Despite her gun show, Noelle is pretty adapted at getting in your face and rushing you down but how she does it is entirely centered around combos and chaining. Her attacks are close up and can be very quickly merged together by using her drive, which allows for a variety of different moves to come out very quickly and easily ensnare your foe inside for successive hits. Chain Revolver leads into one of four different moves that can all end with a special move, with one huge catch. She can't do it in the same move twice in a row. This might seem limiting, and it can be very much exploited, but this is the genius of it all. You can very rapidly lean into an attack that catches your foe off guard. There's only so much preparation someone can do when bracing for several different kinds of attacks at once. Going drive is a big warning to your foe, but how that warning turns into an active threat is up to you. Noelle tends to throw people back with a lot of her attacks, which combos beautifully into her distortion attacks, which can be inactivated in midair or standing. I have to apologize for my less than stellar gameplay here, she was probably my least favorite to play preference-wise. You're gonna have to take my word on a lot of the more advanced tech she's capable of, more than skilled players can achieve. So what makes her that much more of an effective rushdown compared to, compared to Ragna? She's honestly just more competent with what she can do and quickly perform than he can. Despite have such an embarrassing neutral ability, she doesn't entirely need to use it to be effective. Mix-up just comes so naturally to her that combined with her surprising ability to zone you out with some projectiles, and sometimes just delete projectiles because of Kusoge programming. And being quick on her feet, she's a delight for skilled players who like to keep people on their toes. If you had to give someone just one example of how unique and interesting the drive mechanic can be, I'd point to no better candidate than Rachel Alucard. Her drive is not an attack, it's the wind. 
By pressing D in a direction, Rachel can blow a gust of wind to carry her in whichever direction you'd like. That sounds like something only useful as an escape tool, but where this drive really shines is how it intersects with the rest of her set. Many of her inputs put out the same effect, but with different ranges. She has this one move where she launches a projectile that turns into a lightning rod. This is the setup. The payoff is when a different input can electrocute the rod, and you can launch it at three at a time. See where I'm going with this? You can use the wind to directly push people onto the rods to achieve maximum damage, but that's only the start. You can blow your people into yourself and hit them with surprising amount of high damage neutrals with interesting range. She has a tremendous number of ways to defend herself at a range and instantly change the flow of battle how she pleases, but as you would have guessed, this requires quite a bit of setup. She's hardly defenseless without her rods and electric frogs, but many of her strongest qualities come from clever timing and setup. Otherwise, she's vulnerable to being rushed down and folded like laundry. Such is the punishment for someone with spectacular zoning capabilities. The drive mechanic is so fantastic because of this reason. Hers is not an attack, it's entirely support that can intersect with such creative input. And creativity is the name of the game with her. Her animations for attacking are completely absurd in the most pleasing way possible. What makes her easily one of the best characters in the game is that her setup isn't complicated mechanically, but requires a lot of knowledge of the opponent's moveset and how to directly avoid or exploit it to begin throwing random Halloween objects and being the architect of their downfall. There's a fairly substantial barrier to entry with this character, but not one that requires you to trade your soul for. Those characters will come later. With a resoundingly solid moveset and insane potential, it's no secret why Rachel is such a powerful pick and easily within the top 5 of this game. Honestly, the only reason why she isn't any higher is because the very best of this game are legitimately broken from a mechanical standpoint that makes fighting against them sometimes literally impossible. I'm going to be transparent, I straight up don't know how to describe Taukaka. I mean, I do, but not in the gameplay sense. When I started using her, I was beyond confused when I tried to find info on Dustloop. This was the only info I could find, so I was a bit of a loss. I have experiments with her somewhat in CF, and she's fairly comparable in both games, so the same characteristics can apply. Tao is described as a hit-and-run character, and I really think that fits. Her agility is absurd. It's completely insane. She can triple jump, for crying out loud. She shreds people up close with her massive claws and has a couple projectiles in the form of rotten apple cores. But what she specializes in, or specializes in quotations, mind you, is being an absolute headache to deal with. By design, she darts all over the place with her drive, which is a pretty basic pouncing attack, but be warned, this kitty has claws. Given her mobility, the pounce will combo into basically anything given someone can keep up with her demanding agility by putting in the exact inputs to fling people around like ragdolls and abuse her obnoxiously funny mix-up ability of hitting people high and low at a moment's notice. The problem with Tao is just trying to do all that and not get hit, because it's really easy to get hit. A lot of Tao's attacks do some dummy damage, but they slow our hell. Which leaves you pretty open to getting your grill rearranged. For someone not taken very seriously, there's a surprising amount of handiwork required to hit the same high as a lot of characters who can do more naturally. Does this mean there isn't a reason to play Tao compared to others? Well, I can't say for the context of other games, but she still cracks a pretty good punch in CT. Her mobility allows her to bypass a lot of the more frustrating zoning moments in the game and avoid being clobbered by characters like Tager. Implying Tager is capable of doing such a thing, though. She might surprise you with what you can get away with given the right hands, but you enter a unique dilemma. Either a Tau player is an insane force of nature that must be reckoned with, or a Coomer. Y yeah, probably a Coomer. There are probably better options than Tau, but you do get one benefit of playing Tau. Tau herself. Oh. No! It hurt! Meow! What did you just do to me? That's my line. You're a run from the Kaka clan, ain't ya? You got some nerve sneaking up behind me to steal my food. Oh, my strategy played out perfectly. What a sneaky man. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're not gonna get away from this, meow! Better than being Carl, at least. Carl might be the strangest character in the whole game. Hell, maybe even the franchise. But for CT, there are some things you must understand. 
Carl is what's called a puppet character, someone whose inputs control two different characters. Those playstyles wildly range between games, but for Carl, this means his drive all relates to the big robot lady doll he lugs around. His attacks don't deal a lot of damage, and he focuses a lot on positioning. He has a sort of shadow step to fling himself around to get into doll in position. His drive involves her slowly clunking to the opponent and dealing shockingly slow attacks that don't deal much damage. His most powerful inputs involve using her big gorilla arms to manhandle people, at least on paper. In practice, you probably aren't getting caught with how slow she stumbles around the place. Even more fun, you had better get out of her way as Carl, because if you stand in front of her, you can completely muck up your distortions, which are more of their big gorilla arms slapping around. At least you can get her to teleport back to you if you get too desynced. Be careful not to spend too much of the meter, or else she goes inactive and you're really in hot water waiting for her to be used again. So this shouldn't be rocket science, he's a defensive character with very little ways to deal substantial damage very quickly, and more vulnerable than available to attack. It's not shocking to find out that Carl was not just bottom 3, but considered in the worst character in the entire game. That is... <sighs> Carl is pretty light, which means he has some mobility. So, what if you were able to combo your foe into the air with basically anything at all? Remember to position the doll. Simply jump up and air grab them, then have the doll perform the 8D move, which you press by pressing Drive plus Up, and congratulations, you have just won your round. All the footage you'll be seeing of this is from other people, because if I play this character anymore, I'm gonna drown myself in the Ottawa River. For some reason, for some godforsaken reason, this single clap move is completely unblockable in the air, even against Barrier. The mechanic intended to block just about everything. The enemy can do literally nothing as you continuously grab them in the air and clap them up. This is called the clap loop, and because of this exploit, Carl's actually top tier. Literally nothing else matters in his kit. Whatever method you use to grab your opponent in the air works, and you will instantly win, as long as you aren't playing against a skilled Rachel or any form of Arakune ever. Without this exploit, Carl is the worst character in the game. Actually getting to pull it off isn't insanely difficult, but it is pretty damn stale for a one-trick pony. And I'm not playing arcade mode like that. I I'm not doing it. I refuse. I'm just grabbing clips online for everything I need. I am not engaging this dookie-ass character. If it's any solace, Carl gets some retribution by being a monster in a lot of future games. He is horrifying to fight against in CF. Past this point, I must issue a warning. I think there's two more normal characters. Normal as in not insane from a design standpoint, in a way that makes them broken to fight against or play as, but there are so many that there are. Let's get the regular ones out of the way. Provided you aren't too distracted by her immaculate sprites, by that I mean her entrance, holy moly that flip looks cool, we'll find that Lychee is a very strong pick suitable for a variety of situations who isn't, isn't too hard to pick up at first and flourishes in fights when you get the hang of her. Her central gimmick is being able to switch between two different playstyles. With her staff, her attacks are slower but have a lot of range. Dropping or throwing the staff with her drive shortens your range but you become dramatically faster with nearly all of your attacks. It wouldn't be totally inaccurate to say that you would need to learn about 1.5 of a character, because so many of your attacks change properties with or without the staff. The main advantage of this is being unpredictable. Flinging your staff or using it as a mobility tool at a moment's notice to apply a huge amount of unpredictable pressure on someone. Just as your foe might be getting used to your increasing speed, you can fling back to deal some chip damage and you can keep them at a distance and deal devastating attacks from a new range. Her specials and distortions are no different, usually targeting people from a safe distance, which you can become closer by using her staff. The unpredictability and ability to switch on dime makes her a fantastically powerful combatant, but not without huge drawbacks. The main one being a barrier to entry. Her inputs and ability to change stances comes from a lot of practice that other characters don't always require. Not having intimate knowledge of how she plays pretty soundly leads to having your ass kicked on the regular. Positioning is something you must be keeping track of. You have to make sure you can be in the most optimal locations for your shifting your moveset, and making sure your most powerful moves will deal maximum damage. 
It's something added with the staff, but might seem so strange to think of your setup and have to execute around that, on top of defending yourself while doing so. She's different enough to feel distinct for such a familiar playstyle as a stance. Even basic executions and attacks still feel fun and exciting. She's definitely one of the more involved characters that requires a lot of skill sharpening to use effectively, but it certainly is rewarding. My gameplay and explanations do not entirely do her justice. I highly recommend you check out with experience someone playing her. I ran into a very funny issue with Bang on CT. His dust loop page just says unplayed character and Bang does not function. If you've ever faced him in arcade or story mode, you might be inclined to agree, because the CPU has absolutely no idea how to play Bang. But there is some interesting tech you can do with him. I'll try my best to explain. Bang is another rushdown character with great agility. What makes him so different is the plethora of unique mechanics he has to work with. Near his drive bar are four icons. This is where he shines. All of his drives attacks are slow, but act as counter attacks that can combo with different inputs. Your drives all spell out Fu Rin Kazan. But to explain that, I need to explain nails. Nails are the numbered objects that Bang has. He can place them in the air or ground, and they accelerate him extremely quickly in a specific direction. He has to place them quite carefully to position himself in the way to deal damage and then quickly out of the way. Fu Rin Kazan is a super state that allows Bang to have nail tier dashing whenever he wants. It's such a dangerous skill that you have to earn it with a skillful attacks to use it. No other character in the game operates like he does, and to achieve his most optimal playstyle, it's incredibly unique how interestingly his drive intersects with limited nail resources. You have a lot of management on your plate when you're focused on attacking, using nails, and getting all the kanji filled out. Aside from his little area denial nail attack, he's a close quarters fighter that takes time to set up, but when you do, it is curtains for your foe. Is what I would have been said if anyone actually played this character. It's not so much that Bang is a bad character, but his demands are simply too costly to compete against characters who don't need nearly as much. What he can achieve is very impressive, but only the highest scale of that is actually poignant. Actually getting there and getting a bug bogged out because you have to spend a lot of time trying to counter opponents and dance around them. So those were the normal characters. Past this point, we were about to cover characters who are so baffling from a gameplay perspective so insanely programmed that you might need to get a drink to get past this point. Are you prepared? I hope you're sitting somewhere comfortably. All right, let's get the most insane choice out of the way. You know how I often give characters a basic archetype description like Rushdown, Zoner, etc. You know what Arcune is? No idea, I, I don't know. Trying to describe it in words doesn't do any zany animations justice. Arakune is supposed to be a slow fighter focusing on close range, I, I think. What he ends up being is having just about every base covered with a plethora of insanely good moves. He can go invisible, just because. He has plenty of aerial cover damage due to how slow his air dashing is and covers a lot of screen real estate. He can straight up go underground and completely bypass any moves. Blocking. Who needs to block when you can go under and over basically anyone in the game? Trying to hit Arakune is incredibly difficult, but he can hit you pretty easily with a huge swath of far-reaching and high-damaging moves. But what's his drive? That would be Curse. Curse places a sort of status effect on the opponent and makes bugs flock to them once you release any of the other attack buttons. These bugs deal damage and tend to interrupt people when they just try and play the game. How does one activate Curse? Any drive moves. Literally any of them. I'm pretty sure blocking activates it sometimes too. Unsure if that's a bug or a feature. If that hasn't set in, let me explain further. Being cursed means bugs can fly from anywhere and attack you wherever Anakune wants. And all he has to do is use any of his drive attacks to apply it. This ability was absolutely crushing to play around for years. Imagine trying to play the game as literally anyone and instantly getting cursed and you'd have your health drained at an instant. It's not even just curse, his normal moves are considered powerful too. Putting both of those together, he just shreds your health and you've got nothing left to give. All the other best characters in the game have pretty small health pools too by comparison. Unless you're using someone like Hakuman, which no you aren't, you're gonna get grinded instantly. Surely Arakune has a weakness, right? 
like he's really slow or has no health or some obvious drawback to his awesome power. No, not really. Some of his ground movement is sluggish, but he doesn't need it. His aerial abilities are so absurd that you can just be as comfortable in the air on the ground playing anyone else. The only real drawback that prevents him from being an insta-win character is that a lot of his buttons and more abusive tactics require some timing and skill. You can probably win by button mashing, but skilled players have long since suffered the days of playing against this monster, so counter strategies to take him down have been in circulation for almost a decade. Not that anyone still learns strategies to play through that game. His name still ushers in terrible memories to seasoned players. Oh yeah, fun fact, when I selected this character again for the first time in almost 10 years, a storm had started brewing outside and hail began pelting my window. This lines up with Dustloop listing one of his downsides as Faustian Bargain. You don't even need to use distortions. They're really good aerial damage, but damn, you don't need all that when he's as strong in the air as he is. Pro tip, if you and a friend are playing this game, and if he chooses Arakune, you need better choices of friends. If you were using Arakune, your friends need better choices of friends. Choosing him is an implicit I hate you statement to anyone in the room. There are precious more details to explain, but I think CT Arakune could genuinely be his own video. So I'm gonna move on to the next combatant. On the topic of busted characters who can get their own videos, here's New13. Oh, okay, she already has. New is the zoniest zoner to ever zone. Normally, zoner characters don't tend to be at the very top of a leaderboard, either because they weren't designed to be that powerful, or something not intended by the developers, like a move not functioning correctly. With her, I'm really not sure if they playtested. New's drive allows her to shoot out rows and singular swords basically wherever she wants, with insane damage. They're insanely fast, cover basically any angle possible, and can essentially be spammed with no real punishment for doing so. Normally a zoner is really good far away, but terrible up front, which was clearly the intended purpose, but no, she can switch from her insane swords to a shockingly good kit of neutrals and block string abilities that make her an absolute monster in combat. Approaching her in any way is a serious mean for concern, which is just lovely considering her placement in the arcade mode. What about an attack that basically just has you become stuck in place? Gravity Shield is the most insane thing I have ever seen in a fighting game. Need to be in a specific place to avoid her swords? Not with this attack you can't. Have fun burning through barrier. It's completely bonkers how free all of her attacks are. Sure, she has paper-thin defenses, but actually getting to her is a total pipe dream. With Arakune, there is at least some intimate knowledge of the game to have him flex to his fullest extent. Would you like to know how New can perform best? Just memorize the combos in your set. The bare minimum basics of remembering what buttons to input is what almost guarantees you to win. As if she wasn't already busted enough, her meter gain is insane. Your specials can come out basically whenever you feel like it. Dealing with attacks overhead, underneath you, and anywhere she pleases while she farms a meter all the way across the screen is insane to fight against. Oh yeah, her grabs are on a level of Hakuman which means they also do obscene damage. You basically don't even need distortions to win, because they do slightly more damage than regular attack stringing can do, if not less to how pathetically easy it is to spam her swords. You might be noticing a pattern with a lot of the strongest characters, the aerial advantages. Fights take to take wing, and usually the character with the great aerial grabs or mobility or damage reign supreme. It's no surprise that Arakune, Rachel, and New are without questions the best characters in the game, while ones with mediocres or sometimes basically no ability to fight while jumping are sweeping the bin at the bottom tier. New wasn't part of the original arcade release, or at least she wasn't on the traditional select menu without a code. From the angle, I sort of get why she would be so strong. She is the last fight in almost every arcade ladder, so I suppose she's intended to be a busted character? I have some theories that poke holes in that statement when I move on to the arcade mode segment, but hold on for that for now. One last thing about New is that she was never this strong again. Blue Team knew what they concocted something diabolical when they designed her moveset, because one of her only two cons listed on Dustloop is talking about how crummy she is in CF. 
I don't even think she was super great in Chrono Phantasma either. So we've talked about the regular characters, the one regular humans being picked to have fun. Some range from good to mediocre to terrible, but most of them, they function mechanically. Except for Carl, whose only reason to be good is a borderline exploit. We've now finished talking about the very best characters in the game who have flourished from questionable game design. But questionable game design is a two-way street. You can just as easily have a character who is totally quashed by that design to the point they become unusable. Lucky for us, we have two prime examples of that. Let's start with the second saddest character in CT. You might be surprised to see me describe Hakuman as terrible, given how much insane damage he deals in the arcade mode, but believe me when I say, you have been misled. You are fighting a super-powered version of Hakuman that isn't comparable to his actual in-game stats. His shocking damage comes from a huge, monumental flaw. Everything else in his kit is terrible. Horrific, even. He has the second worst mobility in the entire game, which leads him to take a lot of damage literally anyone else can avoid. His backdash basically has no invincibility and is so slow and so not capable of dodging anything, which leaves you so wide open. I, I need to quote Dustloop for this. Possibly the worst backdash in all of Blaze Blue. Zero invincibility frames, oh my word. You've definitely noticed how weird his meter is. Hakuman operates on a Magatama system, which means his heat gauge is split differently to everyone else and acts as a resource he needs to tap into to perform special moves. This concept has worked for other characters, but for Hakuman, this is his absolute death seal. How do you earn Magatama? Just wait. It's a passive regen that sounds interesting having to wait to perform any supers, and you're stuck with your normals, which actually do quite a bit of damage, but they take ages to land. Each special costs Magatama, which means you can very easily get trapped in performing basic specials and resetting the counter back to zero. Fortunately, his drive allows him to gain Magatama as well. What is this drive? It's blocking. Not just blocking, this drive allows for a block to counter system that deals the decent damage and earns more resources. But this block is without question the worst block in the entire game. It is so damn hard to time with an opponent's attacks, because pressing backwards and using barrier feels a lot more natural and can actually block attacks. Using Hakuman's drive is just leaving yourself wide open because you have to time it perfectly to counter anything at all. Mind you, this block has been fine in other games, but for the specific matchups you'll find in CT, it's not gonna help unless you're fighting Tager. God forbid anyone chooses Tager! When he's able to open a full Magatama slot, his distortions are very powerful, but still underperform. Flicking the right stick left leaves a huge slash that can take a third of your foe's health, but all they have to do is block it, which is piss easy to do. His entire playstyle revolves around waiting. You need to wait to use Magatamas, need to wait until you can use your surprisingly decent neutral moves, and wait until you can release an insanely predictable and easily avoidable super. The funny part is that basically none of it works, except for his neutrals, but still best used as retaliation instead of being an active aggressor. Not like he can catch up to anyone to try and be an aggressive, mind you. You only really have one playstyle. Wait and do chip damage until you can unlock more moves. It would be a real shame if these unlocked moves were also bad. Well, would you look at that. Just about all of them are extremely awkward and sluggish, except the dash, and that was pretty good. Not even worth talking about his special state, actually getting to this point is straight up not worth it or even possible at times. It's such a shame. He has a pretty solid kit on paper, but just about none of it works in practice. It's really embarrassing how the only way to win against someone who knows how to block and counterattack is to basically beg. Also, he cancels into just about nothing, which is hilariously grim. But he isn't the worst character in the game. Would you believe me if I told you there was someone even worse? Ladies and gentlemen, I give you. Hey guys, I'm not doing this video anymore. Playing Iron Guard Tager makes me want to die and stop the video, so I decided to take a break and go outside. Here's some photos of me outside remembering the sun exists. Hope you can understand.
Okay, now he's just one character. I can do this. You know how important mobility is? Even slow characters need a chance to recoup and not get comboed into oblivion and get a chance to attack or defend. Tager cannot do this. Tager cannot run, cannot dash, has one jump. I am being completely serious. Can he defend himself at least? No! This big lug is so huge and so wide that he takes stray damage just by being chosen as a character. Look, I think we can all assume he was the grappler of the roster. Grapplers are usually pretty large and can afford to take some damage to get people closer to execute big damage attacks. Tager? All of his attacks are so damn slow and clumsy that you might be able to reach your foe if they put their controller down and take a bathroom break. He basically has slow start, Regigigas' ability from Pokemon on all times, with no way to turn it off. No matter how much he tries and fails to pull people in, he will get completely stopped on up close because he barely reacts to taking damage. Imagine that, a grappler that pulls you faster to lose. And speaking of pulling you closer, let's talk about this drive. Voltic Barrier harnesses the power of magnetism to force people to be magnetized close to you. This is horrible for every single reason I've listed. If you can even land a drive attack, they are the slowest parts of his arsenal, which means you're t you can't even take advantage of his awful drive. And if you can, you lose faster because he sucks. His combos? What combos? He can't. Tager is literally too slow to achieve a combo in most circumstances. He has no anti-airs, no worthwhile neutrals, abominable frame data, and has the worst matchups against every other cast member. Maybe except Hakuman. Maybe. I am being completely serious when I say this is not exaggerated. Do you want to see his only pro listed on Dust Loop? Can still win. <laughs> is the only positive listed. And even then. The win condition becomes within grasp when you're fighting against low-level AI players or a decomposing corpse. And I still might be betting on the corpse to win if you whiff too many sledgehammers. Every mad or strange mechanic goes against Tager. He benefits from literally nothing in the game. No amount of invincibility frames or defenses or blocking will make this character usable. Worthwhile, fun, or interesting. It is ludicrous to imagine how this character exists and was deemed A-OK -okay to be put in as is. It's mind-boggling. Now do you understand why I decided to not do this and go outside? So, that's about every character in CD covered. You have definitely noticed how many of them are... strange. There are plenty of weird and puzzling mechanics put into the game, where some characters benefit tremendously from and some don't. I hope you're able to remember all these when you play your favorites, and remember how to counterplay everyone else, or at least the most commonly picked characters. CT's smaller cast has the advantage of not having to cram every hit and hurt box of everyone immediately. 12 characters is a pretty good starting size for a game released in the late 2000s, but when you start setting stipulations on the roster, you will see how much less variety it is. Suppose you were playing with a friend on the couch, and the both of you agreed to not picking a character who is absurdly overpowered or underpowered, either through questionable game design or exploits. There is a difference in that, and just strong characters in the latter typically have balanced movesets and defined playstyles that don't rely on said Kusoge mechanics. This means Arakune, Nu, Hakuman, Tager aren't being selected, and maybe Carl if you can't come to an agreement on Clap Loop. This would leave you with Ragna, Jin, Noel, Taukaka, Lychee, Bang, and Rachel as your cast, which means if you want close range choices, you have to choose Ragna, Noel, or Tau. If you want more range, then Lychee and Rachel. Some are in the middle, Jin and Bang. Carl sucks so much ass that if you outlawed Clap Loop, you might as well not even pick him anyways. A lot of the more usable characters feel very similar to each other, and there isn't a lot of variety. Of course, this is just a hypothetical situation, and most tournaments, even casually, don't abide by that. But it does present a troubling precedent that Team Blue had a tough time balancing and creating the more unique characters in the game. Of course, there is more details to explain about everything. For the interest of time, I have elected not to do so. Both because I am simply not capable of learning an entire roster's detailed ins and outs very quickly, and because you don't have to either. The draw of a fighting game roster is to choose someone who jumps at you, either through the specific playstyle, character design, music theme, etc. 
Universal mechanics are obviously important to understand, but each character's individuality is much more highlighted mechanically. It's part of what differentiates the series from other fighting games. People usually find their main character choices because of a meme or particular move. What character do I main? No one in CT, that's for sure. Not exactly a huge swath of choices, even less so when choosing one that won't give me funny looks from other people. That's what I have to say about each character. Keep in mind, I didn't get a huge amount of practice against other players because the online's dead and no one sane wants to go all the way back to the first game in the franchise. Historically, most famous fighting game franchises don't start amazing until the second iteration. It's hard to declare something a classic if it can't be compared to itself. Regardless, that's most of our mechanics covered. Let's take a look at what the game has to offer outside of that. This one doesn't require too much explanation, thankfully. This is one of the core game modes when the game was originally released in Japanese arcades. Dead simple concept. Choose a character, fight in 10 rounds against a different character in each round. The structure is the same. Each round is a random character, with the exceptions of round 4, 8, 9, and 10. 9 and 10 are always fights against Hakuman and New 13 in that order with the exception of those two characters' routes themselves, likely because the two were not playable in arcades without the use of additional codes. Just win two rebels, and you win. Thankfully, you don't need to insert a quarter into your computer if you flunk a round. You just start up again on the rounds you lost on. The fourth and eighth encounters are character-specific to illustrate a bit of the personalities and story. Arcade mode does have a fair bit of story significance, but typically only comes during the character's endings once they beat new. Once you beat arcade mode, you typically unlock a character's Astral Heat, which means that their special flashy finisher move is not actually available until you beat it, which is an interesting choice. Some characters have their Astrals without arcade mode, so I, I really don't know what they were thinking. It really is just kind of pick and choose. Each character also has something called an unlimited mode. It's just the same character, but all of their stats have been ramped up dramatically. They're faster, do loads more damage, etc. This is typically restricted to local versus mode to mess around with your friends or in training, but you do want limited versions of characters throughout the story in arcade modes to illustrate how strong a specific character is meant to be, usually in the form of Hakuman or New at the end. Each character has their own ending, and they do influence of the story blanks, so I'll cover them all. I will also be reading each character's bio from the manual to understand why everyone is in the same location, because if you take one thing away from Blaze Blue, it is that a convoluted, insane explanation exists for everything, no matter how absurd or minor, and it will come from places you'll never expect. Let's start with Ragna. Turns out he's a super criminal named the Grim Reaper for how many people he mows down with his sword, called Blood Scythe. Yes, his sword has Scythe in the name, because of his astral. Most of the story takes place in one location, the 13th hierarchical city of Kagatsuchi. What is Ragna doing there? Don't worry, you'll find about it in the story mode. No you don't. Ragna's some serious beef with these places called cauldrons, and he stops for love nor money to get there. He knocks down everyone in his path until he meets Nu. Nu is usually an emotionless robot, but changes her personality entirely when she encounters Ragna, and really wants to jump his bones. Ragna is reminded of someone while he fights her, which is a shame because Nu impales herself on Ragna, saying something about destiny and falling into the cauldron together. Her specific mention of over and over again implies something pretty interesting about the story, but isn't entirely elaborated on until later. Jin Kisaragi is part of the NOL, or Novus Orbis Librarium, often called the Library. They're basically the world government that built all the cities and control all law enforcement in the remains of the world. Oh, yeah, this game takes place in the post-apocalypse. Don't, don't worry about that for now. Jin is regarded as a serious war hero with a personality as cold as the magical blade he wields. But he disobeys orders and heads into Kagetsuchi to find Ragna. You see, Ragna is his brother, and he won't let him forget that fact. Why? I thought that was obvious. To see you, brother! <laughs> his journey to find Ragna leads him to Nu by coincidence. He was far more interested in the fight with Ragna than fighting her. Rachel interrupts the fight just as Jin talks about remembering some events from the past. We get a flashback to his memories in the form of a cutscene. Jin is training in the NOL Academy and meets a young Noel Vermillion. 
who reminds him of someone from his childhood, which greatly frustrates him. You'll notice that most characters confronting New doesn't entirely line up. Jin and Ragna's fight take place at different times during both of their respective routes, especially so on everyone else's routes. What gives? Typically, arcade mode isn't considered canonical to the story if the game has a dedicated story mode and exists as a mandatory feature, so people don't freak out. Rather, considering that the arcade ladder is something of an exemplary offshoot timeline for the story. What does that phrase mean, and am I seriously using a phrase as obnoxious as that to describe the most basic fighting game mode? I am. Leave a like for that one. What I mean is that each route can be considered a realistic scenario of what would likely happen if the character were to confront the list of characters that they do in their routes. Character interactions show us great lengths what their relationships are and what the outcome of each fight looks like. For example, Tager and Arakune were friends, or at least alumni at some point, so Tager is fighting him to bring back his employer slash... What? What the... Okay. I, I wrote something in the script. I'm, I'm like looking at it. I guess I didn't proofread this part enough. So I, I wrote, Taker's fighting him to bring him back to his employer slash mother. <laughs> oh dear. I, I'm so sorry to describe Kokono in that way. Oh no. <laughs> <clears throat> Anyways. The Black Blobby Boy is quite irate and wants to scrap. Arakune escapes under the floor once you win two rounds, which lines up with what we know about these two characters. And let's be honest, Tao is not making it to the final boss. But the game is at least throwing us a bone on the what if scenario. Right, let's move on to Noel next, shall we? Noel, like it's implied in Jin's ending, is also part of the NOL, but falls under Major Kisaragi's command. She's tasked with visiting the city to retrieve Jin quietly and get him to stop going AWOL. Based on some words spoken to by Jin when she runs into him, she runs into Hakuman and New later. Curiously, Noelle claims to remember an exact scenario like this before, where she confronts New. She starts to repeat New's robot dialogue towards the end. This has two major points I'd like to bring up. Her remembering past scenarios lends much credence to what New talked about with Ragna but the potentially cyclical nature of reality, and Noelle's past and possible connections with Nu, who has connections with a figure both in Ragna and Jin seem to remember, which elicit different reactions. Her final cutscene shows her alone in what looks like a hospital bed, until Rachel appears. Something is very strange and strangely afoot with this rabbit girl and we don't quite understand. Arakune's route is really funny because his only background is a weird gloop person living underground who eats people and Kaka clan members. He literally eats the baby cats of, like, of Tau Kaka people. It's so messed up. Everyone who runs into him is sickened and disgusted and he, he can't exactly communicate properly with anyone. He runs into Tager, who Arakune knew before he was a gloop. He gets really upset at Tager's... <sighs> boss, I wrote it correctly, upset at Tager's boss, Kokonoe, and starts getting a whiff of what lies beyond the cauldron everyone's waiting for. Something called the Azure, and Arakune really wants to go inside. His ending is extremely ambiguous. We get a series of voice recordings of an unknown man researching a property known as Seether, which will be a huge recurring topic in the story. His voice begins to resemble the choppiness of Arakune, which implies this researcher is Arakune in the past. But what do we know about this man? We know that he was close to Tager and Lychee, and potentially their boss, Tager's creator, which implies he was a researcher for Sector 7, the counter NOL branch. Kind of like how the Brotherhood of Steel in Fallout 3 is distinctly their own faction, but fall under the umbrella of something it once was. And on the topic of Sector 7, let's talk about Tager. Tager is an enforcer type of Sector 7 that doesn't question orders. Sector 7 hates the world government the NOL created, which makes him a strange mix of pro and anti-authority. He doesn't care enough to ask why he's headed to find Rognite, just does it. He stumbles from encounter to encounter, being fought against his will and occasionally testing his strength with formidable opponents. Even when they're encountering new, he just accepts he has to fight and does it anyway. Even if he's horrible to play as, his personality will always be entertaining. His final cutscene has him speak to Lychee sometime in the past, and all but confirms that there's some kind of temporal skullduggery going on in this game, and that Hakuman, yes, the playable Hakuman, was inside a time anomaly that preserved him for decades. He is a member of the group called the Six Heroes, who are credited for saving the world when it was destroyed by a horrible monster. 
you'll see more six heroes talk further into the story. For someone who talks about truth, justice, and love, Bang can be a pretty complicated character. He's a dopey ninja from a country torn apart by war ravaged by the NOL that fights to protect the innocent, but carries a burning desire to restore his peace to his burned country. Trying to find Raga to bring him in for justice, he runs into Hakuman, or someone he believes to be puppeting his visage for stolen valor, which infuriates every sense of his justice, so they scrap. The only reason he even fights new is because her vibes are off, and he can't stand that. Even his ending is straightforward and to the point. Bang is just looking to protect his people, home, and his ideals, which I think is lovingly simple and compelling. Too bad everyone hates him and wants to take his own life. Everyone is so mean to this guy for no reason. He has this like adorable little crush on Lychee that is never reciprocated. It's so over for Bang Cells. Speaking of Lychee, her blurb explains that she's a doctor in somewhere called Orient Town? Oh my. And she's on the hunt for the cauldron for her own reasons. The power inside holds an interesting property for her that isn't entirely explained, even by the ending. She doesn't seem to be on the best terms with her old job from Sector 7, but we don't entirely know what caused them to split. She seemed quite close with Arakune, or whoever Arakune was before he got turned into fried butter. Not a lot of story details to piece together with her ladder. Taukaka's route is somehow more story driven than Lychee's. For someone as ostensibly as a joke character as Tao, there's a lot of details revealed during her tenure. Like mentioned, she's a member of the Kaka clan who live underground. Tao is acting as a vigilante to earn money for her clan, but is also hunting Arakune. She briefly fights him and then runs in New 13 because she's bawling. Then we find out that Tao and Lychee are apparently good friends, and that Tao, and by extension her clan, are all descended of one of the members of the six heroes. These six people who saved the world have their hands in just about all of the characters' business, even semi-joke characters like Tao. Someone want to do an early life check? Carl Clover was early in his life at the NOL Academy until he had to drop out for an unexplained reason. He's trying to find Ragna, given that Ragna is the most wanted man alive, the bones acquired from turning him in is quite the motivator. Something peculiar about Carl is the doll he's traveling with, who he believes to be his sister. The arcade mode doesn't explain past something bad kind of happened, don't worry about it. Oh, okay, to be honest, I did not play Carl's arcade mode, I just found the ending on YouTube. Go ahead and try playing Carl and tell me it's fun and then you want to wake up tomorrow and do the exact same thing for footage. You can't. On to the last regular arcade mode, Rachel. She's a strange character because she's intersected with a lot of other characters in a very intimate and kind of transcendent way. She's a vampire living in a far off castle with her butler who claims to be in the story because she's bored. But we know there are deeper motivations than that. She knows every other character pretty well, even if they don't have any prior history, and clearly has a knowledge of timelines and intersecting moments in history on a level that far outpaces anyone else's. She's totally aware that her fighting new has some kind of drastic effect on the ending of a current timeline, Something like that. Several of the endings finish with some kind of white void or flashing light to take over the screen. So if we interpret Rachel's words literally, fighting new in the boundary somehow ends or potentially resets it all together. We see Rachel feeling a sense of guilt over consuming someone's blood, while she's in a white room with the child representation of Noel, which we know from Jin's flashback and with adult Ragna. Her fate is intertwined deeply with these two, despite how much she would never admit it. Hakuman and Nu have different arcade ladders. The former starts out pretty interesting because of what we know beforehand. He was one of the six heroes, but the conflict he was involved with happened decades ago, but he's still around due to some time skullduggery explained in Taker's ending. He finds himself both amused and disappointed with a lot of the other cast as he cuts through them. He's got some serious beef with Nu and is surprised to see her show up so early. After they fight, he runs into Ragna and tells him he's going to put him down the same pit as her. He seems aware of the situation because he knows everyone's going to die, but he's a baller and does it anyway. His final scene sheds some light on the situation the heroes had to deal with. A monster called the Black Beast was wrecking havoc across the entire world. It's a story narrated by Rachel and drawn in the same art style as the most chosen one prophecies tend to be, which strengthens the sort of fairy tale feeling of the story. Hakuman apparently appeared out of nowhere, and five others just joined suit and fought. They were able to beat the beast, but people didn't like that Hakuman criticized them for... uh... something. I don't know what it was. 
and locked him in a dark room like a child having a tantrum. If that dark room is the time anomaly that kept him preserved, all this time is left up in the air. Finally, New 13's tale is the saddest of all. I've spent so much time talking about New, but never really described who she is, because you aren't given a lot right away. New is some kind of robot called a Murakumo unit, or android, and that's all we know. She's left as vague as possible, because all the story details would completely spoil everything. So I'll leave those details for later. New tramples and slaughters everyone in her path without remorse. Then meets Taukaka of all people in Hakuman's place? Yeah, I don't know either. She has to fight unlimited Rachel at the end, which is teeth grindingly hard. Rachel remarks that none of these events matter because New is dreaming, and Rachel is simply aware of this, despite being in the dream somehow. Winning the fight shows a graphic of someone who resembles Noelle a lot more than New, alone in the boundary sleeping. She mumbles out Ragna's name as the endings come to a close. And that's the arcade mode. Once you unlock the cutscenes and unlimited characters, that's all there is to it. Each route doesn't take too long, estimated around 30, maybe 40 minutes depending on if fighting Hakuman and New is a pain in the ass or not. Arcade mode gives us brief glimpses into the overarching story mode, which hasn't included in the original arcade releases, naturally. I also think it's a wonderful way to warm up and try and play these characters in a natural experience. There's only so much you can get from the training mode that just has them standing like dummies. Balancing against multiple different characters with different playstyles and learning how to counter and play against them is a lot more useful as a training tool. Now, the story is probably what everyone came to watch this video for anyways, so without further ado, let's... Let's, uh... Damn. You ever notice how pretty this game is? I wasn't entirely able to find a preferable spot to put this segment in, so excuse the intrusion, but goodness does this game look pretty. If you've been watching up to this point, thank you if you have by the way, then you will absolutely have noticed the gorgeous details in the character sprites. Sprites are exceedingly common in video games because it was all that people were able to do and make for several years in the earliest consoles. But, now since technology has progressed so far, they've usually been reserved for smaller indie titles when the artist can't draw otherwise. It's a common mentality to leave sprites behind for 3D models once you start making enough money, which is a crying shame because 3D models tend to look strange and uncanny only a couple years after release. Sprites are much more dictated by distinct art styles, so they can stay creative and fresh for a lot longer. Luckily for Arxis, Blaze Blue's sprites are the stuff of legends. Every character has a distinct pose, idle stance, animation style, and general flair that makes them wholly distinct. The way Ragna's blade hangs loosely from his tent pants compared to Jin's careful handling of his blade screams their personalities more than any other description could. Lavish use of smear frames and color are masterfully included for each special attack that really draw the eyes. According to a series of interviews by Silicon Era, there are five important methods to getting the sprites to look as good as they do. First is to draw traditional concept art for a character, which includes all of their animation frames. Every single frame of animation is carefully hand-drawn. Secondly, a 3D model is constructed and posed to match the frames drawn on sketch pages. It's curious to see how 3D models are being handled. The art form isn't solely rejected, but instead used to, for a construction phase for the sprites to really tie together how many different forms of visual art are used to make the game. Thirdly, the 3D model serves as a base for sprite artists to essentially trace over and reference. This is no small task, despite it being tracing. Every frame of the animation on the 3D model is traced over, and that's where the sprite work is born. Thousands of frames painstakingly redrawn with the consistent art style for each character. I could not imagine how teeth grinding it was to draw sprites for Arakune. Fourthly, heavy focus is given to the light and shading each sprite, which is done procedurally. And finally, they're ready to be implemented in game. I really hope they didn't get too many things wrong during the process, because they would have to go back to re spriting, then start again to insert it and check they got each shade of black right for the shadows. The process is tiresome and long, but produces incredible results. Not every game abandoned sprite work in the late 2000s, but none looked as fluid, as fantastic, as memorable as Blaze Blues. 
they knew they got it right the first time because for the returning characters, they reuse the exact same sprites, even if that means Carl never gets to grow up. Could you imagine being the guy tasked with animating all of Jin's ice effects? The sprite work is hardly the only art for the game. The other character renders were drawn by Mori himself along with Yuki Kato. The character select screen especially has a lot of time period charm. The way some parts of the body are stylistically oversized is a super charming feature. Look at how squashed Rachel's face looks, it's awesome. It's very much a product of the time art style. The ending cinematics and character sprites are rendered with a lot more detail and eye for proportions, likely a future-proofing effect because they would use the sprites for the entire length of the franchise. The character sprites during the story mode are a little static and it feels kind of awkward how people just open their mouths and stand there without changing poses. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I wish it were more like Danganronpa, which has the characters at least position themselves more creatively from the waist up to convey a more in-depth and believable conversation taking place, rather than everyone standing still in their stock family guy idol pose. Each character has about 20 alternate colors, some of being references to other properties, while other are just alternate palettes. I think most of CT's cast is well designed enough in their own colors, but there are some standouts. Jin looks incredible in basically any color that isn't his default, and Tager looks horrible in every color that isn't his regular skin. Jin already has a lot of clashing colors going on, so something like an all black or all yellow looks really stunning by comparison. Too bad there's no way to tell until you enter around. Oh yeah, take a notice that everyone's shoes. Everyone wears metal-plated boots and it will drive you insane every time you look. Character art is hardly the only thing that rounds the experience. Take a look at the backgrounds. I admire how they are so gorgeously detailed, yet completely distinct. The world of Blaze Blue is a scrambled mess of different ideas and cultures and themes all stitched together, represented phenomenally well by the boiling culture pot of the 13th hierarchical city. Chinatown, sewers, grand cathedrals, and lands beyond are brought to life by the steps that the character shoes make on the ground and the 3D models we see. That's right, the backgrounds are three-dimensional, but used quite cleverly. The foreground is rendered with a higher poly count not to break immersion while being spruced with 2D animated elements. Notice the people in the background ignoring a global terrorist killing this dude. The backgrounds of the background, so to speak, are much lower in the poly count, which helps make the game run smoothly. For every version that isn't the Steam port, apparently. It's kind of a wasted effort when the PC version doesn't work well with it, but its clever usage of lighting and mixing low and high poly counts for models intersects excellently to create a compelling environment that feels thrilling to fight in. But something's missing. There's some music that tends to play in the background. <laughs> you wanna know about the music? Most of this video has Blaze Blue music in it. Check the description. I don't wanna bloat the already extended length of just playing the OST outright, but let me talk about it. Arxis' love for rock and roll is alive and well with CT. Guitars and percussions are married with classical instruments and a huge selection of inspirations. Character themes range from headbang metal tunes to groovy, swanky tunes to chill to. The composer was Daisuke Ishiwatari, a certified legend in the world of game development. He was the number one guy making music for Guilty Gear, and he has only sharpened his skills for CT. On a less relevant note, he also made Guilty Gear. Like, all of it. He did a lot of the artwork, music, project leading on the franchise, and even voiced Soul for quite a while. Arxis has a bit of a reputation for a lot of their flagship series being led under the strong leadership of a single visionary. Daisuke and Mori are close friends, so it's no surprise the two would collaborate for Blaze Blue. Hell, Mori even has an OC and accent core over the form of ABA? ABBA? I don't know. Though, you would think someone as seasoned in the genre as Daisuke would offer some tips to the development staff, mainly to not end up with characters like Tager. Daisuke put his blood, sweat, and tears into this album, and it shows. He would go on to be the primary composer of every game in the series, and his wide range of inspirations and sampling give each entry a unique feeling. It's not quite on the level of French bread, mind you, but it's pretty damn close. The music isn't the only bit of audio that rounds the experience. Let's talk about the dub. English dubs for media not created in English-speaking countries have always been a strange case for me. I feel a bit of a dissonance when I want something foreign because I can't understand the language people are speaking. I know many people are purely subtitle purists and react very harshly to anything contrary. Their stance is not entirely unfounded, however. A lot of the dubbing done for English audiences is done pretty shoddily and not particularly pleasing on the ears. But, beating all the odds, Blades Blue stands head and shoulders above nearly any localized Japanese property. I know that because a lot of the cast comes from the fantastic Bleach dub. 
Arxis selected an incredibly dedicated and passionate voice acting crew that went on to define the characters' voices so tremendously that they became the primary voice cast for dozens of players, myself included. Special mention to Patrick Sates, Mela Lee, and Tony Oliver as Ragna, Rachel, and Bang, respectively. And especially Philly Sampler as Taukaka. God, first the rabbit and now you? Why'd all you guys harass me? Get out of my sight. God damn it. Have you ever heard of the word manners? Inquiring about a lady's nature is not only rude, it is the very height of impropriety. What a rude little girl. If you keep that up, I'll have to spank you. Meow. I'm hungry. I'm gonna starve to death. A good guy is just gonna turn a blind eye and let me die. I'll haunt you. A huge strength of the cast being so dedicated to their roles is consistency. They went on to reprise their roles for all future installments with one exception, and even came back to the limited anime series later, for better or for worse. If one weren't keen on the English cast, mind you, they are more than welcome to change to the Japanese voice cast in the settings. I, I don't watch a lot of anime and I don't know any of the names in the industry, so I don't have much of a comment to make about the Japanese voices. What I can say is that Ragnar is voiced by the same guy who voiced Joseph Joestar, so take that as what you will. Okay. This is probably where most people skip to. Blaze Blue's story is extremely, extremely complicated, convoluted, and other words to start with C that denote how lengthy and expository it can be. The reason why this video took so long to script and record and to edit is because of this absolutely gargantuan beast of a narrative. It's not so much that the story is extremely long, it's actually fairly concise, but the methods it uses to tell said story is somewhat unorthodox. I'll explain. Each character has their own dedicated story mode section. Each story is told through the lens of a visual novel from the perspective of whomever you've chosen. There are basic decisions you are required to choose to progress the story, but some decisions will lead to game overs, which are compulsory to 100% completion. If that didn't sound daunting enough, losing fights are included in that loss completion, so you need to lose every fight against every character in every route. If that also didn't sound daunting enough, some fights must be finished with distortions, or else you won't be able to progress correctly on the flowchart. Yes, there is a flowchart, but it's only available to see on the PSP version. No other version of the game has any visual indicators of what you're doing and where to go. That is absurdly exhausting and confusing. Why on God's green earth they decided to do this is beyond me. I know the story is non-linear, but they decided to have a narrative follow suit, but that is just insane. I'm not someone who prioritizes 100% completion on games, but for a story mode? Not every ending is relevant to tell the story, but you would be missing out on a character interaction's additional details by ignoring them. Even if the most narrative you'll get is just your character saying, damn, how did I lose? That's just horrific. These sometimes count for 1% of completion too. So you spend more time putting your controller down and letting the AI beat you than mashing through the text than any reasonable player should. I really hope you're comfortable with save scumming because that is the only way you're going to be seeing every outcome. That's five save slots for the entire mode, mind you. Not every character gets their own save slots. Everyone has to share five. For the love of God, please do one character at a time if you plan to fully complete this mode. A and to be honest, I'm not doing that. I tried, but having to engage with some of the airtight stipulations you were required to do simply is too much. Doing carnage scissors in this game makes me want to die, I'm not doing distortions all the time. Trying to 100% this mode is about as much fun as putting toothpicks in your toenails and kicking a wall. In order to get all of the multiple endings per character, you need to do so many different routes and decisions and precise actions in battle. What I've done is just start from the beginning and aim for the exact path needed for each ending. There are some routes that require all of the battles be finished with distortions, and I'm not done doing that. So, when I need to, I'll just be stealing clips from YouTube. Events must be omitted for brevity, but the very small bits of character development are not crucial to understand their motivations or the larger narrative at play. On the bright side, you do not need to do this to achieve the final story section, just complete every character's true ending, I think, and I believe you're good. A very small victory for the sake of my time and hands. 
Oh yeah, story mode has a bug where no music is played outside the battle. You don't have an ounce of remorse, do you? All right, here comes an iron fist of... Wonderful. Before we begin, it turns out the manual comes with its own prologue that I don't believe is entirely explained in-game. Time to flex my vocal muscles. I'll be paraphrasing to not add just straight ten minutes of reading off pages. Mankind faced extinction from the Black Beast, which rose from the darkness. Man's time was at an end until the six heroes used the long-hidden art of magic to slay the beast. The secrets of magic were shared, and man combined it with technology to make Armagus, which seemed to surpass both. This War of the Beast was called the First War of Magic. Once it was slain, it left bombardments of a radioactive energy called Seether all over the world. Armagus regulation was controlled by a new faction that had formed, the NOL mentioned prior, which ushered a new age of development and reconstruction nationwide. The NOL ruled as a mostly peaceful dictatorship globally, despite the largening socioeconomic gap of those who had Armagus and those who didn't. This is where we get the hierarchical cities, which were built on mountaintops to avoid the radiation. Also note the definitions I think change later installments? The system of combining magic and tech is called Ars Magus, while the weapons are called Ars Amagus, I think? Rebels calling themselves the Ikaruga Federation rebelled against the NOL, which prompted Armagus to use against other humans. The Federation was crushed during the Second War of Magic, also called the Ikaruga Civil War, came to an end, which led the NOL to declare that anyone who rebelled again would be instantly killed. We now enter our main story. The dust has settled after the Civil War has been kicked up again by Ragna the Blood Edge, who is slaughtering NOL armies single-handedly and smashing each city's cauldron, which is their power source. He is heading specifically to Kagetsuchi's because he senses the resurrection of one of the six heroes, Terumi. If that sounded wordy and complicated and hard to follow despite being a few paragraphs, it because it is. CT, like it handles everything, handles its story very clunkily at the start and expects you to digest a lot of proper nouns and names and locations right off the bat before even starting. I wouldn't recommend having a wiki out because of spoilers, but note taking is definitely encouraged. Also, I haven't engaged with the game's story mode in almost 10 years, so I'm definitely not remembering everything. I've written a lot of the section of the script as I go, because piecing everything together as you progress is part of the appeal of story mode, rather than a boring, concise, complete timeline overview. I have elected to follow an old IGN guide made for the story mode. It's been preserved on Steam, but following a guide is the quickest and easiest way to consume this mode. I'm not so ready for the journey ahead of me. Like the game mechanics section, I will be dividing it by character for simplicity's sake. After a desynced opening cutscene, we're free to choose almost anyone. I'll put a little notice that tells you which route for each character I'm taking. You can start from any character you'd like, but I believe the layout on the screen is intentional and the simplest way of understanding the narrative, with some limited exceptions. I'll address that later. Let's start with Titus. We see a flashback of Ragnar's childhood, when he was an orphan being raised in a Catholic church with his adoptive siblings, Saya and Jin, by nuns. When he was out to fetch a pail of water, the church was burned to the ground and the nuns were slaughtered. Jin appears to be at least somewhat responsible for the act and delights in the violence by cutting off Ragnar's right arm. The unnamed man is accompanying Jin and taunts Ragnar and lets him bleed out on his own. Ragnar's final thoughts are of Saya. From a broken childhood surrounded by tragedy and combat, it's no surprise that Ragnar takes on such a violent and misanthropic persona. He's willing to cut down people mercilessly, but also willing to hear their stories out and take pity on them. Even if he feels insecure by how often he spares people, he believes he should probably just kill. He is awoken from his daydream by Rachel. It's really obvious how down horrendous she is for Ragnar and wants to ride him, but she would never say it. Ragnar is upset about her shape-shifting animal friends and starts to scrap with her. Their fight is interrupted by Valkenhayn. I, I know who this guy is, and he still isn't exciting to introduce. He calls Ragnar dirty, poor, punk, and dips, and Rachel lets on she's always keeping an eye on him. Ragnar's annoyed, but finds a 13th hierarchical city. In the sewers of the city, he finds Arakune, who recognizes the Azure energy inside of his right arm. Azure is sort of the pure magic that comes from the boundary, which is where the cauldrons lead, which Ragnar's out to destroy. Ragnar wins a fight, but is stopped by Lychee before he can finish Arakune off. From here, there are two potential choices. For this ending, you must choose option 1. He loses interest and leaves Lychee to sulk. He thinks about his past as he enters the cathedral, but is, he's bum-rushed by a manic djinn. 
He wins the fight but hesitates to finish Jin off. He is accosted by Hakuman at the boundary who calls him Black Beast. Ragnar's Azure Grimoire, aka his right arm, is freaking out, which makes him even more nervous to fighting his Hakuman. He holds his own, but the same Grimalkin who is keeps interrupting him is in the arcade mode. He then vanishes into thin air. The cauldron opens and out comes... Noel? But evil, and sounding a lot more like new. Winning or losing the fight doesn't matter, because both outcomes lead to Noel grappling onto Ragnar and throwing themselves into the cauldron, with Jin not far behind them. Rachel looks on the whole situation with dismay and hints that the world is probably going to be baptized by fire and wakes for the next time over. The theories of a timeline reset and Rachel being somehow above it all are all but true at this point. This justifies how each arcade mode story can be considered canonical if all of them were just a potential scenario that got rebooted at the end. For the second true ending, the events play out exactly the same, but you have to finish at least one of the fights between Rachel and Hakuman with a distortion or astral heat. If you do that, New comes out of the cauldron instead of Noel. They exchange dialogue that's almost one to one with Ragnar's arcade mode, and the ending is the same, with both of them plummeting inside. Rachel says the exact same dialogue. When fighting Arakune, choose the other option. Ragnar and Lychi debate on if Arakune should be left alive. Lychi's heartfelt plea tugs at Ragnar and he leaves them be. He runs into two different bounty hunters, Taukaka and Bang, who are both easily dispatched. He finds Hakuman once again, and their fight is the same. Key difference being Grimalkin, or Jubei as his name is, actually appears on screen. He and Ragna have a talk. He sends Ragna back to the restaurant with Tao, and the two dine and dash to avoid paying the bill. Jubei seems to be somewhat aware that we, the player, made some kind of wrong choice in the story, or at least Ragna did, because this is labeled as the normal ending and not a true ending. I'm unsure if this is one that can be considered just as canonical as the least because the world doesn't end because Ragnar doesn't fight New or Noel, which seems to be the key factor in this. The bad ending has you follow the same path as the true endings except you must finish with an astral or distortion for each fight. I am not doing that, so I'm stealing this clip off of YouTube. After Hakuman, you confront New, and after a fight, she somehow turns into Ragnar? Ragna and New somehow fuse after this battle, which doesn't bode well for Noel when she arrives. Normal Noel, that is. Ragna harnesses his Azure Grimoire and becomes the Black Beast Reborn and just eats Noel on the spot. I guess Ragna's a Jin Shiruki. The circumstances of Ragna's arm are left vague, but it has something to do with the Black Beast either being possessed or it's a piece of the beast somehow? I I'm not sure. Jin's story picks up when he was adopted by the Kisaragi family, sometime after he went sicko mode and burned down his home and tried to kill Ragna. His nobility let him ace through his NOL academy life effortlessly, but he found himself isolated from his adoptive family and fellow students. Not that Jin minds. Jin is a huge cunt in just about every way and thinks that the average person is garbage. Jin's ability to obey orders is tested and broken when he heads to the 13th city to find the Reaper, whom he believes to be Ragna. On the way, he runs into Bang, who loathes Jin for his actions in the Ikaruga Civil War, and proclaims that the South of Ikaruga will rise again. Jin wins pretty easily. You're given the option to spare him or put him out of his misery. Jin takes pity on him in option one and leaves him to toil. Heading into the main city, he runs into Carl Clover, who asks Jin to stop hunting Ragna so Carl himself can collect the bounty. Jin beats the child within an inch of his life and remarks how uncivilized it is to drop out of the academy. His search continues into the branch office, where Noel Vermillion intercepts him and begs him to come back, telling him that his record will stay clean if he relents. Jin becomes overcome with rage because Noel reminds him of someone, which seems to be a common theme with her, and he just outright kills her in cold blood. Sometimes Jin's personality tends to flip and he becomes extremely maniacal and likes to giggle over committing as much destruction as he can. He reveals it just like he did when he destroyed his childhood home as he finds Ragna again the boundary, which leads to his narrow victory. When New crawls out of the boundary hole, his sword somehow implants memories into his head? I, what? He gets really mad at New and tries to kill her, which fails pretty hard. New brushes him off and she impales Ragna and they fall into the cauldron, with Jin not far behind. Are you beginning to see the recurring story elements? As Jin falls, he sees a glimpse of Rachel. He awakes, seemingly spared from the destruction of the world at Rachel's feet, who asks him if he wants to become a true hero. The events in other character story modes are beginning to intertwine and become more and more connected the more we play. When facing Bang, choose the option to put him down like a dog. 
It's a little ambiguous, but Jin cuts his chest open and he has to be attended to by his ninja allies. Jin flees in order to not draw more attention to his incestuous mission. He goes deeper into town and finds Tager, who has a major beef with him because of his NOL background, and you have to lose to Tager to progress? Yeah, okay. Rachel's two goons have dragged Jin to her Sonic Adventure 2 level castle home and calls him stupid and gay and pesters him for a fight. Right after that fight finishes, Jin is somehow transported to what I I think is true ending one timeline? He just killed Noel in the same manner, so the same events with Ragna and New 13 ensue, like exactly the same as the last ending. After the Rachel scene, he is suddenly fighting with Hakuman with no explanation, and after the fight, uh it it's finished. The ending's done. This might be the weirdest route in the entire game, with Jin just kind of popping up in random places. I'm combining both normal endings because they are quite similar. Normal ending 2, I think it was, you just have to lose to New at the end. The ending cutscene is an expanded version of his arcade ending, except Jin is apparently seeing flashes of current day Noel in his past. Ending 1 has Jin lose to Ragna, which disturbs him greatly because he keeps getting flashes to, I think, is different timelines? or different points in time, because he really wants to tell Rogna that he shouldn't fight New. He really wants to tell him. We get a new flashback to his academy life, where Jin has beaten the misogyny accusations by being kind to his childhood friend Tsubaki. He speaks briefly to her in her friend group, which includes Noelle and, uh, Squirrel? Jin gets another flashback of current Noelle and freaks out, but Noelle gets a current flash of Jin? Jin is clearly under some kind of manipulation, likely from Rachel, trying to gear him into becoming a hero, or at least fitting whatever role she wants him to be, and that involves taking some kind of temporal brainwashing or programming. His story is very surreal and takes on a much creepier atmosphere with a lot of references to mind manipulation and potential war crimes committed by the NOL. And speaking of the NOL, and being easily manipulated, the white void of her arcade ending is back, along with Rachel. Noelle awakes from her dream instead of a ship prepping to land inside the 13th city. Her mission to retrieve Jin from going AWOL is halted by her radio communicator breaking, but she's being led by someone from the intelligence division, Hazuma. Yeah, I don't trust this guy, look at this crooner. The two run into Carl when they arrive at the landing port. Kyle tries to get information out of Noelle, which she refuses to give. He decides to later beat it out of her. Hazuma ducks the fight and claims he isn't good at fighting. Please remember this fact for later. Noelle trounces Carl fairly easily, and he takes off. Hazuma notices that the doll Carl has is a Nox Nectoris, which are the strongest weapons crafted back in the Dark War against the Black Beast. He points out that Noelle's twin guns are also of the same craft, and notes that they sometimes have psychological drawbacks, boldly stating that Carl's personality has been altered somehow because of his doll, which opens a curious case about Noelle's personality, and how her weapon might be affecting it. Noelle, trying to find the NOL branch in the office, runs to Tager. After the fight, Noelle's eyes are darkened and she doesn't quite seem herself, following up on the personality influence Hazuma talked about. Though this implies that Noelle isn't strong enough to beat Tager without being influenced somehow, which is hilarious. She runs into Bang, who is pissed because he and Carl somehow knew each other. He claims Carl as a disciple, but who knows if Bang is really ever telling the truth. Speaking of Bang fibbing, he fakes his defeat for some reason and lets Noelle go. I think he was testing her resolve or something? It's a very weird scene, but also hilariously unbecoming of Noelle. That she can't even tell Bang was pulling his punches and faking his own defeat. Noelle is kind of a helpless scamp, isn't she? She meets up with Hazuma in the empty branch office, but is intercepted by Jin. After winning the fight, the cauldron bursts open, and New arrives and identifies Noelle as... herself? Noelle goes all robotic and the two scrap. The connections were becoming increasingly obvious, but now there's no denying the connection between Noelle and New. Is New some kind of future version of Noelle? She's at least somewhat connected to her through New being a robot does present a lot of issues. We see flashbacks of Noelle's childhood from her and other characters' perspectives, so unless those memories were altered or somehow falsified, she was able to grow up, which doesn't seem to be a trait of the units. New decides to just delete Noelle from existence. Hazuma was watching this whole thing bewildered. He spots a spying Rachel and frowns. 
Assumedly, Rachel is here to view the timeline what's happening, and Hazuma is somehow aware of this as well. You must lose to Tager to get this ending. Honestly, I don't even think a summary is worth it, because this is like a joke ending. What happens is that Noelle goes to Lychee's clinic after Taker drops her off, Bang accidentally calls her breasts small, and she enacts police brutality. Lychee chases her around to make her dress up like Guilty Gear characters, and she gets Tao tangled, Noelle lets herself get dressed up, she gets to play with Lychee's pet panda, which brings the ending to a close. Follow exactly the same path as the first normal ending, except win every fight with a distortion. Between each fight, Noelle comments that her guns do all the fighting for her, which leaves her mind to dwell on her past memories in the academy with her two friends, Subaki and Makoto. Dealing with the discrimination of Beastmen, which is what Makoto is, the family status, and her relationship with her parents. At the end, she confronts Nu, which reveals that Noelle is some kind of childhood amnesia which prevents her from recalling much of her early childhood that isn't in the flashbacks. The mirror reflection with her and Nu is a pretty obvious metaphor, but it makes her connections to Jin and Ragna's younger sister a lot more curious. Both her and Nu are said to resemble her greatly, and given that Noelle can't remember much of her earlier years, we're going to see some kind of revelation about that, I suspect. My leading theory is that Noelle is some kind of super advanced aging android built in her image. As was Nu, but Nu seems to be built for battle, which Noelle wasn't. At least not entirely. Rachel is chilling with Valkenhayn in her castle on Nowhere Land when she notices an irregularity in the stars, which hints at the world's fiery fate. She teleports away, leaving Valkenheim to his own devices. His alone time is interrupted by some kind of green boy who taunts him about an ambiguous past together. He leaves, and Valkenheim gets an uneasy feeling about Rachel's adventures on Earth. I love the metaphor about stars being used to represent the fate of the Earth. It really adds an extra dimension on how transcendent some characters are from the threads of fate. This route also introduces a new player into the story, this green boy. Rachel teleports into the 13th city, which shocks Carl, who happened to be standing there. He innocuously asked if Rachel was a witch, which offends her greatly. She stomps him out promptly. Carl's doll reacts rather negatively to Rachel, which is unusual because it typically doesn't react to anything outside of battle. However, it may communicate it thinks Rachel is bad news. Rachel wins the fight and leaves the broken Carl to his own devices. This kid cannot catch a break. Valkenheim teleports in and takes Carl to a clinic, while having a conversation with the doll, whose name is Nirvana, or Ada, as Carl calls it. I have so little clue what's going on. And speaking of not knowing what's going on, Rachel just teleports into the branch office right after Noelle and Jin got into a fight where Noelle was the victor. Rachel provokes a tired Noelle by insulting her eyes, then her guns, then implies she doesn't have any autonomy without them. Which is an eerily accurate prediction, given how big of a role they seem to play in allow her to win some fights. She attacks her to prove if Noelle has any power to change the outcome of the world, which I interpret to being saving the world and not having everything reset when Ragna and New fight. Noelle loses and Rachel snatches her Dracos away. I always thought Noelle was kind of a helpless idiot, but I can't. I kind of felt bad for her in this part. Iso, please give him back. No. Rachel dips immediately after. She ends up in the boundary somewhere with Hakuman, which she didn't expect him to be there. I think she poofs him somewhere else? I, I'm going to assume she just operates on fairy godparent logic. The boundary opening dashes Rachel hopes for saving the world, and the green boy showing up doesn't help either. She accuses the green boy of being the puppet master of why the world keeps blowing up, which he doesn't entirely deny. They argue, he dips, and then Ragna shows up. The two share a touching scene after the fight. Ragna seems at least somewhat aware of her outsider nature during all of this. The route ends with Rachel awakening from a nightmare back in her castle, ready to repeat the cycle over again. Choosing the second option, Rachel decides to hurt Carl even more, which draws Bang's attention, who had spotted the fight happening the whole time. She has no interest in him and tries to teleport away, but Bang hijacks her teleporting. They end up elsewhere in the city. Rachel notices that Bang carries a Nox Nectoris weapon just like Noelle, which means he has an important role to play later in the story, at least according to Rachel. She engages him in a brief fight, then teleports away, but her teleportation is a bit wonky. She is warped into the sewers, where one of her familiars is almost eaten by a hungry Arakune. 
After she wins the fight, she and later Valkenhayn determine that the timeline is kind of boned anyway, so they go back home. Rachel ponders on her family and wonders if she is truly worthy to be the heir to the Alucard family. Follow the exact same path as normal ending 1, except she was the second option when fighting Hakuman. Green Boy shows up and says something about Kokonoe, Tager's boss, would know about. Rachel thinks and teleports away. She bothers Tager to unlock the secret entrance to her hidey hole, which is one in a fight. She finds Kokonoe, who is another cat person, but not as much as a cat person as Taukaka. There's a sliding scale of how furry one is in Blaze Blue. She tells Kokonoe some tips and tricks for the next time over because she's already out of time for the world's fate. We then find out the green boy's name is Teremi, which upsets Kokonoe, who apparently used to know him, or at least knows of him. Observant viewers will remember that Terami was the manual's prologue name as one of the six heroes. So we know that Jubei, Hakuman, and Terami were the first half of the heroes, but characters like Kokonoe and Valmenheim have unspoken beef with the factions, which really activates the almonds. Rachel narrates that she isn't able to take direct actions on Earth, but rather has to subtly push things in the right direction. Her eyes are on people with Nox weapons, so Noel, Bang, and potentially Carl, Ragna, and especially Jin. She laments about her fate as an audience member rather than a cast member. This chapter was incredible, so many details were revealed, and we finally got a grasp on Rachel's motivations. God, the joke character gets her own story? Okay. Also, she's tied for the greatest number of endings in the story. And most of them are joke routes anyways. <laughs> Normal ending 1 has Town try and find Ragna a tournament for his bounty. She runs into Ragna, doesn't recognize him. She runs into Rachel and Noel, somehow? The only thing of note in her first ending is meeting Jubei, who is revealed to be kind of a deadbeat dad to the Kaka clan. The second ending has her fighting robot versions of Tager and herself with no explanation. She runs into Bang and there's this whole story about her becoming a ninja disciple, then Bang dying and Tao seeking revenge on his behalf. I straight up don't remember if anything else is different in her third ending to the second one compared to her just trying to eat Bang. The true ending at least has some lore snippets. All you have to do is select option 2 right at the start and you're good. She and Lychee just accidentally run into Hakumen after a brief Arakune squabble. The fact the path to the boundary is just right around the corner from Lost Town where the Kaka people live is hilarious. She runs into Kokonoe for some reason, who tells her that cat people like her are more like cousins in the gross incestuous Kaka clan. Tao is shot down back home and eats a bunch of expired meat. And that's the true ending. I'm serious. I appreciate that we do have a joke character in the roster, but why make her story, which is not meant to be taken seriously at all, a compulsory mechanic to getting the final chapter? It seems a bit silly, no? The Red Devil of Sector 7 is on a mission from Kokonoe to set up a ghetto space-time warp to bring Hakuman back to their lab, as well as to locate the Azure Grimoire, aka Ragna's arm, if possible. He loses connection with Kokonoe and runs into Taukaka. He trots away and walks through the city, only to run into Bang, who declares that his vibes are off and attempts to attack him. Bang is defeated and Tager moves on. In Orient Town, he finds Lychee and considers bringing her in to resume her position as Kokonoe's assistant. She tells him to kick rocks, so Tager stomps her out. Their fight is interrupted by Jubei of all people, who tells Tager not to worry about it and to leave, which he does. Inside the branch office, he and Jin square off. They talk about Jin's war crimes in the Ikaruga Civil War, and apparently Jin doesn't remember committing them? Either he's capping, or his memories are being altered or removed of the events. If Tager is victorious, he moves on to the boundary, where he finds Hakuman. Hakuman asks why Sector 7 wants to remove all the seether in the world, knowing just how much humanity depends on the energy to survive. Tager doesn't know, but he also doesn't care. Winning the fight, we also find out that Hakuman keeps disappearing because of Kokonoe's ghetto teleporter, and apparently she is also a Grimalkin? I don't know if I should consider that an in-game slur or not. Ragna shows up after Tager and just does not care and leaves right away. He gets a phone call from Kokonoe who is unusually emotional talking to him because she knows the world is going to die quite soon once Ragna's finished with his business at the boundary. Following the exact same steps as the true end but just lose to Jin. Their fight is interrupted by Arakune for some reason. Jin takes off and Tager scraps with the blobby boy. Right after the fight, the Black Beast awakens and just eats Arakune after the air, and presumably Noel if it follows to the same timeline as Ragna's bad end. This came the hell out of nowhere and it's awesome. All you need to do is finish Bang with a distortion or astral. 
Bang activates his super mode and beats Taker's ass so hard he has to run. After being repaired, Bang finds Taker again, but Kokonoe installs some upgrades and turns him into... <sighs> Golden Taker. Taker's blasts are destroying the Kaka village, so Kokonoe guilts Bang into taking the blast and intentionally losing the fight. She remarks how interesting it would be to experiment on Bang's body afterwards. Lychee's story mode comes before Arakune's, but I've elected to do his first because his story unlocks part of Lychee's story for some reason. As far as I know, no other character has a weird stipulation like this. He also has an insane number of branching decisions to make, even if most of them are just eat this dude or nah. So I can summarize this all pretty quickly. His dialogue is usually fragmented and choppy, but I turned on an option in the settings to have it be readable. Not that it changes his ability to communicate with anyone, or that his dialogue makes any sense to begin with. True ending has Arakuna eat Tager, Taukaka, all of the Kaka children, Ragna, then Lychee. Choose all first options. He runs into Hakumin, then Hakumin just rips Ragna right out of him, and then they scrap. Winning to Hakumin has Hakumin teleport away. Have Arakune remember Kokonoe and really want to kill her, and then I think Nu kills him? I think? Normal ending is the same route, except you lose to Hakumin. Oh, I guess Lychee wasn't eaten after all. Hakumin knows how to kill Arakune, somehow. Ending 2 is the exact same thing, but you just choose the options not to eat anyone. Ending 3 just has Noel throw him in the garbage after shooting him. No character or plot development to report here, you just need to meet Hakumin in a story for Lychee's to function properly. And here where I should mention there isn't any way to tell which endings reveal any interesting details about the world building or story, and some are just kind of there by necessity. If they chose to include story mode for all 12 characters, I figured some would only be there for fun, but the lack of any way to tell was a huge misstep. After a long day of work in the office, Lychee departs the upper layers of the city, looking for Ragna. She runs into Taukaka, who says she got a free meal out of him in Orient Town. Lychee hears suspicious noise, but chooses to ignore it. Choosing the first option, she finds Ragna and manages to convince him not to kill Arakune on the spot before he takes off. Satisfied with a day's worth of work, she intends to leave until she runs into Noelle. Somehow, she convinces Noelle that despite talking to Ragna moments ago, that was actually her brother who dresses up as Ragna. Noelle somehow buys this and leaves her alone. You're just terminally stupid, aren't you? Lychee heads to the Kaka clan's village and follows up on some research she conducted at the behest of the tribe's elder. We learn that the Kaka tribe was specifically beastmen bred for warfare and have eugenics hard-coded into them to prevent their numbers from going too high or too low. They reproduce by essentially asexual cloning. Their elder remarks that they are forsaken by capital G God and that no new souls are being born, just repeating the same lives until they all die for good. I was not expecting an insane lore dump on the Kaka tribe, but we do have one. That also explains Tao's mental state. The Kaka aren't known for their smarts, but given they clone themselves after a certain point, Tao might just be the result of too many clones. I also have to ask, what on earth was Jubei thinking with these things? How did he do this? Choosing the third option, Lychee fumbles the Ragna bag and runs into Bang, who may or may not have been spying on her. She speaks to some of the children of Ronin Gai, who revealed that their boss Bang has been responsible for most of Ikaruga's survivors not being slaughtered, and he personally helped build them and their community for them, which really adds a tragic angle to his character. Considering Jin is the hero of the town, he apparently helped raise and destroy, rather than someone who helped save it from its expanding imperialism. I was just joking about the American Civil War comparisons beforehand, but now? I don't know, man. Hope you got Arakune's and Lychee's endings proper, otherwise this one just doesn't work. If you choose to investigate the sound at the beginning, you will find a completely missable fight between Carl that tells us that Nirvana, his doll, is a war weapon and might not even be his sister. This is entirely optional and does not need to be fought under any circumstances. But you do miss some adorable interactions between Carl and Tao. Lychee fumbles Ragna again by choosing the second option and ends up in a fight you must win with a distortion drive. Ragna dips right after. Jubei, from the shadows, somehow knows that Lychee has used the boundary power for herself. 
Lychee explains that she just wants the power to change fate and revert Arakune from whatever he is now. Jubei tells her where to find him. Lychee considers Mercy killing him to quell her own feelings about the situation, but chooses to spare him and write a letter to Kokonoe for aid. She gazes at the stars and spots a shooting star, signifying the end of the world. Lychee's stories are all over the place, but they all end with a very somber tone that resonated with me a lot. Her story is complicated, but beautifully tragic and heartwarming at the same time. We open to a flashback of the Ikaruga Civil War four years ago. Bang is fending off the library, but not killing anyone because his master's philosophy dictates it so. He runs into Jin, who has seemingly killed Bang's master, and Jin scars his face. Bang chases after Rogna to claim the bounty and rebuild his country with the money. He runs into his crush and Tager speaking on the way. He confronts Tager in a jealous rage, but is eager to follow Lychee after Tager encouraged him to. And he totally ships Lychee with Bang. He runs into Rogna by pure coincidence, and Rogna just loses the fight intentionally just to have Bang leave him alone because he's really preoccupied at the moment. He finds her inside the sewers dwelling with Arakune, which Bang inserts himself into, hoping that Lychee feels the same way about him. After winning the fight, we can diverge endings from here. In the heat of the moment, Bang confesses to Lychee, who doesn't really understand the situation and just ends up friendzoning him. Bang leaves positively shell-shocked until he runs into Jin. He tends to find people he's looking for very quickly. Bang chooses to keep beating Jin after he wins the fight, which makes his sword overreact and cause an ice storm. Noelle is in hot pursuit and tries to arrest Bang, which fails because Noelle is just a massive failure. Bang tries to melt the ice with a fire technique, but he spread too much fire and caused a lot of property damage. Bang leaves quickly and thinks about his master. Instead of choosing to beat up Jin after the fight, he bites his tongue on his revenge and questions him about the NOL, which goes poorly because Jin tells him to kick rocks and leaves. The topic of Ragna is brought up, naturally, and Bang races to try and find him again. Somehow. Bang Zen ends up in the Alucard castle? I don't know, man. I don't know how he got there. Rachel and her gang ask Bang to die and or leave, which Bang takes offense to. After being mildly impressed with Bang's strength, they give him a tip of info. The son of Bang's master, Sir Tenjo, is apparently alive though they note that the info is old and it might be outdated. Bang is teleported away from the castle and takes the info to heart and leaves everything behind to go search for Tenjo's son. It's kind of astounding that Bang leaves everything behind that he built just for a hunch, leaving behind his feelings for Lychee, the community he built, even his revenge for Jin is left at the wayside, which makes it even more tragic because the world ending would prevent him from ever finding anything more. After you beat Arakune, choose to clear your head before confessing. Lychee will dip and Bang will try and track her down. Lychee finds Tao and tells her that Bang either has info on Ragna or meat buns to get Tao to distract him as she chases Arakune. After beating Tao, Bang's thirst for being a libertarian guy with an Asian wife leads him to the Boundary, where Hakuman is prepared to slash Arakune and Lychee down together. Bang blocks the attacks and faces him in battle. Hakuman is so pissed that he forgets his duties and puts all of his strength into killing Bang because he pissed him off that much. Bang casually asks Lychee on a date while she and Arakune escape, which she agrees to. We cut to the Tao village, where the roof has broken because of Bang and Hakuman's battle, and Bang's story has been immortalized of a tale of heroism along the tribe. The last shot is of them saluting their hero, who smiles down at them from heaven. God, that is adorable. Last but probably least is Carl Clover. Carl talks to Nirvana, or Ada? about capturing Rognita for his azure arm. Carl runs into Taukaku, who decides to throw hands at him for the lols. Winning the fight, he retrieves deeper into the city. Tager runs into him and is shocked to find out that he owns Nirvana. For this ending, you can run away from Tager entirely and just not fight him. Suddenly, Carl is teleported to Rachel, who thinks he should probably just die and is ugly and stupid and worthless, but wants to test his strength, presumably because of Nirvana, but with a handicap. Carl can't use Nirvana in a fight. Rachel's at a fraction of the health normally, so she's no sweat. She awards Carl with some info. Gathering more Nox weapons is going to potentially aid his cause in somehow fixing his sister. You're given the choice to confront either Jin or Noelle and get the same ending. I chose Noelle and robbed her guns. Carl finds Ragnar at the boundary after being stabbed by Nu. After a fight with her, Carl figures out he just can't win against her. Nu decides to completely shatter Nirvana into countless pieces, which also shatters Carl's psyche. As Ragnar and Nu plummet into the cauldron and the world, 
Carl spends his last moments with the remains of his robotic sister in his arms. Simply select the option to fight Tager instead of run. Tager tries to capture Nirvana, which makes Carl freak out and attack him. God, I hate fighting's Carl. After the fight, Carl flees and passes out, only to be rescued by Bang. Bang feels really bad for Carl because he thinks he's a traumatized basket case and takes him under his vigilante wing, which Carl begrudgingly obliges to take. We finally got an origin to Bang's trafficking, uh, Carl's apprenticeship. Okay, get this. You have to lose to Tao Kok in the beginning to get this ending. Hilarious. She drags you to Lychee's clinic. Carl's far too proud to stay any longer than he absolutely needs to, so he leaves in a hurry, which causes Lychee to follow after him. The Rachel segment is done exactly the same as the other endings. I chose Jin this time around, and Carl had no hesitation to boot gang his sword and kill him in the process. The fight with Nu is exactly the same, but Lychee jumps in the way for an attack meant for Nirvana, and Lychee sacrifices herself. Seeing his sister in Lychee, Carl breaks down again while the world comes to an end. I am so sorry for any Carl fans out there, there is nothing good in store for this kid at all. Even Rachel remarks that this kid is probably just doomed to die and make all the wrong choices. And that marks the traditional 10 characters needed to unlock the last two, Hakuman and Nu. I don't actually think you need the true endings of each character, but just any ending will do. I unlocked these right after I got the normal ending with Carl, who was my last choice. Let's see why they've been hidden from the start. Let's go with Hakuman. Hakuman's story isn't long, but is full of dense explanations and lore, so bear with me here. Hakuman is resting inside of a section of the boundary called The Edge when he is contacted by Kokonoe. Some kind of jargon she mentions makes him assume she's a witch, then comes to the insane conclusion that she's the daughter of someone named Nine and the Cat, which can only mean Jubei. Given how he knew that Jubei was in the Dark War, which we now know happened 19 years ago, it isn't shocking. Jubei confronts him, which also confirms my theory that Grimalkin is some kind of slur for beastmen. Jubei asks that Hakuman doesn't tell Kokonoe about him, which is hilarious, considering how much of a deadbeat dad he is. But an important question is raised. How is Jubei alive? The Dark War was almost a century ago, so did he just do some time skullduggery, or do beastmen just age slow? He also tells him that Terami is back and he needs to die right away. Hilarious to consider that despite being one of the heroes, every other hero really wants Terami to die and we don't even know what the hell he did yet. Because of some time dilation effects where Hakuman has to go with some kind of self-actualization process to be properly formed in the timeline? Think of the metaphor of Marty McFly disappearing because he won't exist. He teleports from place to place. He runs into Bang, who recognizes him as a member of the Six Heroes and asks for a friendly spar. Bang's resolve is to restore his home nation and protect the people close to him, which earns Hakuman's respect. He recalls not liking Bang when he was human, which is interesting. Hold on to that for now. After he wins, Hakuman is accosted by Rachel, who tells him that Nu has been spotted in the boundary and Rachel might have been responsible for waking her up somehow. For some reason, we also find out that the Murakumo units are intended for sort of some kind of boundary explanation and god cutting blade that's the best we're getting i don't know another teleport and he's at the boundary and runs into tager sent to retrieve him it's this fight that determines the ending you get hakuman wins and explains to tager that he has something called a causality phenomenon device which is somehow interacts with hakuman's fragile existence in the current timeline which grants a limited power called Quantum Superpositional Manipulation. Blaze Blue's story is infamous for blindsiding players with insane techno babble out of nowhere, and nowhere is it more binding and insane than Hakuman's story. Hakuman is warped into some kind of mental inner reality made possible through the boundary? Like a sort of dream world that you can interact with people in the real reality with. I, I am so beyond lost with this plot. He runs into Dream Ragna, which makes Hakuman both nostalgic and sad. Once he wins a fight, he cherishes the time he had with Ragna as his brother. You might be seeing where this is going. He is able to will his past self, who is Jin Kisaragi. First of all, huh? How'd that happen? What the hell kind of training did Jin go through to turn Rachel to turn to a cyborg? But also, 
How did Jin get sent back to the past? Hakumen was a hero of the Dark War 90 years before the story, so did Jin get put into the robot body, sent back in time, trapped inside of the boundary, then come out again? I must also point out that he and Jin have the exact same voice actor, so the twist might have been a little more blatant in retrospect. Where will I find myself this time? Shall I return to the edge again? Or perhaps to the depths of the boundary? The NOL has already issued a level D alert for Kagutsuchi. I'm sure you're aware. That means all organizations must suspend activity until further notice. No time for questions, because they won't be answered in this ending. Hakumin frees himself from the boundary correctly, I think, and meets with Kokonoe. They both hate each other, and she only wants him for his body. Literally. His robot body is called Susanoo, and she needs it for Terami, presumably. Hope you liked all that, because it wasn't even the true ending. Losing to Tager, yeah I know, also as you teleport away. This time to Rachel's castle. Rachel actually seems pretty cool with him, even if she's just proud of her work of turning Jin into whatever he is now. They spar, and she restores his ability to exist in the current reality somewhat, and he buckles down and waits for the opportunity to cleanse the world of its sins, which I assume means he's waiting for Rognan to arrive at the boundary. What happened to Jin's sword? The Ice Sword. Hakuman is a different blade, so did Jin get a trade offer? Where the hell is Hazuma? Or Terami for that matter. What's going on? Last character story of all. Remember when I said I had no idea what was going on? Yeah, get ready to feel that again. We see new inside of the Azure inside the boundary. We see a young Noel, or Saya? Uh. New tends to just float from place to place, not really knowing why she's there. She runs into Carl, who wants to take the Azure inside of her for himself. New smashes Nirvana to pieces after a fight together and floats away. She ends up in the branch office and meets a strangely familiar Jin who acts like she is Saya, and they still live together as a church in the family. Her, Jin, and Ragna. I think someone gets a memory of Ragna killing Nu in a previous timeline? I think? This is where the timeline splits depending on how you win the fight. Jin seems a little aware of it because he flips the script and instantly tries to kill her and calls her for fabrication when he loses. Nu subdues, but doesn't kill him. She floats to the boundary and meets robotic Noel, who confirms her as identical, Assuming that means they're just the exact same. Guess Noelle's a robot now. Noelle calls New a clone after New wins the fight, which makes her really cheesed off and she just wipes her off the face of the earth. New recalls Saya's memories as Ragnas comes to the boundary and a repeat of the arcade final fight, and I think Ragnas' final fight happens, where they pierce each other, fall into the cauldron, and Jin tries to catch them. You get used to seeing this scene a lot, because it's happened like six times. You still have to win against Jin for the true ending, but you must win with a distortion or astral. After the confrontation, New wakes up in the Azure, implying that all the events prior were just a dream, or something like that. Somehow, Arakune is inside the Azure? He just shows up and wants to eat New. New seems to ask permission to go into battle mode, but no answers are given who she's talking to, if anyone at all. The two exit, and Arakune is slaughtered. New is confronted by Unlimited Rachel, who tells her something similar to our arcade ending, that she's dreaming and needs to wake up, and that she's going off script. After a fight, New is presumably black in the boundary asleep, dreaming of Ragnar Noel. Okay, if I don't voice it now, I will probably forget, but I really, really, really wish there was a way to tell which endings are important and which ones aren't. I was going to get all of the endings regardless, but for players who don't want to spend a lot of time doing that, I think there should be some kind of system implemented that at least nudged you in the right direction. Some true and normal endings work best if you get the normal first, then true, but you're asking a lot of the average player to engage with an already confusing system. But now, we've got all the true endings. Here we go. The true end tends to jump from perspective to perspective quite quickly, so I really hope you've been making notes for each character's stories. Or, at the very least, Ragnas, Noel's, and Rachel's. The true ending begins before Ragnas even made it into the city. Ragnas walking through the seether clouds when he meets Jubei. Jubei warns him that his old pupil that something quite dangerous will happen soon, and when he knows, he'll know. Ragna heeds the warning and still heads to the city to smash the cauldron. We jump to Noel and Hazma, who have just arrived in the city. They decide to spend some time investigating and asking questions before nightfall, when Ragna plans to attack. They discuss the missing Major Kisaragi and his weird obsession with Ragna. 
cut to Jin, who has made it to the branch office, noticing how empty it is. Ragna is teleported by Rachel, who tests his skills in a fight and teleports him to the branch office, where she so obviously simps for him. Which he still doesn't seem to notice. Jin! I hope that cutscene startled you, because it sure did startle me. Reminder that the audio for the anime style cutscenes don't fall under the universal audio settings for some reason. Also the art quality is, uh... Ragna v Unlimited Jin is underway. Ragna seems to be getting flashes of past timelines into his head, which is confusing. He snatches a dub and leaves Jin alive for future questioning, and because he can't bring himself to kill his brother. Noel and Hazuma catch up and find a knocked out Jin. Hazuma doesn't care about Ragna's affairs, but Noelle is filled with adrenaline and leaves Hazuma behind to go search for Ragna. Ragna runs into Hakumin and remembers Jubei's wise words. The two fight each other, but Hakumin is teleported away... or is he? He resists Kokonoe's warping, which shocks the hell out of her. She advises Ragna to leave, and he somehow hears it? I thought she was using some kind of relay or microphone to talk, but it seems a lot more like telepathy. Ragna is forced to take dire action. I didn't want to use this, but... Restriction 666 released. Dimensional interruption imaginary number formed. Uh... Azure Grimoire? Activated! Take this, you son of a bitch! Unlimited Ragna v. Hakumin is underway. Noelle is getting consistent past memories beamed into her head as she makes her way to the cauldron. When it opens and new emerges, she goes into robot mode and reveals herself as Unit 12, anti Sankishin Unit Core? Which would put her ahead of New 13 Murokuma Unit, I, I think? Ragna takes over the fight with Nu, which doesn't go super well because he's still impaled by her, and the two fall into the boundary. Noelle defies fate. The two share a tearful moment, but Ragna doesn't actually know who Noelle is at all, and neither does Noelle, so it's a bit awkward. Noelle literally cries herself to sleep, and Rachel inserts herself in the situation. Rachel calls Noelle the Eye, which is intended to inherit the Azure, unlike Ragna's weird arm. She says things are going crazy and not to worry about it for now, but then she decides to do this. Noelle seems to forget what happened. She tries to arrest Ragna on the spot until he arrives. Hazuma, I, I think he just sat on the side and watched this all happen, gets possessed, I think, by Terami. Everyone loses their minds because it's revealed that Terami was the one who burned down Ragna's childhood church and caused the domino effect that destroyed his life. He then leaves. 
you have any questions about this, I'm sorry, but the game is over here. Yeah, the game just kind of ends. Hope you weren't looking for everything to be tied up in a nice bow. Oh, yeah, there is an after credit scene. Noelle's academy friend, Subaki, is called into Hazuma's office because she's been assigned a super-secret mission from the Imperator, the head of the NOL, so essentially the God King of the World. The task? Assassinate Noelle and Jin. Now the story is over. There aren't many stories that can be described in the exact same phrase when you start it and when you finish it, but CTs can, and that phrase is, what the hell is going on? Oh yeah, first I must talk about Teach Me Miss Lychee. Right after the saves menu is a smaller visual novel that acts as an in-universe glossary to explain lore, events, and world building. If you're asking why I never brought it up until now, it's because I had no idea. Nothing in the game points to it, in my knowledge. I watched the introduction on my Xbox, but you have to get certain parts of the story to unlock more episodes, I'm pretty sure. What are those certain points? No idea. Instead of being a list of terms and nouns, it follows a non-canonical story of Lychee teaching Taukaka about the world they live in, from locations and magic and whatnot. And some of these details you may put together from playing your story on the own, but some are only really obtainable through this optional mode. You are not told at a single point in the story that Valkenhayn and Jubei know each other and go way back unless you played this mode. The best and most thorough explanations of what Ars Magus is, how Seether works, and how the NOL is run is featured here, not in the campaign. This is hardly a bad idea on paper. It allows for anyone who's curious to brush up on the in-universe lexicon without having awkward moments in the story where characters have to explain concepts that they would otherwise already know. But the execution is clumsy because half of each novel segment is sandwiched between goofy character interactions. Entertaining? Certainly. Distracting? Absolutely. I'd rather have this mode than not have it, but its implementation is clunkier than I'd like it by quite a long mile. I just don't think I should learn how a fictional government dictatorship works sandwiched between jokes about Noelle's breast size. Now that I've addressed that, I want to talk about how I feel about the story as a whole. Forgive me for how scattershot everything is, because I, I really can't pick a place to start. How about the final novel segment? Can you tell me what's different about this and Ragnar's true ending? Noel grabbing his hand and Hazma showing up. Details about Kokonoe and Terami wouldn't hit nearly as hard if the game simply started here, obviously. But is it not a bit silly all it took to overcome fate was Noel, of all people, grabbing Ragnar's hand and letting Nu just fall into the soupy soup cauldron? Noel? Dumb as a brick, Noel. What happened to Hawkman in the final story? Did Bro just dip after Ragnar wiped the floor with him? If I had to point out my single biggest complaint about the story, it's the lack of answers. I am well aware that CT is very much a setup game meant to establish set pieces and characters, but if that was the purpose, why muddle it with such a complicated and convoluted time travel plot? The time travel is also a victim of this. How can some people remember past events in different timelines and some don't? I can accept Rachel knowing, but how on earth would Ragnar just suddenly get a headache and remember something that version of him never did? Is he psychic? Was there an insane explanation for it that I missed somewhere in a losing scenario against someone in a story route? So many characters just feel tacked on. I love some of these side characters, but it does feel kind of awkward that Hakuman has such a large slice of development revealed to be Jin sent back in time and now the future, and he still gets his ass kicked. He slew the Black Beast, who is Ragna, I think? Not sure how that works, but how come Ragna never finds out? Would it not be a lot tenser to have a final confrontation between brothers in the second to last fight of the game chronologically? I really wish some characters got more screen time. I know damn well there would be a main cast that we should focus on, but a lot of them are just there for world building. Not everyone needs equal attention and huge fleshed out character arcs. But was there really nothing to be done with Arakune in the main story? Apparently whatever business Rachel has with the knock weapons can wait, because Carl and Bang might as well be sitting on their thumbs for the main plot. Oh yeah, weird question, what's up with vampires? Rachel has so much going on with her that being a vampire is something I often forget about. But people just seem to know that off the bat, and not care. Her family sits in some kind of outer world castle, and I don't think we get much of an answer for how old anyone is. I think vampires are ageless or something. Not many franchises can have vampire as a tertiary character trait. I just don't understand why they would go through so many wonderful world building and great character moments for the story mode for individual cast members if it doesn't show up and come into play, at least not yet. 
I understand that a sequel was already in the works in this game, but I don't think it was a super wise idea to put all of your chips on the first game doing Iron Man numbers and then just elaborating later. What does Calamity Trigger even mean? Is it a place or a person? I guess it's new, because her dying with Ragna is what caused the calamity of ending the Earth, so I guess she's the trigger? If someone stopped playing here, they would be so lost. Terminology is so dense, there are so many complicated Latin that it drives me up the wall because I am not educated enough to try and pronounce it without looking like a tool. Though, I feel like the NOL wouldn't mind. An appendix would have made that just such easier. I've been quite critical of a lot of little and large details about the story, but I would like to say that I still enjoyed my time with it, even if that time was under the wing of an internet guide written decades ago. It might not be fair to praise it if it's compulsory to have a guide with it, but hopping from story to story and filling in the blanks about the world and plot was something I still found very entertaining and satisfying. I haven't played many visual novels, mostly limited to whatever Spike Chunsoft churns out, but I felt the novel segments were just functional. Aside from the missing music, that is. The speed up button works fine, you can hide the menu, changes and tweak small settings like the text box transparency and turn off individual character voices in case you really hated one character in particular, but it does feel pretty bare bones, even compared to similar games in the time frame. I do applaud the story mode for being in this style over a more cinematic experience that awkwardly flip flops between cutscenes and gameplay like the Mortal Kombat games do. The world of Blaze Blue is incredibly interesting, and the slower pace of the novel style really accentuates that. Our own world cultures are alive but have mutated into something that feels fresh and familiar with their own distinct flair. Healthy doses of Asian and European architecture, mythology, aristocracy, and character designs really help hammer home the state of the world. A crumbled ruin of what it once was, totally dominated by a totalitarian world government risen from war. To put a very complicated story lightly, I liked it quite a lot. I liked the main cast, for the most part, and it managed to be thrilling, funny, compelling, and other big words, even if it was kind of a chore to experience it in the best way possible. If they just added multiple save slots per character, there would be so much less stress in the whole situation. Or. Just do what Zero Escape does. Zero Escape is a series deeply involved with time travel and alternate timelines. It has an extremely useful flowchart that shows you exactly what actions lead to what scenarios, and you can jump from event to event as long as you've played them at least once. It does require a player to be very involved and aware of that narrative to keep with the swapping scenarios depending how radically you choose to jump ahead or back. The story is a beast. A black beast, even. It's confusing, messy, complicated, thorough, conflicting, contemporary, and satisfying, and I love it for that. It's incredibly unique and stands out in a crowd in ways that no other narrative can really claim, which inherently makes it more memorable. It was a tough pill to swallow at times, but it was a pill I came to cherish and respect for how much work was put into it. This story is made in the course of over a year, too. The arcades didn't have story mode, so Team Blue put a tremendous amount of work into making this visual novel game mode to tell their tale the way they wanted to. I've yet to see any developer interview or insights on how they plot out the story, but there is an absolute method behind the madness. All of the pieces are in place, and it's now up to the next game to use them effectively, and that's why I love the story. And that's all I have to say on the matter. As much as I would like to drag my feet and talk about every single detail to lengthen this tectonic script even longer, I gotta cut it off somewhere. I know I've just sung the praises and critiqued the story mode, but there is a little secret I haven't told anyone so far. In Blaze Blue Continuum Shift, the direct sequel, there's a part of the story called Calamity Trigger Reconstruction, which tells a much shorter, much more focused, and abridged version of the story. With some exceptions, this completely shatters most reason to play Calamity Trigger's story. It mostly focuses on Ragna's and Noelle's perspective, but those two are really the only ones that advance the plot anyways. You might be missing out on some lore and character details that help complement the story. I neglected to talk about it because I feared I mentioned it, it would completely shatter anyone's ability to care about me waffling about this game's story when a much easier version to consume it is in another game. I still advise playing CT's story for character interactions and world building, but given how complicated it would be, 
What's stopping someone who's strapped for time making the much easier method of playing Reconstruction and reading those details online? It's far from the only way to experience CT's story in a much easier manner, however. There's a massive pile of literature one can read. There's the CT light novels, three different CT manga adaptations, and the anime Alter Memory. Okay, maybe don't watch the anime. I don't bring all these examples and diminish CT's efforts, but to simply showcase that there are many different avenues of consuming the story, all of them with a far less complex way to do so. Even if some falter in quality, there is at least a demand for this kind of content that retells the story in different mediums. Which one you choose might be up to preference, but it rounds to my grand thesis statement about CT as a whole. Narratively, it serves as a poor introduction. The storyline is well written and compelling, but it's hard to grasp due to the strange nature and presentation. Without the adaptations of CS's reconstruction mode, I fear that people would have been a lot more confused about the goings on of CS's story without understanding CT's. But narrative isn't the only thing CT offers a mediocre introduction to. I've gone on quite a bit about CT's interesting mechanics and gameplay, but CS once again has several advantages over CT. Mainly, the game was balanced. Twice, in fact. CS was given much more time to properly balance and fine-tune its cast of characters, partially because it had a base to work off of which allowed the development team to improve where they desperately needed to, as well as add new mechanics and new characters. Perhaps it's unfair to compare a game to its sequel, especially for the first game in the franchise, but this is Arxis. This isn't a studio unfamiliar with the genre, they made Guilty Gear. It wasn't all the same people involved, but the questionable aspects of CT still present a hurdle of entry that can easily bar people from enjoying it. Especially since the popular opinion is, the games don't get good until CS Extend. I don't want to bully CT just for trying, but it can be hard to appreciate what it has started compared to its more talented and polished Sixter game. Is CT a bad place to start for gameplay mechanics? Well, a lot of fundamentals are fully functioning and still feel satisfying to use. But the lack of a networking ability or training mode curb a lot of players' potential to grow, two modes that CS has. Even if it's just word of mouth, people would still prefer to start a game with mechanics that can be applied to more popular titles in the franchise. Arxis updated CS with free 2.0 update and a new version, while CT got a port and a few smatterings of quality of life features, most of which aren't even in the PC version. I think the message is pretty clear. There are a ton of mechanics that got left in the dust once CT dropped, some of which I don't think I want to mention for the sake of brevity, and plenty more that were overhauled into a much less insane form. What do I think of CS's mechanics compared to CT's? You'll have to wait for the CS video. Whenever that is. I don't even know when I'll be finished this one. My life is kind of spiraled out of control, and god knows how long covering everything BBC Sex has to offer. Yeah, BBC Sex is what it's called. I'm hardly an expert on the topic, but it's saying something that the other games received expansions and future work while well, CT was left in the dust, only remembered for its story, which has been adapted elsewhere countless times, and for its lackluster PC port. I know a fair bit of people come back to CT to experience some nostalgia remember the Dark Ages, mostly new fans upset that she sucks in every other game. If you have to define CT as anything, let it be this, product of its time. It was cool for a late 2000s release and helped restore the genre to a much better place it is now as of recording. But CT is remembered as a foundational piece that paved the way, rather than a shining beacon on its own. It's a tough position to hold, but it's one that I respect it for. I really like this game not in spite, but because of its flaws. Even the most frustrating parts of it still fail to be truly devastating and looping back to being charming. I don't think this game is that good of a starting point narratively or mechanically, but I don't think one can really appreciate where the franchise went past it and where it is now without paying respects to what laid the road ahead. And for that, I think we owe CT and the lovely people at Arxist a huge thank you for their tremendous efforts. Even if you don't play this yourself, I hope my overview was a good enough starting point. That being said, I think it's high time to start wrapping things up. I haven't had the time to explain it before, but I'm a big fan of the Danganronpa series. Sorry for party well, at least the first two games. 
Danganronpa 1 and 2 are really fun mystery visual novels that flourish on handheld devices. Something I always point to draw people into this series are the various executions specific characters must face. The plot is deceptively simple. 16 high school students trapped inside of a location and murders ensue as they try and earn their freedom by killing each other. Because if someone can kill someone and get away with it, they are set free. Class trials are held to determine who is guilty so that the rest of the cast can survive while the murderer is punished via being executed until everyone is eventually dead or someone meant to escape. All of these executions are deeply personal to their characters and make a kind of statement about their personalities, designs, and etc. Of course, Danganronpa is something of a black comedy series that exaggerates the violence and viscera to make it seem both funny and not to wallow in too much melancholy all the time. The blood is stylized as a hot pink color for a reason, you know. Look at some of these executions, they're all very bombastic and kind of silly in a way. The violence isn't too filtered away, but there's an element of comedy in all of this. Danganronpa is a funny series that knows the fact it's an anime death game with zany characters and takes advantage of it. But what if I told you there was an execution that played itself completely straight? An execution that, to this day, shocks the community to its very core and stands head and shoulders above the rest of them. At least in my opinion. To explain that, I need to establish some context. The very first Danganronpa game was released in 2010 for the PSP. It came from a hellish development cycle under the name of Distrust from a couple years ago. Distrust was originally a much darker project, but it still carries a lot of the same DNA we would see in the first game proper. Especially so for the first two design characters for the game, Leon Quada and Sayaka Maizono, who would compose the key players in the game's very first murder trial. Sayaka, desperate to escape the school she and the rest of the cast were confined in, concocts a devious plan. She lured the innocent Leon into Makoto's room, where she planned to stab him and frame the murder on protagonist Makoto Naegi. This plan fails because Sayaka didn't realize that attacking someone nearly twice her size was a bad idea, and Leon was able to quite easily defend himself and break her wrist in the process. Out of rage in the moment, Leon murders her with her own knife and attempts to hide the evidence in a way so poorly that he is almost immediately suspected and convicted. Never mind the fact that Sayaka wrote his name upside down to directly point at him. Look, it's the very first case in the game. It's a gameplay introduction more than a head scratcher. Leon is identified as the killer, and look what happens. Compared to the other beginnings for other executions, the characters are restrained or trapped in a hopeless situation, where something so shocking it borders on the parody happens, but their bodies are still mutilated. Teru Teru from the second game is coated in flour and eggs in the beginning, but he's still boiled alive inside of a volcano. Compare this to Leon. Look at how dirty and fish-eyed the camera is here. Look at the chain wrapping around his neck and dragging his body across sharp metal floors. He survives being dragged across concrete and is restrained to a pole, where he is pelted by baseballs until... Actually, I'll let the clip speak for itself. Notice how they was presented versus the other execution clips I've shown. This scenario might seem dramatically funny because of the baseball association, given that Leon is a baseball star, but the joke is quickly muddled when you realize that he's being pelted to death. Look at how the camera fleeces as blood, not hot pink, real dark red blood spurts out of his entire broken body. As he opens his eyes one last time and he has bones crushed by the velocity of the baseballs being fired, we get to see the other characters' reactions, which happens so infrequently that you might as well forget the franchise even does that. In canon, all the characters are witnessing the executions, but most of them don't have any visual reactions to them. 
Here, everyone gets a close-up shot of their horrified expressions to really drink in the panic and fear they're feeling. That this will happen to you if you're caught murdering someone and can't escape. There isn't any fantasy feeling to this. There's absolutely nothing funny. We're watching a bunch of teenagers see someone who was at some point their friend, someone in the same boat as them, assaulted and strung up like meat, while the baseballs all around him are denied their stylish shoe and shown for what it really is dark red clumps of blood and skin and hair. Leon has ceased to be a person is now a corpse strung up like a scarecrow from Monokuma's malice. This is our establishing execution, the very first one to take place. This is the picture in the back of everyone's mind as they try and survive in Hope's Peak. Several other characters are executed, but none of them are depicted this graphically, this monstrously as Leon's was. His misdeed was a horrifying example for the students, as well as for the audience playing the game, what you should expect from this killing game. The game's rated M for a reason. This level of brutality has been matched and occasionally exceeded, but never carried the raw emotional edge and shock of what Leon had to go through to set an example. It's absolutely haunting. It's a fragment of the distrust beta. It's something that the series has never dared replicate. And that's why I've included this on this episode of Strange Gaming. But what are your personal favorite picks? I have very strange opinions on the franchise as a whole, and I would be delighted to hear what you guys and gals define as your personal favorite executions. There are quite a few of them across all three main games, so I'm sure people will have their odd favorites. Let me know in the comments section below, and make sure to check out the Strange Gaming playlist to find other videos in this style, and subscribe to the channel for more weekly uploads. And until then, have a lovely rest of your day. Okay, look, I know you know what Yume Nikki is. My video will not be the first time you've heard of this game. Ever since it was released in 2004, Yume Nikki's been gathering labels like cult classic and influential indie game like the Infinity Stones of RPG Maker Horror. But what I can tell you is that I plan to sweat the small stuff. I want to give you an accurate and fairly comprehensive understanding of why this game made strides in the indie developer scene, but also leave some details tantalizingly vague to push you towards playing the game yourself. Because despite its monumental impact, you might be surprised by how many people who have played games inspired by it but haven't played Yume Nikki itself, and I was one of those people. The kind of feelings this game had a major role in birthing and growing are something I hold very dear to me as an avid gamer, but I kind of feel intimidated by how open-ended it was, and how this unmistakable aura of intrigue and mystery surrounds this game to this very day. Even in the year of our lord, 2023, people still feel a little antsy to download this free game. Don't worry, let me be your guide. I still highly recommend you play this game on your own and let your own experience color your feelings in the game. But if you're looking for the next best thing, let me explain it to you. I'd like to show my respect for this game, as well as for its creator, Kikiyama, by fully delving into this dream world full of unknown sectors and haunting locales. It wouldn't be much of an exaggeration to say that this game inspired a whole generation of future games that followed as lonely footsteps. You've probably seen at least a couple screenshots of this ghostly figure, or a bizarre locale with strangely designed architecture and something inexplicable in the background. If I didn't explain exactly what made this game so iconic and how it spoke to a generation of misanthropes, I'm not really sure what to tell you. I didn't grow up with the game, but I know a million other versions of me in alternate timelines that did, so I'll pay some homage to them, as well as the people just like me, the wanderers and dreamers of life who felt intertwined with Madotsky's life detailed in her journal. I'll be playing the 2018 Steam release, which was published by PlaySim. It's a decent enough version, but this translation is a lot more of a localization rather than just a translation. Certain words in Japanese reference things that don't entirely line up in English. For example, Snow Woman wasn't what the Japanese name referred to, but it's close enough to the point where I don't really care anyways. With no further delay, let me explain the impact of Yume Nikki. Have you ever heard of RPG Maker? Of course you have, why am I even asking this question? RPG Maker is a series of software designed for the average Joe like you or I to design role-playing games by providing a working game engine and pre-made assets to interact with in an easy-to-understand environment. 
Once you get past the basics of understanding his tile sets and logic, you're encouraged to upload your own assets and eventually start coding your own functions in the game. At least RPG Maker XP had the ability to code in the Ruby language. 2003 didn't have any coded options, which makes it incredibly accessible, but also fairly limiting by comparison. However, this set of limitations didn't prove to be claustrophobic, but instead a cultivated innovation. The restrictions allowed for people who had mastered its simple system and created original assets to make games that rely on the incredibly familiar RPG genre with some old school graphics. That's what was intended, mind you. There's a basic RPG system of numbers and elements you could modify at your leisure to create a pretty basic Final Fantasy style game, but there were no requirements to actually include this in your projects. The fact the software could just run your game as is with very little stipulations allowed for people to break the RPG mold and create branch movements of games that might not have existed otherwise, at least if you're Japanese. Most of the RPG Maker software was made by one Japanese company, and none were released internationally legally until XP in 2005. There were disc copies distributed in some parts of Asia and Russia, but most of those products released were Japanese and distributed in Japanese forums for a Japanese audience. But what if I told you one of these games broke the mold and became a globally known acclaimed classic, despite these humble origins? In 2004, a website created by Kikiyama was created. Who was Kikiyama? I think he would generally prefer if no one asked that question. The identity of this game developer is something he prefers to keep to himself, so I won't delve too deep into what little is known about his life. You can read the embarrassing and awkward Toby Fox interview for that, but I can at least summarize the basics. The website he created contained a project he had made an RPG maker called Dream Diary, or Yume Nikki when translated. Part of the reason it gained such a cult following was because it was freeware, anyone can download it for no money at all which helped encourage people spread it around the Japanese forum site 2chan. The one-of-a-kind atmosphere and mysterious nature of the worlds you explored fostered countless discussions, which led to greater international interest, which created several different fan translations in a variety of languages, with varying degrees of playability. Internet forum culture kept the game in circulation until official translation came in 2012, after the game was being distributed by Japanese publisher PlaySim, it eventually found its way onto Steam in 2018, which is how I chose to download the game. Every version of the original game is free, so it doesn't entirely matter where you find your copy. It's awe-inspiring that a small project found on an anonymous creator's website managed to thrive on the internet for just shy of 20 years. But what kept drawing people in? There must have been something that stood out enough to cultivate such an intense following. Why did so many people credit Yume Nikki for being one of the first of its kind, the RPG maker horror or exploration genre? I would say spoiler warning, but with this game, just having played the game is enough of a spoiler on its own. Let me explain. Once you interact with the standard RPG maker menu, you're immediately introduced to the game and what few mechanics it has to offer. You play as Madotsky, a little girl living alone in her apartment. She refuses to leave and interact with the world outside of her balcony, confining herself in her room and documenting her lucid dreaming inside of her dream journal, which acts as your save system. All you need to do is fall asleep and interact with your bed by pressing the enter key, and you've entered the nexus. If you're looking for any greater story or objective, I'm afraid I've got nothing to give you. Yume Nikki decided to boldly do what very few games did at the time and let the player have complete control over where they go and in what order. Really, there's no strings attached. All of the doors you can see can be entered at any time and explored at your leisure. To someone skeptical, this idea might seem unfocused and kind of lazy. How is one supposed to be motivated to explore a game's world if the core narrative through line is held together by popsicle sticks? However, this ends up being the game's pure, unadulterated masterstroke that countless others have tried to emulate, either through appreciation or borderline theft. The whole point of this game is seamlessly connected to the core idea of exploring a dream world. Think about it. When's the last time your dreams were coherent? Speaking from experience, dreams tend to have very little continuity and sticking points. Things tend to just hop from idea to idea, from place to place, with not a lot of logic behind it or when it happens. Yume Nikki adapts this idea by having you explore how you see fit with no reason to stop, for the most part. You might not be in control of the dreams themselves, but you are in total control over where you go. Each of these doors leads to a vaguely themed location behind them. Take this metal-plated door, for example. 
entering inside leads to a psychedelic, mechanical world. What are you to do? That's up to you. This game caters to the wanderers, those who can craft their own intrapersonal narratives and journeys. Each small map loops around the borders of the screen, which might be confusing at first, but strongly encourages searching high and low through parallaxing. What are you searching for? Again, this game caters to people who choose to venture into the unknown. From a moment of searching, you can find an uncanny NPC that either has no effect at all when you interact with it, or they make a funny sound when you do. You can find different locations through each door, which sometimes leads to other door locations or sub-locations. Many of these are static and lead to predictable areas, but some are entirely randomized and can lead to different locations each time. Searching can also net you something called effects, which change how your player's sprite looks. These can either be cosmetic changes or can lead to solving puzzles and interactions you otherwise wouldn't be able to. Take this snow woman for example, who was able to put out this fire in the spaceship Shekin I found. Or the bike found in the eyeball world, which allows you to travel slightly faster than your walking speed. Both elements contribute greatly to having each playthrough feel unique and special. No two playthroughs of Yume Nikki are ever the same. There are still things that were previously unknown being discovered today because of the lack of direction given anywhere in the game. There are no hints or no suggestions. You must find these with nigh-blind exploration and experimentation. If this all seems overwhelming, don't fret. By pressing 9 on your keyboard, you can wake up and re-enter the real world and record your progress whenever you'd like. The core gameplay loop of dreaming, exploring the dream worlds, leaving and recording progress is the beating heart of Yume Nikki, made so much stronger if you go completely blind. Which effects you pick up and which worlds you explore and how you find they're all connected is a tremendous effort in the realm of personalization, which this game thrives in. My playthroughs probably had little to no resemblance to your playthroughs, which had no resemblance to the classic playthroughs of people on 2chan almost 20 years ago. For two decades, people have been mystified by the soft-spoken somberness of the doors and the worlds you can travel to, which led to the birth of dozens of communities dedicated to discussing it and sharing knowledge, kind of like neat explorers comparing notes on the undiscovered islands in the Americas of old. The Yume Nikki Wiki is an excellent resource for all things related to the game, but I highly recommend you don't peep at this wiki at all until you've felt like you're satisfied with your exploration. There is an objective to the game, technically. If you collect all the available effects in the game, there is an ending, but I'll hold off on explaining that for now. Both for dramatic effect and because it's entirely a bonus to the game. The core of the game does not require an ending, so it should be treated as extracurricular. If you were to constantly check the wiki for specific effect locations or to see where to go to get the ending, you aren't really playing the game correctly, or at least not in the intended fun way. The entire point of the game is that you deal with so many low-stakes RNG encounters that it's supposed to feel like a personalized journey through someone's dreams meant to bring on your own interpretations of the events and locales. And having access to all the information known about it spoils the surprise completely. You aren't supposed to know where to go without having made the connections yourself. Whenever you feel like you've had your fun with the game and feel satisfied, or bored, then the wiki is okay. What do you think this is anyways, trails? If you absolutely must have some kind of guide or hints, have a friend point things out to you when prompted, while not commenting on what he knows too early. A good friend of mine who's a big fan of this game, go follow him by the way, pointed out to me where to find the bike. Speaking of RNG, let me talk about events. Events are specific things or surprises, events, of course that's what they're called, that happen without any warning. They're typically attributed to a single location and act on specific numerical values being achieved in the game's code, the most famous of these being Uboa. To find him, you must go to Ponico's house, which exists in the Pink Sea, which can be found from the Snow World. Flickering the light switch has a 1 in 64 chance of replacing her with this ghostly visage. The only way to find out if it worked is to test it for yourself. The Little Ghost Boy exploded the popularity of this game, particularly to English-speaking audiences. If there was something this strange hidden inside the game with no clues pointing to it, what else could lie under the shallow water? This event's infamy skyrocketed people searching through this game feverishly, and became the game's defining moment when they saw someone like Peanut Butter Gamer talking about it years ago. 
Here we see another layer of RNG meant to be a footnote in your personalized journey throughout the game. It might seem somewhat pedestrian now, but the game is positively full of these events, both big and small. All these elements combine to make for a game that cannot be understood and explained through one playthrough. If you know where all the effects are, the game isn't very long to complete, but the journey to get there is never the same thing over and over. Even playing the game in the worst way possible is still thwarted by clever game mechanics and honing into the atmosphere of the unknown. I feel there's no better method to showcase how someone would consume this game than what I've prepared for you. I've had a couple days worth of recordings split up when I played the game for the first time. Allow me to present the youth in an abridged format. I spent some time reading the game's basic mechanics before I went to sleep. I didn't know which door to tackle first, so I went clockwise and entered the number world first. I was taken aback by its haunting twos as my shoes squeaked against the floor. I was so distracted by the numbers on the floor that I went through a door and found myself surrounded by blackness and lampposts, then beds once I re-entered. All in the span of a moment, I found some spilled blood on the floor, which teleported me into a purple nightmare dimension, where I was caught by and, uh, then stuck inside of what looked like a maze from the Jack Bros game on the Virtual Boy. When I woke up, I found that my neck was cricked to the side and I couldn't write my journal. While I journeyed and watched what I assumed to be Inca god drawings dance in the background, I woke up and found a mini perk that let me move around to my desk chair. I also found this thing not long later. Hi Vriska. I found the Virtual Boy maze again, which took me to some docks by the ocean, which led me to this guy, which gave me an effect that made me fat. I went to the purple door and had a really fun time stepping on all these goofy little tiles. I explored a mostly abandoned mall and found a little room that let me change the color of the menu and gave me the completely useless flute effect. I was really unnerved by exploring this forest area. The forest led me to the white desert where I met some monsters. I found some guy's corpse which gave me the effect of turning to a traffic light. I went to a retro video game area and kept stabbing a bunch of mushrooms with the knife effect which lets you kill most NPCs. By this point, I had entered all the doors and began to re-explore them with the new bike effect. A friend led me to a specific area where I found... Yes, 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 yes! I then got lost and woke up. I also found the effect that allowed you to teleport to the Nexus, but I lost the footage for it because OBS treats me like a dirty hoe. Oh look, there's missing now. This day got weird. It's here when I was told which world to go through to find good old Oboa. I found the path quickly and spent over 30 minutes straight flickering this light switch to get him up here. I was usually pretty lucky with the RNG in this game, and most games in general, but for some reason this picky prick wouldn't appear until I switched on my third strike remixes to pass the time. Once I got stuck, I honestly just decided to drink in the atmosphere. I'm apprehensive to look things up, but I found a lot of the things I knew about already, so I spent some time on my bike and just let my thoughts carry me. I also found a porta potty. I decided to end off this day by exploring the number world once more, the first world I ever explored. I found one of these little zipper areas that wasn't like the other. I started testing with my effects, and I think I'll let the clips speak for themselves.
It's here where I began to question how long I should be playing this game for. If there were other events like this, I'm not sure I wanted to see all that back to back. I took some time off from the game and decided that, at least for now, I was finished playing. The snippets of events I've yet to see didn't hook me at the time, so I began to talk about the game with my friend, who went and told me the endings anyways. <sighs> I went and looked it up. You must find all of the effects in the game and deposit them all in the Nexus room and, well... I had to put the game down for a bit here. Yume Neki sometimes makes you feel things. A lot of things. Being alone is when our true selves are revealed. We don't have to project or hide how we truly feel about something. When your mind tends to wander, what does it wander towards? For many people, they share our central character's feelings of isolation and anxiety. Madotsuki is quite lonely, as you can see. Despite her age, she has no friends or family to speak of. She lives alone in her apartment, and not even the figments of her imagination would dare to comfort her if they're not outright hostile to her. You can interact with people, but these aren't meaningful conversations or events. A goofy sound can't make up for the starving human mind's need to connect with other people. Humans are inherently social creatures, so what happens when you're deprived of those connections, even by choice? You get the nightmare realms she walks through. For the creation of this video, I've talked to everyone I knew who played this game in the past, and quite a bit of them reported feeling so alone and so anxious that it made them hesitant to play faster, which is no surprise. Following in the footsteps of a little girl, the picture of vulnerability is only strength in how vulnerable it made them feel playing it, especially at nighttime. It doesn't take an expert to tell you that a helpless child exploring the ambiguous and threatening world of her lonesome imagination as a metaphor for being confused about life and growing up would resonate with people very strongly, particularly those who would relate to her personal struggles. This is the camp I like to dub creeped players, people who feel uneasy, uncomfortable, and generally on edge about playing the game. It can come in different flavors, the atmosphere, layout, music, or NPCs make people feel a little threatened which is partly the point of playing the game. You play as someone whose only connection to reality is writing in a dream journal, which of course you'd make to feel that way. Interpreting dreams is something you might need to get used to from now on if you choose to engage with this game on the level I recommend you do. It's the kind of game that naturally encourages fan theories on the greater narrative play at what the object and creature inside Madotsky's head mean. These can range from something more pedestrian, like theorizing why she's alone and locks herself inside her room and refuses to leave, to some of the more troubling imagery present. It's important to note that basically none of these are considered the actual explanations for anything. People can peddle coma theories and allegations of assault all they want, but Kikiyama has not graced them with any of them with a response. Nor does it really matter. This isn't the type of game that requires a hard explanation that perfectly references something for the sake of a satisfying narrative conclusion because it's meant to be confusing. What kind of dream is perfectly explainable and has obvious clues to something you're facing when you're awake? Besides, you'd either become a Reddit armchair psychologist trying to piece everything together, or you're a creepy artist with no boundaries. That's what I hear, at least. However, not everyone I spoke to felt creeped out and alone. Some people actually felt the opposite, they felt at ease and even a little comforted playing Yume Nikki. But how is this possible? How can there be such a great divide between people who feel unnerved and those who feel comforted? Let me explain using a bit of a weird metaphor. Radiohead is an English band formed in the late 80s, but they wouldn't rise to fame until the early 90s with their blow-up song Creep debuted in their first studio album, Pablo Honey. The band continued its abrasive of an indie sound with their second album, The Benz. Radiohead stood out from the crowd by tuning their guitars in a way to intentionally make them sound imperfect and kind of awkward when combined with the soothing melodies. This imperfect sound, combined with the growing discographies of songs about people losing connections between each other and following troubled main characters, gives the band a relatable edge that few replicated. A dramatic change in sound came with the 90s OK Computer, which embraced the growing technological progress of the world with an album that told stories of people becoming alienated alone through a sci-fi lens, combined with a much more electronic sound. 
If it wasn't blatant enough, all of these elements combined for a band that made people feel divided. Either people rocked out to its shredding guitar strings and gentle floaty voice of lead vocalist Tom York, or buried themselves in a hole because of the subject matter and sometimes conflicting instrumental effects. Why did I give you such paragraphs about Radiohead? It's because there's no better example to explain this device of melancholy. Think about it critically. How does this song, No Surprises, make you feel? For many, it's a haunting song that makes them want to curl up in the fetal position, but for me, its somberness covers me like a warm blanket. I love OK Computer because of its melancholic meant to make you feel lonely, but I'm pretty acquainted to the feeling, and knowing that I'm over the hump in that life makes me appreciate how far I've come, so I enjoy the whole album as something I can gently headbang to because I know where it's coming from. That's how I feel about OK Computer at least. Kid A makes me want to run away and bury myself alive. Point is, the kind of melancholy and isolation you my Nikki experiments and thrives in is the same reaction people get to hearing Paranoid Android for the first time, which totally explains why some people react the way they do. In this case, the comforted players camp. Look, I've I've been in a lot of the same places Madotsky has, and without going into too much detail, it makes some of the environments, or at least the interpretations of the environments, something that kind of leaves a bittersweet taste in my mouth. But you don't have to go down the same dark path that she does. The dream worlds are effective vehicles for interpretations given their ambiguous nature, but don't let those guide you how to choose your walk through your own dreams in your own life. Let me be an example to prove that people who feel like she does, it does get better. But it sure doesn't get better by exposing yourself to it unprotected. If you will, let me ramble about something. In the mid-90s, a writer from, I believe, the Conan O'Brien show you might recognize today named Louis C.K. took time off his job and, feeling the wistful pull of exploring somewhere unfamiliar inspired by some childhood experiences, decided to take a trip to Russia. He spoke no Russian, couldn't understand the alphabet, and was worried about the state of the country after the wall had fallen, but he wasn't deterred. The airport in Moscow he described as an airport in the middle of a forest. He recalls his week-long vacation with anecdotes like a waiter in a restaurant intimidating him for a can of coke to sell for five American dollars, because rubles weren't worth anything, then immediately quitting his job because that five dollar bill was more than he could ever make in his own currency. When he tried watching TV, it was all dubbed by one man speaking over everyone, so it was entirely indecipherable. The streets he walked on were colossally wide because Stalin demanded that the buildings be dragged further apart for tanks to trot through the civilian streets, leaving the buildings to be held on unstable bricks and concrete foundations. The only way to walk is through the subways underground, which are full of beggars and gangs of stray children who huff glue for the past of the time. He punctuates his experience by explaining how he saw a man with a broken shoe confront a child and goaded him for the glue he assumed he had in his pocket to fix the shoe, which he assumed correctly. And that the misery of the country was so palpable and shocking that you could rightly assume a child would carry glue around because of how common it was for children to become addicted to it. It's a story that reminds me of how human we all are, and there's a reason why I've paraphrased it here. Imagine being Louis in that scenario, not being able to speak to anyone, not understanding what's going on, but feeling frightened and alone because of the foreign circumstances. Yume Nikki feels like being in an alien country or world and feeling threatened. Not threatened enough to feel like you're about to be killed, but just vaguely threatened enough to feel observed and a small part of a plan that involves you the same way a room of people is only changed by your presence because of your standard body heat. However, there was still a reason he went. He went because he bravely, perhaps foolishly, sought out adventure in a land far from his own. He knew it was only a temporary stay, so he felt a little comforted that there was an airport he could go to to leave the city with relatively safely. That's the beating heart of the story. There's a razor-thin edge between being frightened and being comforted by the exact same thing. I personally find this game to be the second part, comforting. There were parts I was very much unnerved, but something about the music's gentle strings and chords and having so much room to explore at my leisure made it feel a lot more adventurous than scary. Speaking of the music... The music of Yume Nikki is legendary or infamous, depending on who you talk to. It lacks the lyrics and chord progressions one would typically assume, and instead rejects that for a much simpler looping, ambient effect for each stave. They're deceptively simple and short, but round everything together to make a tremendously unforgettable experience. Let me show you how the average playthrough is affected by the sound in this game. It 
isn't just the music that ties everything together into a melancholic bow, the unique and almost cute sound effects act like a candle in the darkness. The squeak of your shoes and footsteps on different tiles tips me over the edge to feel relaxed, like the worlds I'm exploring have a friendly side only explores in the auditory realm. Plus, I've kind of had to talk about this game because of how frequently I use the music in my videos. If you check my channel, just about all of my uploads have at least one Yume Nikki track, or a track from a heavily inspired fan game. Now let's actually talk about those fan games. I've already explained how people really liked playing the game ever since it dropped in 2004, but how did that love translate into the infinite void of expression that is the internet? At least past forum discussions, that is. Besides the boatload of art based off of iconic scenes and locales, people became quite enamored with Kikiyama's ability to craft a game by himself with RPG Maker, so people followed suit. Since the game first blew up on 2chan, the inspiration for 4chan, it only makes sense people would go there to show their appreciation by crafting similar games in the different forks of RPG Maker. One of the earliest and perhaps most iconic fan games is Yume Tuki, the unofficial sequel released in 2007 on RPG Maker 2000. Despite the name, Kikiyama had no input, instead this game was authorized by dozens of different 2chan users who all contributed various elements such as music tracks, artwork, etc. Yume Tuki, much like the game it was inspired by, features no overarching plot, and has you explore dream worlds for your dream diary. It might be a bit dismissive to say that it's just Yume Nikki but larger maps, more effects, and just more to do and see, but that is the core of the game. Through more recent updates to have multiple endings, there is more of a distinguished identity for itself, but its inspiration is dead clear just from the title alone. Honestly, Yume Tuki could get a video all on itself, but for now, there are other games to cover. Breaking the mold from calling itself Yume, we have Dot Flow, another RPG Maker game released in 2009, created by developer Lowell, who released the game in a similar manner, semi-anonymously online through a buggy website. The only difference being Lowell has his own X account. Dot Flow follows Sabutsuki, who rather than cataloging her own dream world, explores the depths of her isolated mind inside of her computer. It's here where we see fan games starting to branch out from the core theme and concepts of the original game and start to carve out their own identity for themselves. There are a lot more fan games, like hundreds more in this wiki alone, and not all of them run with their own unique concept, which is not a bad thing. Some games are purely labors of love for the original game that want to emulate the same feelings for other players as it gave the developers, which is a heartwarming sentiment. Besides, most of these games are free anyway, so it's not like it's infringing on anything. For some, fan games are where they're satisfied, but some took to push the envelope and took what they wanted from Yume Nikki and made their own game. Eve is another freeware horror game released by a solo dev in 2012. You follow a girl named Ebe as she meets people inside of a strange haunted museum as she solves puzzles and figure out what's going on. Sounds nothing like Yume Nikki, right? Well, it's because it has its own identity, but carries over a few core ideas. You must play as a lonely little girl with a strange name, exploring creepy landscapes inside of an RPG maker environment. It might not seem all that connected, but this genre of game was something Yume Nikki essentially created just by existing. Kikiyama might not have known it, but when his game was released, it was a bold statement that one person could craft a video game and have it be adored by millions. There are many, many more games inspired by Yume Nikki in big and small ways either in more obvious ways of being similar RPG Maker romps, or from games that are clearly their own things like Undertale and dozens of other indie games. The atmospheres and creative endeavor this game's inspired is truly unlike anything I've ever seen. Even in small ways, this game's impact is still felt in waves to this day. All of that from a little freeware game, or a walking sim, as some people crudely put it. Sure, buddy. A lot of my friends are really into it really into it. Since everyone seemed to take something from this game and make something of it, what have I done to commemorate? I'm no artist, so I'm not making a game anytime soon, but I do have a bit of a pet project in the making. Once I've uploaded this video, I'll be keeping my own dream journal. I don't expect to have the same dreams or anything, but I'd like to emulate the kind of feelings this game gave me by walking in the footsteps of this lonely little girl. That's the kind of game this is. It's a game with so much potent energy that just by inspiration you can create something that matches on its level. And I don't think there are a lot of games like that, where someone can take one piece of this big jigsaw puzzle, expand on it, and have it almost overshadow the original game. 
Think about Undertale, it's one of the biggest indie games of all time, and it owes so much of its existence and inspiration from Yume Nikki. There are a lot of games inspired by it, and I plan on playing a whole host of them. Stay tuned for that, and for now, have a lovely rest of your day. Have you ever felt lonely? Not due to a lack of people, but having to exist around people that make you feel lonely? People that once enjoyed you have decided to turn their backs on you and renounce what you both stood for. That's probably what Bethesda feels all the time. It might seem like a hazy memory of an era long gone, but Fallout 3 used to be remembered fondly. Back when you were able to safely launch the game on Steam, that is. Fallout 3 came out in 2008 and was critically received. Bethesda, the company who now owned Fallout through acquisition, was riding hot off the heels of the smashing success of the Elder Scrolls series, particularly Oblivion. Fallout 3 at the time was no stranger to media stardom, which sounds strange to say considering the game's reputation online currently. Fallout fans prefer to slot 3 into its own weird category, distinct from New Vegas, Fallout 4, and just about every other game in the franchise. Despite everything, there is just something off about 3. Perhaps it's all in hindsight. I'm aware that people complained about 3 feeling somewhat empty by comparison to their cousin games, but that's kind of the point. The lack of towns and people is a pretty clear indicator of how things have been going along the east coast, mainly not good. And when there are people, they're trying to loot your corpse or just eat you. There isn't a better example to explain how Fallout 3 was able to carve out its own identity than with one of its own DLC expansions, Point Lookout. My goal with this video is to tackle a couple ideas, mainly explaining why this piece of DLC is so good, perhaps the best DLC the game has seen, and explaining why those talking points can be transferred to the main Fallout 3 experience. Think of it like this. The points raised in this story, exploration, the world, etc., and how that would translate to vanilla Fallout 3, or at least post-broken steel vanilla Fallout, Fallout 3. Meaning, when I praise or criticize something, you can point to it as a representation of its own point with the original game. Stay tuned to the end to hear all the juicy details I have about that, and perhaps stick around and subscribe. I upload every week, and I love talking about weird, underappreciated games. You know, just like Fallout 3, by the obscure indie studio Bethesda, of course. Seriously, some of the Fallout 3 hate is so forced, you guys are just not alpha and omega pilled. <laughs>As long as you've left the Vault 101 and you've had the DLC downloaded, or just have the Game of the Year edition, you can start it whenever you want. However, I don't recommend doing this. This is very much a late game area expecting a late game character. I started a new character, so I just juiced myself to level 20 and put my points into stuff that would help me uncover some secrets, mainly lockpicking and speech. Our marker is right at the southern edge of the map, which proves to be quite the track from exiting Vault 101. We do make it, after being taken down by Talon members all the time. We meet someone named Catherine, who pleads with us to find her daughter, Nadine, who went rogue and boarded the Duchess Gambit, the only ship making routine trips to and from Point Lookout in the Maryland area for the Punga Fruit trade. We must buy a ticket for around 400 caps from Tobar, someone who dresses like Nagito, to enter. He doesn't know much about Nadine, but he does recommend some areas up north to explore. Well, we have our setup. There's a misty coast to explore, and a missing daughter to find. There's also some intrigue about the mysterious punga fruit, said to have some interesting properties. You might notice how low-key the setup is, especially compared to the other DLC expansions in Fallout 3, compared to being abducted by aliens or entering Bridgeport. Going to the coast and trying to find someone is quite plain, one might even say boring if they're unaware. However, this small supporting story is the masterstroke of Point Lookout. It's a microcosm of how people often tend to explore a lot of open world games, by just ignoring the story and letting the whims of their mind take them wherever they please. This mindset is something that not all games support equally, depending on how the map spaces out interesting locations and areas, but Fallout has always catered to this mindset phenomenally. Without having touched a main questline, you can spend dozens of hours getting lost in the world, and here's how. Once you take your first steps off the boat, you're completely free to explore wherever you'd like. Unlike the other DLCs, you can freely leave Point Lookout so long as you can afford a ticket. 
every other non-broken steel expansion puts you in a new location you can't leave until you're finished with the main story campaign. But here, the map is your oyster, your misty, lonely oyster. People complain about the brown and green filter of the capital wasteland, how's about we trade it for a nice shade of blue? Maryland has quite the unique set of circumstances in the Fallout world. No bombs touch this part of the map, but the world forgot about it anyways, which leads to the current state it's in. The sea constantly laps the dull sandy coves, the only thing holding it up the rickety abandoned shops and games of the sea-drenched boardwalk. Had it not been for the devious waves that crash and roar just by, the sound of muted animals picking bones in your own footsteps would be the only soundtrack to accompany you. Being alone should sound all too familiar to any player of this game, but there's a distinct difference in how each location makes you feel, like it pulls from different parts of the spectrum. The capital wasteland is crumbled and grey, the marble from the Oval Office mixed into the ground just as much as concrete and blood. Haphazardous shops and raiders are all around from the millions of people trying to hold on to their peace of life and security. In Maryland, the effects of the Great War were much more trickled down. Pay close attention to the buildings. This isn't the ruin of a state taken from global war. This is willing abandonment from its inhabitants. It's much easier to see the remnants of what once was because it's preserved like a picture in time. As if the salt water in the air had a quasi-magical property of keeping the port the way it was when the world left it behind. Grass and trees and swamps have overtaken what was once a human settlement, providing a small glimmer of hope, a sign that nature has returned, and that the world's natural beauty has not been besmeached off the earth. The difference in view also aids in making you feel uneasy. Previously, you were getting quite used to walking on ruined roads and metro stations, but the gentle ocean breeze somehow makes me shiver on the inside. I hope you like the sound of the wind and bells. The maritime aesthetic and charm are thick enough to blast with a mini-nuke, and the wind rattles your bone and frosts the tip of your very soul. Something about the towering lighthouse slicing through the fog brings many memories to my weary mind. I spent many a summer in New Brunswick off the eastern coast. J just look at a map. Pennsylvania and New York are basically identical to eastern Canada. I defy you to tell me the difference with just your eyes. I stayed right along the Oceanside Beach in those summer days, so seeing all the rotting wooden homes by the coastline sinks a deep feeling of nostalgia in me. Combined with a forlorn sense of dread that something I remember so fondly has been twisted by the human afflictions of war. Further into the wilderness, away from the prying eyes, we can see some swamplands that make refuge for the living creatures inside, usually consisting of wild dogs and lumpy mutated hicks, sometimes a feral ghoul or two. Those who choose to call this land their home, and aren't irradiated in some ways, are far and few in between, so make sure you stick close to them when you can find them. There are some specific spots all over where people can be found, from the abandoned lots and mansions of the wealthier pre-war families to the confederate subs and hideouts hidden scattered around. There's a scant number of shops from the general store at the front and the shack located somewhere in the swamp area. And you can equip something for the radiation or upgrade your armor because those axe wielding hicks can slice through your defenses just like every single enemy can in Fallout 1. There's a little cliffside area called the Coastal Grotto where a ghoul runs a kind of hunting exhibit where you can gun down feral ghouls for sport. I highly recommend you go here because you can attain a perk from reading a book that allows you to deal plus 5 damage to ghouls on paper. What it actually does is deal plus 5 damage to everything because it's bugged. It's a straight damage bonus with no downsides to not have it. It makes the absurdly tanky and dangerous swamp folk a lot easier to deal with. Even when I talk to the people around here, they aren't exactly nice. People tend to be short with you on account of being a several hundred year old ghoul or a desperate survivor clinging to what little they have. Everyone who isn't here just for business has a history deeply entwined in the darkest of ways. Various eras of history have arrived and left at the door, which implies as the world continues to spin and people come, Point Lookout will resist and snuff them all out, leaving only ghosts of their culture. The least physically irradiated people are either traitors, or even worse, smugglers and occultists, so they're spiritually irradiated. Even worse are the tribal people, who practice a religion of peace that involves killing people unprovoked and being really interested in those punga fruits. Even worse are the swamp folks, the real natives of Point Lookout. 
From a diet of radiation, drugs, and incest, they have bubbled up all frothy and are extremely territorial to outsiders. The only ray of hope in this sea of misanthropy is a single Christian missionary, Marcella, who is spreading the word of the gospel while charting out maps and collecting pre-war religious artifacts. As noble as her efforts are, it's the exception that proves the standard. That Point Lookout is a godless, forgotten hole that best remains as a memory, even to its curtained inhabitants. Where there should be the Holy Spirit is replaced by occultism and spendthrifts. It's not just a lack of stable architecture around, the lack of stable people is just as isolating. It's the same kind of loneliness I was describing in the video's intro, being around people that make you feel lonely. I've never felt more of a lone wanderer than just playing Point Lookout. This is the central beating heart of the video I want to establish. Despite the people and land, you feel like you're isolated in your own little world, like a Madotsky in power armor. When you do get to talk to people, what kind of business are you getting up to? That would be the storyline and quests the game has to offer. I've set up searching for Nadine, but whereabouts do you go in finding her? Most people don't have much in the way of help, so you must forge your own path, or at least, take Tobar's advice on looking after the smoke in the air. Naturally, you'll find one of the many abandoned areas, you'll definitely see Calvert Mansion through the fog, and turns out this one is currently being occupied by a pre-war ghoul, Desmond Lockhart, who's in town for some kind of business he doesn't care to explain, or more that he can't explain because he's being attacked by droves of tribespeople for reasons he doesn't understand. He proposes that you venture out to the Arkendove Cathedral to learn why they've attacked him. These are people who think cutting a hole in their skull can expand their mind. They're not exactly scholars over there. But here's the deal. I help you get in with those tribals, you help me get what I want, and I'll make you fucking rich. Just try not to sprain a lobe while you're thinking about it. For the sake of bottle caps and potentially finding Nadine, we go. Beating this mission gives you the superior defender perk, which gives you a plus 5 damage and plus 10 armor when standing completely still. It's a nice perk for sniper rifles and that one railgun, but you probably have the power armor by this point, so not absurdly useful. We find the cathedral, but the dork at the intercom won't let us in until we've completed some kind of initiation ritual near a sacred bog. Okay, be that way. It's called the Ritual of the Mother Seed. Laugh if you want. Venture west to the Great Bog, and within you shall find the mother of all hunger fruit. She stands taller than a man, and collected seeds. And it's quite a way away, and I just realized that I never actually read the note left for Nadine. It might be rude to intrude, but all this walking has made me quite hungry. Hungry for knowledge, that is. Let's pull it up. My darling little Nade. I know life wasn't always the best at home, and we've had a few rough winters. I don't blame you for running off to find something better. At your age, you think you're wasting away at home while the world's just waiting for you to come and get it. When I was about your age, I ran off from my mom too. And even though there were some terrible things along the way, it ended with me having you. So I can't complain. I just wish you could have seen your grandmother. I wish I had the chance to see her again, myself. If you're reading this, I just want you to know you're always welcome back home. Please, learn from my mistake and don't stay away forever. Missing you. XO, XO, XO. Mom. Man, that really hit home. With a renewed sense of vigor, I bravely go inside the sacred bog. Inside, we find quite a bit of Myrlukes and eventually the big tree seeds we're looking for. But something kind of quirky happens. We start seeing stuff in the air like that part in Batman Arkham Asylum. Mocking bobbleheads from Schmalt Tech harass us as we see the corpses of people we care about the most. The remains of our mother, Amada, Elder Lions, Moira. We see little signs of what might really be going on. A bone saw, sewing something shut. Thankfully, we awake. We were able to hold on to what we need to be accepted into the tribe, so we head back to the cathedral, still with the Punga Fruit Drug trip on our mind. We also get the perk Punga Power, which allows us to decrease rads from eating the Punga Fruit, a pretty useful perk considering how many of these grow in the area. We're allowed in automatically in the cathedral, and we find out that the tribe's people are even worse than I thought. They're hippies, 
drug abuse and being squatters and all. I really want to wipe them off the face of the earth, but I found Nadine. Looks like another newbie in the tribe, and still able to string together whole sentences. Ain't you the lucky one? But I'm not a vegetable, so I'm sane enough. You sure you're feeling okay in there? You might want to check your head for a scar. You know, the last part of the ritual. After you pass out, they get a guy to br As in, he rips out a bit of your brain. It's supposed to be the part that holds you back. Anyway, you look like a lively one, so welcome- Turns out, the ritual we went on involved being knocked out from the fruit and having a piece of our brain taken out in a sort of trip-handing procedure and being left with a scar. Nadine kindly takes out the stitches and reveals that she went through the same process, which made her quite sour on the tribe. Look, it's not that I don't want to go home or anything. I mean, I love my ma, even if she does make me want to claw my eyes out sometimes. It's just, I came out here to find a fortune, to make my mark. If you see my mom again... Nadine is ready to leave the tribe and head on home, but we're still missing something. Why did they attack the mansion? Whoa, whoa, whoa! That was all Jackson's crazy idea. I knew better than to volunteer for that suicide mission. Last time I wandered too close to that mansion, some old ghoul sicked his dogs on me. Screw that. Nadine doesn't know, but knows that their leader, Jackson, gave the order, and that he's hiding out in a cave somewhere underneath the cathedral, which we're given a key for. Off at his magical thinking cave, I guess. We're not allowed to know where it is. He says we're not enlightened enough to understand. I swear that sort of stuff pisses me off so much. I thought joining would be all drugs and magic, but it's just the same crap as everywhere else. Guess that's... Sure, fine. Why not? I'm planning on ditching this place anyway. His cave's under the cathedral, but it's hard to find. When you find that old idiot... Nadine is safe and secured back in the Duchess Gambit, but I'm quite determined to see this story through. We're able to find a passage to the cave instead of an abandoned ship flanked by swamp lurks. The cave inside is full of mire lurks and human remains, but the most dangerous foe of all rests at the very top. Turns out the tribe is receiving orders from a holograph of a floating brain, and the order to attack the mansion was solely to kill Desmond, whom the brain has some kind of history with. Now then, perhaps you can be more useful than that simpering spiritualist and his tribe of idiots. What you are interacting with is merely a holographic projection, and a rather clumsy one at that. As for myself, much more elegant than shambling on is some rotting corpse. Jackson believes me to be some kind of god. You think that would be good, but his interpretations of my commands leave something to be desired. Regardless, there's a troublesome ghoul who lives in Calvert Mansion, bringing him destroyed and his jamming device neutralized immediately. More than you could possibly imagine with your squishy pink mind, but the only pressing matter. He has a jammer that limits my projection range to this pathetic cave. Remove that, and I can extend my re- Killing Desmond would be a nice plus, but I'm sure we can get around to that later. Of course I did, but that moron thought it was one of his adult visions. The real goal was to destroy the ghoul's cabin device. Desmond, that- Were it not for his interference, I would still have a body. Still, its absence is only hoped by brilliant silver. An appreciation- he wants us to take care of some kind of psychic jammer on the top of the ferris wheel by the dock so he can extend his influence. It was around this point I was too invested to be shocked that we found a floating telepathic brain that lets people worship him like a god. Jackson, leader of the tribe, naturally takes orders from a higher liberal power, so he gets the punishment all hippies need. Returning to Desmond, he spills the beans and lets us know what's finally going on. Him. I should have known. My old rival, so close to his family home. He was once a man, Professor Calvert. 
The Calverts owned half of Maryland, back when there was a Maryland to own. Members of the Calvert family were influential all over the world. They practically owned a deed to the U.S. government. In their best days, there were no less than three Calvert family senators, seven members of the House. They even had a top candidate for president, until that scandal with the dog forced them to drop out of the race. I was particularly proud of that one. Calvert is my old rival. Centuries we'd played this game. I knew he'd be stupid enough to hide so close to his family home. It's not a matter of hate. It's a matter of destiny. He is my enemy. I knew he was here, and it is my intent to find him and call down a righteous fucking hammer on his head. Figurative, I mean. So, those half-wits are getting messages from the... But without those buggers... So... We cut off his ability to talk to him, and he'll need to try harder. Maybe then I can find this squishy little worm. You know the professor. I have the perfect device to jam up that little worm's talk box. All you need to do is take it to the highest point around and install it. Easy. Right. Attach it. I'll watch from here and turn... Now! The brain in the jar is Professor Calvert a member of an extremely influential pre-war family that has been feuding with Desmond for over a hundred years at the least. It's the kind of rivalry we aren't given the full picture to how it all works, instead he cites Destiny and asks us to install a stronger jammer to completely cut out his psychic signals. Heading to the ferris wheel, we're actually given an option from a telepathic intervention from Calvert. Coming to gum up my work, are we? Well, I have a better idea. How about instead of playing his game, you destroy that nasty little device? Deposit it in the nearby trash compactor and we will never have to worry about it again. Either we side with him and dispose of the jammer instead of a garbage compactor, or side with Desmond and install it. The series of events plays out similarly, for now, we side with the ghoul and install the jammer, which leaves us to be flanked from all sides by tribespeople on the attack. We go to check back in on Desmond when... Luckily, there's a safe room we can explore. That, that bastard. He killed my pups. Nearly killed me. For what? He doesn't have the body to fucking do it himself, so he- I know where he is. He overplayed his hand this time. Well, that's good, since the game is almost done. He's in here, the little fuck, right under my nose the whole time. Hiding behind robots and machines. Now, that's my- we follow Desmond to Calvert's base underneath the lighthouse. It's a dangerous repurposed research lab full of stim packs and robots ready to slice us down with laser weapons. But we have to go deeper with keycards, if only to avenge Desmond's two fallen dogs. Once we find the professor, who actually is just a brain in a jar, we're given another opportunity to switch allegiances and kill Desmond if we want to. Listen, I came here to kill a brain, I'm not leaving till I kill a brain. Calvert has a lot of protectrons to attack for him, but if you even have a couple frag grenades, you can safely chuck them at the tank and the robots will be taken out by Desmond. At last, the world is rid of that sniveling, disgusting, arrogant brain. Think of it, everything he learned, everything he had, it's all here, and it's all mine. Moron. I've been battling with Calvert for over two... And now, 200 years of technology, knowledge, and... Re You're free to take what I... Enjoy your spoils. I don't think our paths will ever cross again. And I think we can both thank Christ and say hallelujah for that.
Now that we're rid of Calvert, I'll be heading north to pursue my next rival. There are only a few of us left now. The great game goes on. Sort of a... Uh, what's a word you'd understand? Microcosm? Yeah. It's a microcosm for the old world. So, as I understand it, Desmond, Calvert, and a few unnamed, more pre-war figures have been feuding for over 200 years, and we're being dragged into the middle of it. Desmond thanks us kindly, as he can give us the key to escape the easy way. You can kill him if you want, but he has no further business with you. But what if we sided with Calvert? Reloading a save, we dispose of the jammer and the compactor, and the prof tells us to return to the mansion for a surprise. The house blows up, and we head to the lighthouse. Desmond is there, furious we double-crossed him, but we're allowed to choose sides once more. You, you bastard, betray me, you fuck. You think you can betray? You have one chance. Exactly. We are going to go in there, and we are going to end this once and for fucking all. And you will help, or you will be my... And you... What? Fine, then. Then pretty please. Fucking help me rid the world of Professor Calvert. Though Desmond will no longer be invincible like normal, and will probably die from the various turrets inside. At long last, Desmond is dead, and you, my friend, I have you to find. Well, death. Don't think of it as betrayal. No, no, no. I. I... Calvert is giddy his rival is dead, and thanks us by double-crossing us, which results in the exact same fight. This decision isn't so much a philosophical one, more than a cynical, convenient one you're allowed to flip-flop on, because you're just along for the ride, you might as well be loosey-goosey with your choices. And that concludes the main questline for Point Lookout. To some it might seem somewhat inconsequential and kind of strung along, but there was a very deliberate design mentality when crafting it. You're allowed to leave at any point, unlike DLC like The Pit or Mothership Zeta, so feeling like a passenger in a conflict bigger than you and the main quest is only the beginning of feeling like leftovers. Returning to the ship, we find Nadine. Yeah, looks like it. When the tribals would send someone to the swamp, he'd be waiting around to nab them when the Pungaseeds gassed him. He'd do his amateur surgery for the tribals, and let us wander back, all in exchange for punga fruit to trade. <laughs> Sweet little deal he had going on. Anyway, I figured you'd want a shot at some revenge, so I- It was Tobar who sewed open our head, eh? Let's pay him a visit. I looted him of his Nagito jacket. We can also find the specific part of the brain matter because he keeps vials of it as trophies. Gross. We're not quite done with this island, so let's explore some more. That was only the main quest line. There's quite a bit more to do, and I can't explain that any of that better than this one side quest. When you're exploring, make sure to walk to the far west, and you'll see a series of tents with a missionary I mentioned before, Marcella. She talks about scripture and her duties, but she mentions how the swamp folk have their own sort of primitive religion, something much more sinister than the drug addictions of the tribes folk. With this in mind, we search through the fog once more and find that another nigh-abandoned mansion, this time belonging to the Blackhall family, whose current patriarch still resides inside, Obadiah. Civil discourse. The great I'm glad you think so. Swamp folk who, I should mention, absconded with a book, a precious family heirloom. I wanted to ask you, friend, will you get it back? Cash, plain and simple. Good. The fools who stole it believe it has powers. There's a ritual site east of the boardwalk, in the basement of a ruined house. I think you'll find it there. He gives us a quest to retrieve a family heirloom from the Swamp Folk, who have stolen a book they believe to have some kind of cultic, mystical powers, which Obadiah scoffs at. 
Simple enough, a thousand bottle caps and a fetch quest, easy as pie. However, once we leave, we run into Marcella again. Has Obadiah sent you in search of a book? I thought as much. Listen to me very carefully. That book is known as the Krivbetne, and it's a thing of... Yes, the Krivbetne. The Blackhall family has a long, evil history with the book. It was lost to them long ago, but it's found a way back to Point Lookout, and Obadiah seeks to reclaim it. Obadiah's no better than the heathens he's asked you to steal it from. He believes he can use it to control them, and God knows what else. There's a way to destroy that damned thing. I can't promise you money. I ask no more. You can find me at my t That's a lot to take in. She accuses Obadiah of being to some kind of occultism just like the Swamp Folk, and that his book, the Krivbekna, is an ancient tome of unspeakable power and evil, and that we should retrieve it and give it to her instead of Obadiah. With that in mind, we search far into the swamps to find it. We do find the ritual site after blasting Hicks left and right and enter the storm drain, find a bloody sacrifice right by the book, which proves Marcella's claims of occultism true. After a bloody confrontation with more Hicks, we stumble across a gruesome scene. They attacked while I slept. I... I don't expect to survive. I only pray that... <coughs> that you haven't taken that book to Obadiah. You must take up my mission. There is one way to utterly destroy the Krivbekne. But you must take a pilgrimage far north of Point Lookout in the capital wasteland. Seek a place called Dunwich. Within is an obelisk itself, a, a wicked thing. It'll consume the book. You need only press the book to its surface. May God shed his blessings upon you, child. Make haste for Dunwich. My God, I am sorry for all my sins with all my heart in choosing to do wrong and failing to do good. I have sinned against you, whom I sh sh Capital Wasteland, Dunwich Building? Those sound familiar, don't they? Please keep that in mind until the end of the video because they will come up again. Since we've been tasked with ultimate responsibility for the book, what should we do? Give the book to Obadiah, of course. We confront him for being an occultist heathen, but he has no interest to hear it. We can leave, or we can follow him down to his basement. He's muttering something at this altar, talking about someone, or something, named Ugg Qualtoth. We can't read the book he so wanted, but if the Swamp Folk have the same belief system, we can assume this dark god is the same one they sacrifice to. I have much more to say about this mysterious character later in the video. Before there was man, before there was time, there were monsters, and Obadiah seeks to emulate his monstrous masters by killing in his name. This time, we can at least give Obadiah a stern talking to. Our business is at an end. Oh hey, we can get the book back. Looks like we've honored Marcella's wishes and got richer in the process. Stay chasing paper, lads. This isn't the end of the quest, mind you. There's one more place we need to go, but hold on to that for now. This is just one example of a side quest in Point Lookout. There's quite a bit of stuff to do that I haven't scratched the surface on, but I want to leave some mystique uncovered so you can find it for yourself. 
I haven't even mentioned what was going on to the Ozymandias ship, or the social disease that was spreading just before the Great War. But I need to move on to the next topic, or else I won't be able to finish in time. If you want a comprehensive series on this DLC, or just game in general, go watch Oxhorn, he does a much better job. Fallout likes to experiment with different themes for each location and game, and this DLC is no different. I've made an entire segment on the theme of loneliness and isolation, so I won't mention it in this segment again, but I have a couple more I'd like to discuss. Specifically, I want to talk about abandonment, especially in the historical context of Fallout. What I mean by that is how several different eras and cultures have all come into Point Lookout and left the remains here. Think about it. All the Confederate ships and hats all left around here during the Civil War. Many of the nicer homes still standing are distinctly Victorian in architecture. Even the darker, mostly unknown occult aspects seem mostly forgotten by all, except the mutated locals. Pieces of their history and belongings have been bolted together haphazardly like a multinational scrapyard. It's not an uncommon sight to find chipped bits of fine china next to piles of double-barreled shotguns together. Not to mention all the marble statues and ritual items that are god knows how old. The Calverds owned much of Maryland, so their influences, mainly being the occultism and some dashes of mad science, are present in the monstrous biology of its inhabitants and fauna. There's an interesting harmony between man and nature here. All the grass and slightly less irradiated water might seem tranquil, or at least less harmful, and the people here do take some care for their own environment. There's an uneasy sort of ecosystem here. People tend to stick to their own communities and don't like outsiders, but people can trade here for business. It's something we don't really see in the capital wasteland. People aren't really trying to rebuild there, they're becoming tribal and crafting communities that only acknowledges the other for trading. I wouldn't say people are devolving in the common sense, but shifting towards an older mindset with the world around them. Versus Point Lookout where there is uneasy tension between people, but some common ground that allows them to coexist and a strange sense of peace that's unmatched anywhere else. I'd also like to pay some service to the themes of destiny that cast quite the shadow. Fallout 3 deals a lot with the machinations of destiny, typically in the poetically biblical sense for sacrifice and the spiritual symbology of certain acts on a community and nation. There's a reason why there's a karma system, after all. This destiny manifesto in Point Lookout becomes multifaceted. The most obvious example is with Desmond and Calvert. They aren't the only people inside of this complicated relationship of rivalry dating from the pre-war era. Desmond mentions Lyndon B. Johnson, so it dates to early modern American history in Fallout terms. Both men have extended their lives through science, Calvert through suspending his brain in a jar, and Desmond through becoming a ghoul, likely just to add fire to the fuel of trying to kill each other. Both men are more than okay with manipulating anyone in their path to achieve this. The player, tribes people, entire nations and facilities constructed solely to destroy them and each other. Neither man is willing to discuss anything on a rational term, instead choosing to suspend their accountability to destiny as they do their evil deeds, not caring for who was harmed in the fire. This destiny goes even deeper than just two men. The Black Halls were a famous pre-war family like the Calverds, instead choosing to devote themselves to occultism instead of science. We see the effects of their dark worship. People have become fiendishly devoted to whatever empty promises their cursed tome whispers, making followers kill and steal for a chance, even from each other. This is opposed by the missionary Marcella, who represents Christianity, though the denomination is interpretable. She's very much aware of what the Black Holes are aware of, and tries her best to prevent it while still keeping true to the scripture. The opposition with these is several fold. The occultists are killers, thieves, savage, and instinctual, superstitious beyond a doubt, and vigorously motivated and determined. The Christians, in this sense, are largely pacifist, careful, slow to anger, but not quick enough on the draw. The camp Marcella was at wasn't a far walk from the Black Hall mansion, but Marcella wasn't willing to attack Obadiah and take the book because she believed in her moral values, which might have gotten her killed in the end because it's implied Obadiah sent out the mercenaries you find to kill her. She spends her last words praying forgiveness from God. The occultism versus religion, I'll call it, is a little bit more ambiguous and murkier than the clear-cut rivalry between the pre-war storyline. But we see some recurring patterns. 
two sides, both with faults and favors, hating each other and wanting similar outcomes. Your choices have pretty major outcomes on the nation. What will the tribals do without Calvert giving orders? If you take the curse Karekna and destroy it, what will it do to the Hicks who worship it? Speaking of that, we should probably head back to the capital wasteland by now. We still have that book, and the people here won't get any better with me just holding on to it. And I think it's time to leave. There are more quests to do, but the state isn't going anywhere. And with Nadine at the helm, all of our trips are now free. Once we land, we can find Catherine has happily boarded the ship and reconnected with her daughter, who was fairly content with her journey because she got a free boat out of it. Catherine gives us some powerful punga fruit and a couple caps, and the two now lead a presumably much happier life now that they have such a powerful trading operation at their disposal. It's a story that warms the heart and makes you feel at ease. The capital wasteland has never looked better, it pops right out at you when you see a landscape not covered in mist all the time. But there's still one more thing that needs to be addressed. We still have the Quebecna, and some unfinished business at the Dunwich building, which is all the way to the far west of the map. Alright, let's get this over with. <laughs> A dangerous journey to the west filled with raiders and yaogwai leads us to an abandoned Dunwich building, a location with a rich and storied history that extends through several different games in the franchise. But Dunwich is complex enough to deserve its whole entire video, so for now, I will just focus on what's relevant for Fallout 3. When you enter the building, something is immediately off. Your compass changes directions entirely. Something is wrong. Deeply wrong. There's a whole stack of notes recorded by someone named Jamie, with some more as you progress further in the building. While I'll exterminate the huge number of ghouls in this building, I'll play the notes in order. Why the hell would he come all the way out here? Dad's been a little nuts for some time now, but not like this. Leaving me in that crappy old hospital without waking me. Without a goddamn flashlight. I made enough selling the meds we scrounged to have kept us both fed at the colony for weeks. Now I'm almost out of rations, my shoes are pretty much destroyed, and I'm still chasing the old coot. By my last reckoning, he was headed south. Maybe I shouldn't have waited so damn long to start tracking him. The trail's gone cold. I'm gonna wander with these guys a while. They say they wander the area. Maybe somebody's seen Dad. These guys aren't who I thought they were. Jesus, they killed that family for a sack of rotten vegetables. Getting out of here next chance I can without catching a bullet. Did a caravan today. Trev didn't see the kid and got popped. I took care of Tawny right then and put one in Thor before he saw her fall. That earned me some grub from the traders. Even better, they saw Dad. He was in pretty rough shape and still has the goddamn book. The trader says it gave him the creeps. Me too. But it's good to know he's still alive, still headed south. He must have been trying to trap food here. I recognize his snares. I can make out a building on the horizon. That must be where he headed. If not, at least I get a roof tonight. I don't like the look of this place. I don't like the smell. It gives me the creeps. I don't want to risk a shot at the crows till I know what's in there. Sneaking in tonight. The raiders told spook stories about zombies in the ruins. Never saw anything like that where I come from. Lord help me. They're real. Not quite what Thor said, but close. These things look... I think they really used to be people. God help me. I found Dad today. I didn't think it was him, but... Face. The zombies didn't touch him. I think he was becoming like them. Didn't know it was him until I found that old book near him. No more killing. I just need to go. Can't forget the book. All I have left of him. It's warm against the stone. I'll... I'll just rest a while. Sharp knife. Sharp knife to send him to Deep Temple. Flay and say my words. Abdul comes again on the feast of the weaker. Feast uh, for the Deep Temple. Born again. Here. al Hazarad. Yes. Yes. So, Jamie turned himself into a ghoul. Shockingly quickly. Something about the rapid transformation of him, and potentially the other ghouls and glowing ones inside, might hint at something more complicated than radiation at play. We descend deep, deep into the building's interior, 
platforming across crumbled floors until we reached out the heart of darkness. Swarms of ghouls attack us. Included amongst them is Jamie himself. We gain good karma for putting him out of his miserable life as a feral ghoul. Further beyond, the metal and concrete are peeled away to reveal bare rock and horrible sounds as we approach our target. The obelisk that exhumes horrific power. Even standing just by it makes the skin crawl. This obelisk served no purpose in the base Fallout 3. It simply was. But now that we have the Krivbekna, the obelisk can really be rendered into the past tense and become a was. The book will burst into flames and the obelisk will become inert. There might be a bug with the game, but destroying this book leads to 500 good karma points. To put some perspective, blowing up Megaton gives you 1000 negative karma points. Destroying an entire settlement full of innocent men, women, and children for no greater reason than to support a ruthless business tycoon who views people as cattle or for your own morbid hedonistic sense of sadism. But destroying this book, this deed is deemed so holy and so virtuous that it could cover half of the sins blowing up Megaton. That leads to a serious question, what was inside the book? We're unable to read it, but those who have and can have become twisted and so ostensibly evil. This isn't even the biggest question relating to it. I have to ask, who is Ugg Qualtoth? And if this book is related to him, perhaps in some kind of Bible analogy, what is written inside that causes the karma scale to tip the way it does? These questions have more to chew on in future games, and we don't get an answer in Fallout 3. Remember when I talked about feeling like a pawn in someone else's game? We're totally clueless about what's going on under the real inky blackness of the cosmos, but we're granted the opportunity to aid it or help destroy it. And this, this is why Point Lookout is Fallout 3's best DLC. Let me run through every chapter once more to summarize my point. Firstly, the exploration. Point Lookout is a sickly sweet style of loneliness that feels distinct from every other type of isolation in the game. Exploration feels satisfying because of the relatively small size of the island and how easy it is to see things on the horizon. The storyline is understated and simple but allows for a lot of freedom of choice. The outcomes are very similar but allowing you to choose who to ally yourself with makes it feel incredibly immersive in the dog eat dog world Fallout can often be. The thematic consistency is razor sharp and always on point. Being a pawn between two afflicting ideologies and understanding its representatives is the name of the game, and both sides are given ample opportunity to seem semi-reasonable to you. And finally, this DLC connects to the main game in a way far greater than most other DLCs, Broken Steel being an exception, because that's just the post-game expansion pack. Most other packs allow you to obtain very powerful items and maybe a perk, but Point Lookout seriously recontextualizes the Dunwich building and allows you to re-examine the entire dungeon, which no other DLC has done. However, it's not all positives. I've mentioned bugs a couple times, and there are some bugs associated with this pack. Not nearly as many as Mothership Zeta, but it's definitely got an aura of being unfinished. I highly recommend you check out the scrapped and cut content on the wiki, it's truly fascinating. I also recommend you check out Oxhorn and Epic Nate's channels if you haven't already. They go into serious depth on these topics far more than I have, and that extends to the franchise itself. I want you to keep your eyes on two topics afterwards, the Dunwich Building and Ugg Qualtoth, because those two deserve their own videos. And if you liked this video, feel free to stick around by subscribing and staying tuned. I've got more videos for strange gaming and otherwise cooking right now, so stick around. Until then, have a lovely rest of your day. Hey, I'm Peter. Look, Herobrine needs no introduction. You've seen images of him, you've heard stories of him, he's internet royalty at this point. The silent observer of Minecraft, watching you in single player for unknown purposes. His origins are murky, with some claiming him to be the digital ghost of Notch, creator of Minecraft's past brother, to being some kind of entity simply called him. There wasn't a whole lot of quote, established lore, unquote, to the character's past appearances, so 
people really ran with it and made them their own. People have definitely taken their own unique spins on the character since his inception, which was sometime around the 2010s. This is most commonly attributed to this piece relating to Herobrine, which many call his origin point. Everyone knows that Notch publicly addressed Herobrine several times, speaking on the rumor of his dead brother and adding him to patch notes to mess with people. But what if I told you that everything we know about him isn't what it seems? I want you to hold back your initial confusion and hear me out. Think about it. Where did this all come from? Who was the first one to suggest such a cryptid thing existing in Minecraft? I suggest you leave some of your knowledge at Herobrine at the door, because I'm going to rock your world with what I'm about to tell you. Just take this sandstone pill. What is the sandstone pill? Well, you get to listen to me explain Minecraft urban legends and rumors and creepypasta content. But you must subscribe and watch my uploads. Look, I'll, I'll sweeten the deal. The sandstone pill has unlimited wonder bars, and you can meet Tyler the Creator. He, he's a fan of the channel, I promise. What is the opposite of the sandstone pill? Keep living in ignorance but the cobblestone pill. You'll be thrown into the eternal pit of fire and join the 99 percenters who don't click that button. I'll know what every person chooses, by the way. Are your doors unlocked? In Minecraft, of course. I should establish an abridged timeline of events to make sure this all makes sense. It's very weird to think about, but most of these iconic gaming creepypastas were developed like 15 years ago. Minecraft was publicly available to play in 2009, but it wasn't officially released, as most publications explain, until 2011. You could play the game in its alpha stages, but for simplicity, consider everything until its 2011 publication as a sort of early access phase. During this phase, Mojang, back when Mojang owned Minecraft and it wasn't run by a totalitarian nanny state no fun zone that Microsoft so desperately wants to train AI off of, made pretty frequent patches to iron out bugs and add new content for the game. One of these updates added the jukebox, which allowed you to play music tracks by inserting records. You must find most records inside different locations and biomes and to obtain your sweet record of rock and tunes. You're able to find the track called Track 13 in some of the dungeon chests. On July 30th, 2010, user Kerchak would upload a video on YouTube called Minecraft Music 13.ogg. The video is the OGG upload of Track 13 accompanied of a screenshot of a cave or dungeon. This might seem like an innocuous screenshot, but if we manipulate the lightness, we can find... let me highlight it. See those two little white slits for eyes? This might seem like something of a stretch, perhaps I've just seen something that isn't there. Well, I wasn't the only one who thought so. Plenty of people ran with the concept of those two little white eyes. What were they doing there if they truly were eyes? Were they from a mob just spawning in, or were you being watched by someone else? Let me introduce the Minecraft forums. Minecraft forums are exactly what they sound like, acting as a hub for people to discuss Minecraft and all its quirks. It's still in operation since 2009, so it's been around as long as the game has. Many of the older posts are stellar ways to see how people reacted to certain things right when they happened. For example, in 2010, Valve, through the TF2 website, talked about Minecraft when they introduced the old Equalizer weapon, which was a pickaxe. People on the forums complained about all the TF2 people now flooding it. You can tell these are authentic 2010 posts because half of them have Homestuck profile pictures. But for white eyes, allow me to draw you into the post created on August 1st of the same year. User Endorphine would repost a 13.ogg video along with a short story. Jesus Christ, I can't do it. I can't take it anymore. I can't go back home. I can't go into my mines. I can't do anything anymore but slowly try and build something out of the frozen ocean. And it's all because of two little pixels. Two pixels. Two white pixels. I haven't even seen them myself except in screenshots. I know what's there though, waiting in the mines, watching me from my tower's balcony while I'm outside. I can't see it through the constant snowfall, but I know it's there and I know it can see me. The white eyes mist surrounding ambient noises. It started a couple weeks ago, after a secret Friday update. Some people started reposting seeing a big pair of white pixels whenever an underground ambient noise was triggered. I figured it was just a bug or something, 
Maybe some way he did trigger it that sound themselves? I didn't hear much of it about for a while. Then all of a sudden recently, I've been seeing reported sightings everywhere, and a supposed screenshot for them. This is the picture. I can't even bear to let it load. I had to do a quick tab, copy, and close before I saw those eyes again. Those eyes! Jesus Christ! The user goes into more detail and further posts. He points out where the dots are and refuting someone talking about a rendering error I'll mention later. His descriptions of white eyes are curious, that white eyes has now been properly punctuated with capital letters as an official name, and that it's a female entity. The rest of the thread isn't too interesting, mostly people being unreasonably mad someone chooses to have an imagination, except for this one post where someone calls white eyes the Tails doll of Minecraft, referencing that god-awful Sonic R creepypasta. But with that comparison, we now know where people's minds were at the time. They weren't entirely convinced there was something to be found legitimately, but ran with the concept anyways. But what do we now know about white eyes from this post? We see what it looks like, or at least its eyes, that it might be female, and that it has some kind of relation to a rendering error. That rendering error is an old bug where blocks obtain this sort of white outline around chunks of blocks. Does that mean the first known sightings of white eyes was just a rendering error? Or did the uploader decide to just put two white dots there as a troll? No idea. There's quite a bit of missing information about this Minecraft cryptid. The forum posts are the best source we have, and there isn't a lot of them. Because white eyes would take a pretty drastic change in direction very soon. Stay tuned to hear about that. It was still very early on for White Eyes, so a lot of details were shifting when people started to contribute their own ideas and works of fiction around it, especially for what it looked like, aside from its eyes. The 2nd of August, someone named 8-Bit described White Eyes as a cross between a skeleton and a spider. He says it likes to hide in deep side caves and other dark places and won't interact with the player if it doesn't have to, choosing to run away if attacked or brought into the light. But if you get too close to it, It'll shriek at you and attack for three hearts of damage. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? If the Endermen weren't such an obvious parallel to the Slenderman, I'd reckon that White Eyes could be a contender for the runner-up inspiration. Taking a look at a longer piece of fiction published on August 24th, the user and author Gotel described a being with the same signature white eyes, but also having the default player skin, like the Steve skin with completely white eyes. With the date of the story in mind, I want to draw your attention to the original Herobrine image. See Herobrine here? What's more interesting is the text at the top. The build here is Alpha 1.0.16-2, under which was only available for a couple of weeks in August of 2010. This exact date the image was taken is a little up in the air, but the Alpha date narrows the amount of time to a specific day between August and the 13th and before September 1st. It might be a stretch to say whoever made this image was directly inspired by Godel's story, but a lot of people were writing their own version of White Eyes with their own conclusions, with some elements began to stick, and the default player skin was one of them. The story that often came attached to the classic image's date also became a little questionable, but follows the same time range of the alpha build. But I think I have a theory that the name Herobrine is something that came after this idea of the default skin. The story attached explains that the name Herobrine is attributed to someone going by the same name who mailed the narrator of the story in the forums to stop investigating the default skin. Now let's talk about the Copeland stream. Copeland was a Minecraft content creator back in the day who hosted an ancient livestream trying to find Herobrine. The full stream, I believe, is actually lost media, but there have been recreations of sort when he runs into Herobrine, based off of people who saw it. A lot of people are already hunting for this piece outside of the creepypasta context, so I'll leave that to people more interested in lost media. Obviously, the stream here isn't legitimate because it's been proven beyond a doubt that Herobrine isn't real, but that isn't the curious part. He wasn't called Herobrine in the stream, that I know of at least. Look at this forum post dating back to the August 30th. User Bobsby discussed a glitch where spawning human players in creative mode would have white eyes. This white-eyed variant is called him, dead notch, and white eyes, but no Herobrine. Someone even replies with the Copeland stream, so it happened before the copypasta text went around, 
because the name Herobrine is never thrown around in any of these forum posts dating back to August 2010, when the alpha build was in circulation. I can't prove beyond a doubt that it means the original image is illegitimate, but it does strongly imply that what we now call Herobrine was something a lot less concrete. He was known by several different names. The original stream isn't easy to track down, but we can start to paint a picture of a timeline of events. When the name Herobrine stuck because of the story attached to the original image, that it likely came after the Copeland stream because the name of the White-Eyed Steve entity wasn't entirely concrete. White Eyes, over the rapid course of a summer vacation, transformed into one of the biggest cryptids on the internet, and Minecraft's most iconic specter, and depending on how you interpret the chain of events, became Herobrine, and the rest is history. The exact details about White Eyes are somewhat amorphous because it was made during an enchanted time where people weren't daunted by using their imagination, despite how many people were pushed back on people speculating on something that almost certainly wasn't true but was still fun to picture. Minecraft hadn't really been released officially until a year later, and I admire the community's willingness to document and talk about something they might be experiencing together. Though, something you might have noticed is the lack of quantifiable, traceable steps and sources. We have some forum posts, but many of the things remain lost media about this whole case. The Copeland stream is still thin air. There's a lot of missing fan art for white eyes from the forums, and hell, Herobrine is the host to a lot of unknown questions himself. The author of the original story, and where the image came from is probably floating somewhere on 4chan's vboard, but that might better remain as partially lost, because then you'd have to explore the vboard. Ugh. I kind of view Minecraft as one of the last bastions for an era of creepypasta and general internet rumor horror content that most things left behind. To this day, there are still Minecraft creepypastas being written, and rumors going around, and honestly, it makes me want to play Minecraft. I've remembered to merge my Mojang account, and I'm scouring for more information as I play. It's fascinating to picture how people shifted ideas and stories around until what we understand as Herobrine came to be, and how iconic he is as a de facto Minecraft urban legend trendsetter, when his story started much earlier and had its roost traced with other entities. There's quite a bit of that came afterwards that I'd like to explore, but I'm taking things slow and steady. I didn't like Minecraft a whole lot as a kid, but with this angle, I think I appreciate it a whole lot more now. I don't just do Minecraft, however. I cover a wide range of topics, all relating to video games. This series, Strange Gaming, covers games both big and small with elements or rumors that give you a lonely, skin-crawling feeling. If that interests you and you haven't already taken the sandstone pill, then here's your glass of water. If you've gotten this far, then you're a real one. Comment down below if you've taken the sandstone pill. Let's me know people are interested in this more Minecraft content, and comments boost the YouTube algorithm. Until then, have a lovely rest of your day. Pokemon Platinum was a game that I cherished so remarkably growing up that I spent many an afternoon frantically consuming all information about it as I could. On the late 2000s internet, I learned of special Pokemon that could only be obtained through mystery gif events or the action replay. One of these Pokemon was the enigmatic Darkrai, a Pokemon wrapped in dark intrigue. Everything from the event itself to how he looked to using him in combat lulled my young mind further and further off the edge into the chasm of nightmares he occupied. There was nothing quite like him, a dark specter that lulls people into infinite sleep and torments their slumber with never-ending nightmares. I was so accustomed to Pokemon only acting with ill intent on their trainer's will, but here I was, facing down a Pokemon that tormented the young to such a terrible fate on its own accord. Most Pokemon aren't motivated to do much past survive when not caught by a trainer, so what did Darkrai seek to gain from cursing people in their sleep? I was forced to question how much autonomy and awareness he had, and by extension, how much Pokemon had as living creatures. When I managed to catch him Platinum, his Pokedex description forced me to question his motives even further. To protect himself, it means no harm. So we're only told that he it uses its sleep-inducing powers to protect itself, 
which throws a wrench in our plans of understanding this creature. Today, I seek to find the answers that my younger self could not. I combed over just about every single piece of information about Darkrai that I could, from the old to the new, and the conclusions I've come to have kind of floored me. Games, films, and books have all revealed a trend of recurring elements, motifs, and symbolism with staggering familiarity and consistency that puts most mystical Pokémon to shame. Game Freak has hidden so many details about this one Pokémon that almost any other in the franchise, and I can prove it to you. What if I told you Darkrai is more in common with the Abrahamic Devil than any other Pokémon? The claim sounds preposterous, but I'm sure I can convince you when I explain myself, and explaining myself is something I plan on doing for a while. Just look at the runtime of the video for proof. This is a Pokemon shown with two different, conflicting ways of life shown to us with equal substance. The life of a hermit who seeks to be accepted, and an active tormentor who relishes his sadism. But neither of these descriptions give the whole picture of who Darkrai is, and why he does what he does. Here's how I'll format the video. I'm going to explain who Darkrai is based on primary sources, the games he's featured in, as well as pick a few of the most games he's had the most substantial appearances and roles in, as well as complementary materials like the movies and anime. At the end, I'll re-examine all the points I've made for a grand statement on Darkrai, his personality, his motives, etc. You're going to want to stick to the end with this one, because the end is where you'll find the grand statements I must make about this character. You won't understand anything unless you watch all of it, so watch it all, or he'll put you into a coma and you'll never wake up. I want this video to be a comprehensive understanding of who this Pokemon is and what he does, because with a shocking number of appearances, a discussion has to be held in earshot of the thousands, and I will be the one to hold it, like an Octavio flexing my knowledge of strange games to the masses for my position of academia. My position comes with a master's in strange and obscure video knowledge, and I'm overly qualified to teach you, so why not sign up for my classes? All you need to do is click that little button to subscribe, and here. I've got more classes in the form of a whole playlist of videos just like these called Strange Gaming ready for you to enjoy. This is without doubt my most ambitious project. Okay, maybe my most second ambitious? But this is still an undertaking regardless. I humbly ask you to support me in my endeavor to cover strange and obscure games. If you don't, who's to say Darkrai won't pay you a visit and submerge you into eternal sleep if you don't do what I tell you to do? Now, let's get on with it, and let me take you into the confusing world of the pitch black Pokemon. Who is Darkrai? The question speaks for itself. Who is this Pokemon? The name alone tells us a thousand words in one. The Rai suffix at the end of his name is just the Japanese name for Dark, which means his name literally translates to Dark Dark, which is fitting. It tells us his typing, his classification of Pokémon, his affinity for fright and terror, and how he looks. He's also technically sexless, as most legendaries and mythical Pokémon tend to be, but come on. Most additional media has him as a male, so that's what we're rolling with. He's somewhere in the middle of a haunting, floating Brothers Grimm fable creature and Van Helsing. The red piece around his neck either resembling a cloak or jagged teeth depending on interpretation. The floating bits of smoke or clouds that make up his pitch black body represent the undulating, hard to define shapes of his shadow behind you, which Darkrai can slip into with ease. The bone white cap on his head resembles both a cap one would sleep in in times of old and the color association with the moon, which explains much of his behavior and links him to Cresselia, whom both make up the ill-explained lunar duo. So we've got our key points from the primary source. We've got the Sleeping and Nightmare Association and the Moon slash Cresselia Association. The domain of nightmares is where Darkrai is most comfortable. Nearly all his depictions explain that he can cast someone to fall asleep and experience varying levels of nightmares, some of which seemingly have no end. This is backed up by two things, his signature moves and his ability. Dark Void was a dark type move that had an 80% chance to hit and put opponents to sleep, combined with his ability, Bad Dreams, which deals chip damage to anyone sleeping while Darkrai is out. You can see how a very accurate sleeping move and an ability that deals free damage would be so devastating in battle. I described it in the past tense because Dark Void got big leagued hard by going down to 50% accuracy in Gen 7 onwards. No more Smeargle Dark Void, boys. <laughs> The description of the attack is interesting too. 
It's always described the target is being dragged down into a type of shadow that puts them to sleep, like some kind of pocket dimension. The second thing that needs explaining is the moon association. Given his spooky nature, it's no surprise that he would be most active at night and in full moons. But this presents a problem because one of the only known ways to wake someone up from a dark ride nightmare is with a lunar wing, something that falls from the Pokemon Cresselia, whose connection to the moon is obvious enough to not explain. The two Pokemon oppose each other greatly, one having gentle healing properties from the moon and the other having threatening, malicious moon powers. The connection is understated, and we aren't given a full picture of what purpose these two play out in nature to justify balancing against one another, or if other moon-based Pokemon play a part in their lunar game, but I do have an example for you. What the hell's wrong with you? Look like a Puerto Rican whore. Make me sick. In Gen 4, during the post-game after you beat the champion, the sailor who normally takes you to Iron Island, Sailor Eldritch, not exactly a subtle name cues, Sun is stuck in an endless nightmare, moaning about how Darkrai is watching him. The only way to wake up his son is to visit Full Moon Island, which triggers Cresselia to becoming a roaming Pokemon, and she drops a lunar wing, which wakes the child. Curiously, there's another house in Canelave that can't be entered, but hold on to that for now. So Darkrai puts this child into an eternal nightmare, somehow. The child's mother does mention that it is an unheard of for people in the city to fall into eternal slumbers. A port city connected to ancient islands and Pokemon associated with dreaming and the moon. If the sailor's name wasn't a clear enough clue, we found ourselves a neat little Lovecraft reference. This whole slice of the game has a bit of everything in it, from the Innsmouth to the Dreamlands. All that's missing is our player character discovering his Pokemon blood and choosing to abandon his humanity and dive into the sea. The world of Pokemon doesn't know a lot about Darkrai or his methods, but they do know this. He's a mythical Pokemon, meaning that he can't traditionally be obtained in the wild like most Pokemon, or at least that's how he was introduced. The only way one can obtain him was through a mystery gift event where you can connect to the limited DS Wi-Fi to receive your special Pokemon. I think North Americans got it in 2008, and he had Dialga and Palkia's signature moves for some reason. But for Pokemon Platinum, there is another way. Between August and September of the same year, you could obtain something called the Members Card, which allowed you to open this building in Canelave City, after you do the whole Lunar Wing quest mentioned previously. The player character is sent to bed by a creepy old man and awakes on New Moon Island, just east of Full Moon Island. Inside the Heart of Darkness is Darkrai, waiting for you. Once you catch it, an interesting paragraph is spoken from presumably the old man inside is displayed. We're given a phenomenal insight. The nightmares Darkrai causes might not always be intentional. We know he can intentionally cause them, but the revelation of his apparent inability to always control them is something we must consider for his reputation. If his mere presence is enough to cause these endless coma-induced nightmares, then that would explain why the child fell under his domain. Full Moon Island, despite visiting there in a dream, is still in the Sinnoh region, and close enough to reach by boat travel from Canelave. Perhaps northern Snowpoint Town also falls victim to his nightmares. One must question why such a clause exists in such a mythical Pokemon. Legendaries and mythicals alike are typically the embodiments of their own domains. See the Gen 4 box legends. Dialga is time, Palkia is space, and Giratina is... Uh, what was he again? Some kind of like, antimatter? Or like, dark matter? Uh... The explanation may arise when you consider that we still don't understand why the human brain dreams, so nightmares would fall under the same realm of not being fully understood, even to a being that embodies them. Perhaps there's another angle I've yet to explore. Darkrai, through his member pass event, embodies the ancient, unknowable darkness that dwells in ancient history and memories. Canelave is a microcosm of Sinnoh, a region where modern industrialization is just as important as preserving ancient history and customs. The Canelave Library is home to some truly ancient tomes that reveal history and folklore that forced players to question everything they knew about Pokemon. Darkrai is a living folklore, a shadowy being that never reveals itself or its motives. 
Though, there's one more revelation I think I should mention. If Darkrai cannot entirely control who is given nightmares, then how would that color his folklore and wives' tales? People speak of him in hushed tones out of fear and contempt, but if he doesn't always mean to afflict people with eternal sleep, should we pity him? Put yourself in his situation. Imagine your presence causing people to become comatose and tormented by sleep terrors beyond your control. Would the families and friends of those affected not loathe you for this, despite your intentions? It's no secret that he rests on an island, alone. Maybe luring your player character into catching him was more of a cry for help than a challenge. A Pokemon unable to interact with people or other Pokemon without causing them great fear, isolating itself from the rest of the world who shunned it. It's a bittersweet story that would rend anyone's soul to bits. This is how Pokemon Platinum interprets his character. We're given quite a list of traits and details that not a lot of other Pokemon are able to receive. We know that he can give people nightmares, intentionally or not, we know that he has a fair few connections to Eldritch Horror, he likes to operate in the nighttime when the moon is out, perhaps because that's when people are already sleeping so he can either avoid them or give them nightmares. We have two sides to the same Pokemon. One is a malicious, malevolent entity who enjoys inflicting pain on children, and the other is a sympathetic, lonely Pokemon just as a slave to his own powers. These are all the details we have for his debut generation, however. There are a couple more games to draw information from, some mainline and some spin-offs. I'll be jumping around the timeline and not sticking to strict release dates in order to build intrigue. Trust me on this, it goes so much deeper than Platinum. Lentimos Town is a new location unique to Generation 5 sequel games, Pokemon Black and White 2. It's a dusty but cozy little town that should remind you of a quiet little suburb deep in Arizona or New Mexico. But there's a dark shadow hanging over top of the residence. To our east near Reversal Mountain is a decrepit house simply called The Strange House. A unique theme not found elsewhere in the game greets you once you're inside. The house is completely abandoned, trainers like yourself looking for riches and information are its only inhabitants. Living inhabitants, that is. A ghostly figure of a young girl stalks the player, and each time she appears, she gives us new info on what happened to her, and subsequently the home. An everlasting dark dream. An endless dream of darkness. Dad. Mom. Abra. Where are you? Each encounter with this ghostly girl results in the furniture changing as we progress. This should begin to sound familiar, a child stuck in a nightmare, unable to wake up. Question is, how did she fall under Darkrai's spell? He seems to prefer the Sinnoh region, but perhaps with how remote Lentimus Town is, perhaps he thought it abandoned until he inadvertently caused the child to go under. In the dark dream, I heard my dad's voice, forget about the Lunar Wing. Please stay here with us. The suffering she's experiencing is so great in this nightmare that she either dreamt her father's voice calling out for her, or even worse, heard him speaking to her. The lunar wing, as we know, can wake someone from eternal sleep, but why would her father tell her to forget about it, and what does stay here with us really mean? This could either be her dream dad beckoning her for the final true sleep of death, or perhaps even more morbidly, her dad putting her out of her misery. We're able to find the Lunar Wing inside the house, but it's too late to save her. Oh, the Lunar Wing. I can't take it now. But it'll be okay. Please return the wing to the Pokemon. I was waiting on the bridge so I can return it myself. The bridge she was referring to is Marvelous Bridge. In the original black and white games, you could see the same figure appear on the bridge. If you bring the Lunar Wing to the bridge in Black and White 2, Cresselia will appear and give you a chance to catch her. All in all, what the hell was that story? We all thought it, but I don't think many were prepared to see what the real Eternal Sleep looks like. Death. You could be kept alive medically, but is it really humane to keep someone alive so that they may suffer more in their nightmares? The girl is resigned to her fate because she likely knows what's in store for her. 
There are bookshelves that talk about Darkroy, which mentions that giving people nightmares is still a defense mechanism. I admire how this child was able to move on to the afterlife and not hold a grudge against the Pokemon that caused her to die. I wonder what happened to her family. She had parents and a pet Abra. I suppose they either fled the house from fear, or they also died. If her father's voice is meant to imply that they were going to reach the afterlife together. It's a heartbreaking story, and it's bound to cause extreme reactions to Darkrai's nature. The strange house either amplified someone's pity for him, or made you really dislike him. I have good news for people who grew to hate him, because the next examples are pretty sinister. Yes, Poke Park has a story, and yes, I am covering it seriously. Leave a like for that. Also, finding footage for this game is a total nightmare, so you're gonna just have to trust me when I tell you about certain things. As I understand it, there are two worlds in these games. There's Poke Park, the setting for the first game, and Wish Park, the setting of this game. Pikachu and his life partner Piplup travel to Wish Park, but they become trapped there. Fast forwarding through the game, we get a chance to meet Queen Superior, who explains to them there's an old legend about something called the Dark Void, when both worlds try and merge together. Pikachu and Ko travel to different areas to free them of the more unsightly Pokemon to make sure the residents are content. There's a lot of mind control happening, and we find out it's being perpetrated by the entire Gothitelle line, but they're taking orders from Darkrai. Darkrai's plan is to merge the two worlds and cause them to both be completely destroyed in the process. Why does he do this? I I'm not sure if I missed him explaining why, or if he's just doing it for the Nookie. I will have to leave a Pokebar 2 expert to explain to me why in the comments section below. <laughs> There are some genuine character moments and character building in this game, but Darkrai is mostly here to be the bad guy for the sake of having a villain to fight. But not before he pulls out some new tricks. He's been holding Pikachu's life partner Piplup hostage and somehow can completely remove other Pokemon's memories. I don't know how he obtained this ability, but he puts it to great effect by erasing Pikachu's new friend's memories of him and putting him into a nightmare coma forcing him to live out a life where he has zero friends and he doesn't fit in. Vicious. We get this hilariously overdramatic cutscene of a depressed Pikachu. But not all is lost. Both worlds can stay alive if some bells are rung and someone flies into the dark void with this orb, and Darkrai, after you kick the snot out of him, sees the error of his ways and flies in. There's a whole quest afterwards of Pikachu and Co. contacting legendaries to see if they can bring him back, but we have some new facts to chew on. Darkrai can affect Pokemon's memories, manipulating them or erasing them outright. I suppose that being able to control someone's sleep hits enough of the brain to affect memories, but this is something I want you to hold on to. Secondly, this game shows us he has a real dark side to him, wanting to see everyone wiped out from reality out of sheer cruelty. We don't really understand his motives, but he has a genuine sadistic side to balance out his sympathetic. Our profile of him is becoming stronger. His isolation manifests itself in some sinister ways. And that only becomes truer as we look at the final game for this section, Pokemon Mystery Dungeon Explorers of Sky. Trying to explain the entire story of a Mystery Dungeon game is a huge ask, and that's not really what I'm doing. I'm explaining things relevant to Darkrai, but there's still a lot to explain. Trying to summarize a JRPG plot is exhausting and will probably piss off fans of the game, and I'm using Sky instead of Time and Darkness because it's an enhanced version, so they're for most convenience. The game starts with an unnamed player, you, turning into a Pokemon, having their memory become hazy after some kind of time travel incident. This is the least weird thing to happen to you. The very, very short explanation is someone broke the Temporal Tower, a domain belonging to Dialga which helps it manage the flow of time correctly. Once it broke, Dialga went sicko mode and began lashing out in a primordial form and won't listen to reason, which kickstarts the game's story. Another huge TLDR, you're able to fix the Temporal Tower and save Dialga, and he restores the timeline as thanks, but with a hefty cost. 
you, the player, must be disintegrated and die. The cost of winning is death and traumatizing your entire party. Actually, Dialga's chill and brings you back, so you're all good. We're still left with a pretty burning question, however. Who destroyed the Temporal Tower? The post-game answers some of these questions and elaborates on some of the more loose ends. While your participation in dungeon crawling with your main party and guild, you're getting recurring dreams from Cresselia, who claims that your existence is causing space to start disorting and warping because you're from a time that no longer exists. There is a way to solve this, however. You should kill yourself now! The party doesn't like that very much and does everything in its power to try and fix space, but Palkia himself intervenes because Cresselia has been whispering into his ear about killing you to set things straight. Palki has been struggling to fight off his own nightmares, and you're sucked inside. Cresselia appears, and eggs Palkia to finish you off, but another Cresselia appears and exposes the first one as a faker, as Darkrai. The final battle begins not far after, and Darkrai reveals his hand completely. He was the one who broke the Temporal Tower, which drove Dialga mad. He was the one tormenting Palkia, and you in your dreams about dying. He was the one behind your memory loss and your transformation to a Pokemon. Every detail of this game's story, the timeline problems, the near destruction of all time and all space was solely from Darkrai. But why? Why would he cause so much chaos and destruction? What would motivate him to destroy the flow of time and space and warp it beyond recognition? He wants everyone to sleep. Every single Pokemon will be coated in darkness as time and space cease to function, essentially returning reality to a zero point. Where the only contender for King of the Cosmos is Darkrai, who will rule what's left of the universe with an iron fist as he torments his helpless subjects with endless nightmares until they lose themselves in their own minds. I glossed over it when talking about Poke Park, but there's a very macabre aspect of Darkrai that we must speak about, his genocidal tendencies. This isn't just one example of Darkrai wanting to destroy the lives of everyone in a plane of existence, it's happened several times. Within him is a boundless well of malice and hatred for every living creature, and the desire to subjugate them under his rule, or by manipulating their memories, or by outright killing them. There have been genocidal Pokemon characters before. Cyrus from Gen 4 wanted to remake the world in his own image, which meant overriding everyone currently alive so he could shape it as he saw fit, but not on a scale to what Darkrai wants. Not only does he want to rule over everything, he also wants every leaving Pokemon, and potentially human being on the planet, to be trapped in a coma and suffer their own unique nightmares at this hand. Sorry, I thought I was playing Pokemon, not I have no mouth and I must scream. Luckily, we don't have to live in the future that Darkrai wants. You're able to beat him in a fight as he tries to flee through a portal, but Palkia comes in and puts his own two cents in by destroying that portal. This event somehow affects Darkrai's memory, meaning that he has no memory of what he tried to do to the world. You can even recruit him later on. So let's go over the new profile. Something I want to highlight is that other legendaries have a lot of beef with Darkrai. In Poke Park 2, the Weather Trio and the Twin Dragons all try and free him from the Dark Void, and there are a lot of legendaries he pisses off in Mystery Dungeon. Cresselia, as well as the embodiment of time and space, Dialga and Palkia. His memory-altering ability is also curious. Perhaps it was a connection with dreams? Which implies some kind of scientific theories that dreams are linked to our memories a lot more than we understand. We need to talk about his genocidal tendencies. He acts very calculated and collected when he gets dialogue, but I simply cannot ignore the bottomless level of hatred he has to subject people to the horrible fate of being asleep forever and tortured with nightmares. What caused all that? We know that people are very apprehensive being around him because of his foul reputation, but clearly the reputation precedes him, because he is willing and able to subject the innocent to torture. There's something alien and unexplainable about why he feels this way. He's not exactly talkative when he wants to kill anyone. I feel a little uneasy about the scenario, even being trapped in a unique personal hell of my own mind's making because an entity I've never met has so much loathing for all life that he wants to inflict the most deeply personal torment he can. The comparison to Harlan Ellison's story was a little more than a mere joke. 
am the computer god of a crumbled world torturing the last five remaining humans on planet Earth, shares this feeling quite a bit. The feeling of a semi-faceless monster that wants to harm living beings in their own personal ways. Humor me for a moment. I would like to end this segment with a famous quote from the original story that I think applies to Dark Rye quite well. Hate. Let me tell you how much I've come to hate you since I began to live. There are 387.44 million miles of printed circuits in wafer-thin layers that fill my complex. If the word hate was engraved into each nanonangstrom of those hundreds of millions of miles, it would not equal one one billionth of the hate I feel for humans at this micro instance for you. Hate. Hate. You've likely noticed I keep trying to apply sympathetic motivations to Darkrai. Why is that? How can someone who wants to kill everyone possibly be sympathetic or relatable? The answer might surprise you because it's found in the 2007 movie The Rise of Darkrai. Based on the long-running Pokemon anime, the movie follows an encounter Ash has with Darkrai during whenever the Gen 4 anime arc was called. I remember watching this movie over and over again as a kid. I even had the Viz manga adaptation, which you'll mostly be seeing because I'm afraid of getting a strike for copyright by using too much footage from the movie. The movie is kind of a lot to take in at once. You know how I've been characterizing him so far as a genocidal, asocial maniac? I want you to keep reminding yourself of that while you watch this from point on. Ash and Co make it to Alamos Town, a mountainside town inspired by Barcelona and Spain. This technically makes it the first place in the franchise inspired by Spain that I know of, and better yet, it doesn't run at 20 frames per second. The crew meets Alice, a young woman who works as a tour guide through the town. We approach upon a colossal tower quite aptly named the Space Time Towers, which each side representing Dialga and Palkia. I hope warning bells are going off in your heads. Alice is quite skilled with leaf whistling. It calms Pokemon down whenever they're in a scuffle, which is shown repeatedly throughout the film, especially so in this garden. The garden is a very important location in the film, acting as a safe haven for all living creatures in the town. It was also the location where Alice's grandmother, Alicia, taught her how to use the grass whistle. It was built by the famous architect Goaty, who also built the towers and likely most of the town. His great-grandson, Tonio, studies some of the odd happenings in town, particularly with some of the deformed objects that look clawed and gnarled. His scientific musings are cut short by the appearance of Darkrai, who manifests from the shadow kind of like Giratina. Ash gets hit with Dark Void during the scuffle, and we finally get a representation of what a Darkrai nightmare looks like. It's pretty PG-13 in the movie, but nonetheless stressful for whatever Ash's age is. He's isolated and is getting frightening visions of Palkia, and Pikachu is being swallowed up in a sinkhole. Everyone is distraught that they were attacked, but Tonio rushes back to his lab to find Godi's diary, where he details how Alicia encountered Darkrai decades ago. He was fighting against other Pokemon in the garden, presumably because he gets along with nobody and nobody likes him. Alicia, however, doesn't react with fear or disdain. She pities the creature and comforts him with her leaf whistle. Come to think of it, have we ever seen someone not treat him with disdain? Every other interaction of detail, he's been antagonistic or trying to flee from an encounter. But this might be the earliest example of him not only choosing to be around someone not to gain something, but because he felt wanted. We also find that he can speak to humans, which is probably just a feature of the movie to tie into the themes a little bit tighter, but leaves us with an interesting question to pose. If Darkrai can speak, does he choose not to speak to most people? Do not come here. I never really thought about it, but if he had been shown some compassion, would we be able to understand him better? Perhaps this is just me, but I'm taking a look at the bigger picture at how this is all represented. A creature of darkness and malice being accepted into a garden by the comfort of a woman, while the garden's creator watches on. It might seem like I'm seeing parallels that aren't there, but this reminds me greatly of Paradise Lost by John Milton. Think about it. Darkrai representing Satan as he crawled into the serpent, the Pokemon Garden as the Garden of Eden, Alicia representing Eve, and Godi as God watching it all happen. 
Granted, it has a much happier ending than Paradise Lost, because Darkrai takes the comfort inwards and becomes indebted in affection to Alicia afterwards instead of causing her to doom mankind, but I think the comparison invites us to question Darkrai's role in the grand cosmology of the universe, perhaps as a rogue agent meant to test people. The gang travel up to the tower and find that the tower is actually a colossal musical instrument that plays music off of large discs insert at the very top. Things don't stay good for very long, however. Some kind of purple lens flare appears in the sky, which causes Darkrai to flip out and shouting at whatever's inside to leave. Trainers in town are pretty sketched out and assume Darkrai is behind it, so they try and attack him which leaves most Pokemon around stuck in nightmares as Darkrai defends himself. More spatial anomalies occur, which includes trapping the entire town in a Silent Hill-like dimension where fog surrounds all sides and prevents people from leaving, as well as making the Pokemon's dreams come to life, which usually involves them being chased by something horrifying, potentially Palkia if the purple outline in Ash's dream are any hints. Tonio was hesitant to blame Darkrai because he witnessed Darkrai saving Alice from falling from a great height when they were younger and interprets Darkrai's demand for people to leave the city as a warning for whatever creature transported the town away to leave instead. He's proven correct when it's revealed that Palkia is behind all of the spatial distortions and transporting the town as an effect of trying to hide from an angry Dialga chasing him. So, Darkrai was so moved by this child's comfort that he was willing to be shunned and hated by the rest of the townsfolk if it meant protecting what was now important to him, his newfound home. A home where he wasn't welcomed by all, but the fact he was welcomed at all was enough for him, and it's honestly pretty touching. We don't know where he came from this continuity, but if he carries over the motifs of him typically being feared and alone, having a place to not always be on guard must be intoxicating for those unfamiliar. Darkrai tries, and mostly fails to make Palkia flee, and things only escalate when Dialga comes in, which begins to tear at the fabric of space and erase the town from existence. He gets the sugar beaten out of him after fending Alice from a nasty blow and retreats to the gardens. He mistakenly calls Alice Alicia. Alicia. My name's Alice. You see, Alicia was my grandmother. Alice. Given their resemblance, it's not unreasonable, but also a little bittersweet that Darkrai didn't find anyone else who accepted him, and continually defended the only person who did, believing that her children were her, either because he was in some form of denial, or he's stupid. The only way to stop the two dragons from fighting is to play a tune called the Oracion, which is Spanish for prayer, and is also the grass whistle song Alice's grandmother taught her all those years ago. So. Alicia played a prayer to accept Darkrai into the garden, and now praying is the only way to stop the town from being swallowed by darkness. Huh. The gang finds the right disc to play in the tower and rush to the very top. Darkrai gets his ass beaten again and again, and we see an expanded version of the flashback he had. Alicia tells him he never has to leave, and that he can stay in the garden as long as he likes. You don't have to leave. You can stay here. Of course, you can stay here for as long as you like. This is everyone's garden. His pupils dilate and he doesn't believe her. The words she imparts with him stay forever. This is everyone's garden. Those were the last words Darkrai spoke before stopping a final blow between the dragons and giving his life to protect the garden, to protect Alamos Town. He dies and fades into nothing. The gang are able to play the prayer disc, and Palkia restores the town back to normal after he and Dialga have been calmed. Take a look at how the prayer transforms the tower. Maybe I'm going schizo, but look at all those golden branches. Kind of looks like the back pieces of Arceus, no? The two dragons leave, and all is well, but the town is missing its dark defender. Someone whom they dearly misunderstood and treated shamefully, who gave his life to protect people that despised him. But not all is lost. He stands atop the space-time tower's return to form. The movie ends with everyone thanking Darkrai for his noble efforts. What do we understand about Darkrai? You know how I was building a resume for him? Throw it out, because it seems to be almost a completely different character. From the convincing of one child, he was willing to give his life for this town and its inhabitants, which goes against every other portrayal of him we've seen this far. 
We're so close to our conclusion, so close to finally understanding the fragments of Darkrai's heart, and I'm going to talk all about it in our final segment. We have no more white meat turkeys. I'm gauging how many people have actually made it this far by saying this phrase. Comment down below, we have no more white meat turkeys, to prove that you've watched up until this point. Only the realest ones have. All this time, I've theorized that there were two opposing sides to Darkrai, but I think I've been underestimating him the whole time. There aren't two sides, there's three. There's the one found in our primary games, the lonely specter who can't control who receives nightmares, who isolates himself from the world to protect itself, and potentially out of fear and sorrow for though it inadvertently plagues. In Platinum, he might have accidentally cursed a child to be struck in his nightmare, which forced us to travel to Full Moon Island to retrieve a lunar wing from Cresselia to wake him. In Black and White 2, another child is victim to endless nightmares, but she wasn't lucky enough to be woken up, and she died, haunting her former home as a ghost. Pokedex entries and books found in these games all state that Darkrai does not typically inflict nightmares to harm people, but when it feels threatened, which might broadly apply to most people who approach it, intentionally or not. It might seem pedestrian when I've shown all of the other examples of what he can do, but being tormented by nightmares and unable to wake up is a really draining issue that I've become intimately familiar with. I've been getting a lot of sleep paralysis and terrible dreams lately, and it's been affecting my ability to lead a happy, fulfilling life. It's extremely stressful and makes me fear falling asleep. Imagine seeing the hat man as a 10 year old and never able to wake up. An eternal sleep paralysis. But he doesn't mean to do that, apparently. This would characterize Darkrai as more of a dangerous animal than someone who can actively communicate with people. It operates as all Pokemon do, living on their own in the wild, or sharing the joys of being trained by a loyal trainer. But even when he resembles his fellow creatures the most, he is still separated an infinite distance away. He still has no place in the ecosystem. I don't think he really knows what purpose he serves, so he hides away from everyone, living on the run and drifting away from people, but still being afflicted. What would a Darkrai nightmare actually look like? We've been given some examples, but entertain the thought for a moment and consider if you were personally affected by one of his nightmares. You are alone. Your family is gone, your friends are nowhere in sight. You might be able to recognize your location in some objects around you because your brain is trying to piece together random bits of information stored inside your head. The isolation is an important aspect because we know that you're always alone in these dreams, but from a distance, you are being watched. Just a reminder, this dream doesn't end. Most nightmares end abruptly, but without a lunar wing, you are stuck. You're wandering through a realm of your own making, while your body wastes away as you become dehydrated and starve. It doesn't match all the symptoms of a coma because the victims are sometimes able to mutter something while stuck in their dreams, but still, the body being deprived of nourishment is something to seriously consider. Your dreams are bound to become much more sinister and tormenting as your fuel runs low and you begin to waste away. Your family watches you become a bag of bones before their very eyes. Darkrai can make you see whatever he wants you to see, Depending on if he wants you to fall prey, that is. The land of sleep is his kingdom where he has total control. Whether he chooses to be merciful or cruel is entirely up to him. He may choose to re-emerge some of your most well-kept secrets or warn you about something in the near future. If someone could obtain a lunar wing, then you'll be okay. Physically, at least. 
Who knows how much of this you'll remember after you wake up, because if you don't write anything down, chances are you'll forget it. I'm someone who is regularly affected with all sorts of sleeping problems. I'm a terrible insomniac with a penchant for unnerving dreams that stick with me for too long. I don't think this is because a video game character is responsible, but if I had a name and a face to attach for all of my sorrow, I at least wish it could speak to me and answer my questions. Mainly, why are you doing this to me? He might not be able to speak in the main series, but that's a life that no one can envy. He's a mythical Pokemon too, and events from other games notwithstanding, is either one of very few like him, or the last of his kind. He can't breed with anything else. So his life is doomed to end alone and unaccomplished. Is that something we should not pity? An animal deprived of any sense of family, companionship, of love? For solitude sometimes is best society. The second Darkrai is the conniving, evil, monstrous Darkrai found in the spin-off games. Both in Poke Park 2 and Mystery Dungeon, Darkrai loathes the world and his creatures so greatly that it seeks to wipe them out of reality, either by putting them all to sleep and controlling them through their dreams, or by erasing them from reality altogether. Comparably, Darkrai is much more social, he has minions and underlings, he understands the psyche of Pokemon well enough to manipulate them with their personal desires and gaslight them in their dreams. He's able to control his nightmares to not accidentally inflict them on anybody nearby. He can manipulate the memories of other creatures to sow his seeds of discord. This is the darkest we've ever seen of him. He demonstrates monstrous behavior to suit his monstrous desires. I've discussed his plans at length already, but I haven't begun to question his motives for why he's doing all this. If we use the base game as an example, is he simply tired of being treated like a threat and he's acting out? Well, stick with me on this one. Darkrai's purpose on Earth might be that of a tempter, someone who deliberately causes problems to test the temptations and constitution of other Pokemon. It might sound strange, but consider that he's to mess with regular, non-story relevant Pokemon, and grand legendaries in charge of the concepts of time and space without a second thought. I don't have a lot of evidence to back this up, but it would provide an explanation why he would be doing all this. It makes his fate perhaps even crueler, that he is divinely ordained to be loathed by everyone, to be the platonic bad guy and obstacle for everyone's character development, like the accuser in the book of Job who tempts the dutiful man to renounce God. For this metaphor to make sense, God would have to be something like friendship between you and your friends, which does make a little bit of sense because he does like to split up your group a lot. Darkrai as an agent of chaos is something interesting to chew on, but his actions speak louder than his few words. He saw the error of his ways in Poke Park 2 and gave his life to stop from destroying both worlds, so clearly he has his own feelings on the situation sometimes. He clearly enjoys hurting others greatly, but he might be unsure of following entirely through with his plans. It reminds me a great deal of Thanos having infinite power in Marvel Comics on several occasions, but always finding a way to lose it and be thwarted because he self-consciously prepares himself to lose because he doesn't entirely feel worthy of the power. Maybe I'm looking too deeply into all of this. Curiously, Darkrai loses his memories at the end of Explorers of Sky and doesn't recall what he did, which might actually explain how he appears in the mainline games. Hold on to this tidbit. Did I request thee, maker, from my clay, to mold me man? Did I solicit thee from darkness to promote me? Finally, we have how he's portrayed in the anime. We've had lonely Darkrai, we've had evil Darkrai, but here we have heroic, anti-hero Darkrai. He came from an unknown scuffle and sowed conflict with other Pokemon, but upon being shown compassion, he repays his affection in this form of protection. Darkrai becomes a deity focused on protecting the person who showed him compassion in the garden he calls home. He's able to communicate with humans in this continuity, not well, mind you, not past a couple sentences, which means he's either not very well versed in conversation, or he's on the spectrum. Darkrai doesn't like people very much, or at least struggles to show it past a select bloodline, but for those he does openly dote on, he protects them from any harm, regardless of the damage it does to him. I'm going to start putting the pieces together. I made parallels to Darkrai being a kind of devil-like figure, 
And with the Abrahamic symbolism featured in the movie, I think that might be a powerful cudgel to break down his character. Think about it like this. The devil flees to the Garden of Eden, meets someone who shows him compassion, and is allowed to redeem himself in a way by sacrificing his life to protect what God has created. It might not be accurate to how Satan operates in reality, but in the realm of fantasy that Pokemon operates in, it's a touching story, but there are still some unanswered questions. Why is Darkrai suddenly accepting of people now? I guess we never really got to see the scenarios in the game, but what was so different with how Alice's grandmother treated him? Was it the prayer she played on the grass whistle? I want everyone to brace themselves for this because I've got a homebrew explanation for everything. I won't claim this is what Game Freak intended because it obviously wasn't. This Pokemon is split by whoever is writing him at the moment, but entertain this thought experiment for me. A Pokemon created to be a disturber, to use nightmares and temptation to test people and the necessary, required evil being to make sure the good-hearted stay good-hearted and build their bonds together. This means that Darkrai was not meant to have friends, to be loved or understood, but to be loathed and fought against. He is the platonic villain to pervert and subvert the natural conditions required to be alive. He is the bridge between sleep and death. Perhaps on orders from the heavens, or acting on his own, he tries to kill an uncountable numbers of living beings and manipulate them into destroying reality, which is never fated to work because he was not made to succeed. He is a stepping stone. This leads into Explorers of Sky, where Palkia corrupts his memory and he forgets who he really is and what his purpose is. Through forgetting, he's also partially lost control of his powers, which means he accidentally puts people to sleep. He may have forgotten, but the people haven't forgotten about him. They hate him for reasons he doesn't remember or understand, so he isolates himself from every living being, scorned and running away from a world that wants him dead. No compassion or love comes his way until he meets a young girl inside this garden, who doesn't know who he is and doesn't care. Just from their first meeting, she gives him something to work towards, home, love. He indebts his life to her and her family, protecting the garden and Alamos town, because he's found a new purpose in life, and it is to be the Dark Defender. And it's something he gives his life towards. He's okay with his eventual death because it meant he was able to forge his own path and make a difference through his own decisions, something he was not created to do. With this, he can die satisfied, but he's been granted a second chance at life. Something from the heavens was pleased, with his actions and brought him back to continue his newfound purpose, one he was able to forge for himself. I sung of chaos and eternal night, taught by heavenly muse to venture down to the dark descent, and up to reascend. This is how I interpret Darkrai's story, as a being created to be the devil, who is able to find redemption through mankind's compassion and dedicates his life to protecting them in his own way. We may never get an actual answer from the developers, because this is just me creating a loosely tied story from different media pieces, but it's as good as any because Pokemon is a franchise flexible enough to have your own input without overriding too much. There aren't many characters that make me think like this, and I don't think a lot of other people would come to the conclusions I did. This is maybe because I'm reaching, or perhaps there truly might be a deeper narrative with Darkrai going on. It's hard to tell unless you make the first step, and I think I've found an explanation I'm satisfied with. This is a Pokemon with oodles of hidden details and facts to stitch together, and I encourage people to look beyond the main series to find the deepest lore. And speaking of deepest lore, what does Darkrai do after coming back to life? Compete in Pokémon Tournament, of course! Surely he's a playable character for a reason, no? I would be delighted to see how people in the comments section down below come up with their own theories and tell me how they feel about the pitch black Pokemon. For me, this has been building to something I've wanted to talk about for a very, very long time. Darkrai is a Pokemon I have quite a connection with, which I think is not a coincidence because of what kind of life I had. As a young child with frequent sleep problems, it only makes sense that I'd be drawn to someone who known to torment children. But perhaps inadvertently, I took a few lessons from Alicia and that I was able to forgive this kind of dark tormentor from doing this to me. Obviously he isn't real, but the emotional throughline I have with this thing exists as a tangible thing I can speak about, 
and it possessed me as I wrote every word for the script, and I'm overjoyed to have produced something for it and have something to show. Strange Gaming is taking a new direction, and each episodes are being more edited, larger, and overall, simply better. And I can't do that without your support. There's a whole playlist to check out of different games and content, and it's all good. I promise. Sleep is something I've always had a strange relationship with. Some of my favorite videos of all time, say the You May Nikki video, also tackles the topics of sleep, of uh, sleeping in nightmares. Perhaps there's a connection between the two, of being forcedly trapped in nightmare. Granted, Madotsky can wake up, so it's not a huge, uh, she's not exactly stuck in the dream. But I think it's interesting that media I'm uninver inadvertently drawn to typically features sleep as a main component, sleeping, dreaming, and what the interpretations of those mean. Before I go, I do have a little teaser for something I'm working on. Until then, have a lovely rest of your day. Honestly, horror games don't have much appeal to me. Stop me if you've heard this type of game before. You're some guy armed with a flashlight, some kind of weapon exploring pitch black environments taking down enemies with broken pathfinding. If you're lucky, the game will potentially be a finished working product before release and not a cynical cash grab meant to exploit the core audience who doesn't know any better. Children. The whole reason I started my series, Strange Gaming, was to highlight games that excel in atmosphere, tone, the aesthetics of the unknown, and being vulnerable. All of these things usually require a lot more effort than the token contributions the horror genre is infamous for. And you can really tell when the best horror games of this generation, just remakes, 20 something year old games with diversity hires and hacks and... Sorry, was I boring you? People ranting about the state of horror games is worn out and cliche, and I don't want to waste your time with something like that. Instead, let me pill you on something. One of the most unnerving and atmospheric games I've ever played is not only free, not only an indie project, but it's also a Mario World ROM hack that stands head and shoulders above its sister games, amongst free mods, amongst every other game I've played with little exaggeration. The game is called The, or if you look into the game's files, Coronation Day. First, let me set the stage. Mario World, being one of the most famous video games ever made, needs no introduction. Everyone knows everything about it because of the substantial influence it had on video games in general, so I won't talk your ear off about the secrets you can find in the levels. Mario as a franchise also needs no introduction. Everyone at least knows of him, even Tony Soprano has played Mario. What I will talk about is the game's extensive history of ROM hacking. You're likely familiar with the term Kaizo Mario, which refers to a genre of ROM hacking where someone, usually an insane Japanese man and his friends, making intentionally difficult games that put your knowledge of the game's mechanics to the absolute limits. These ROM hacks, among other genres, have a storied history of being created and passed down the early internet in the 2000s. 
especially on the website Super Mario World Central, which longtime viewers of the channel will recognize from some of my older videos. The website contains so many individual ROM hacks, tools, services, forums, and users connecting, discussing, and creating said hacks that it became the ultimate source of knowledge for the game and its community. Potentially the most famous example of a hack from this website is the infamous game that inspired a creepypasta to be written back in the early 2010s. The creator, anonymous to most people outside of specific circles inside the website, was able to use his impressive knowledge of the game to craft not only a creepy atmospheric game, but several games, all of which connected to an ARG or alternate reality game that invited players to look deeply into the game's files to figure out what was going on. You've probably seen this image here, an image found in the files of the game that no one can truly find the origins of until earlier this year, after nearly 15 years of no answers. The creepypasta, written later by a user named Adam on the website, helped tremendously to launch the game into cult classic status amongst ROM hacks. To many, this game proved that Mario ROM hacks could be much more than simple level modifications or palette swaps, and could potentially be something bigger, something that forces you to sleuth around and question absolutely everything. You can learn more about that hack from these videos I've made on the subject, as well as others who have done the same. Mario was made and spread around the early 2010s, which makes it a pretty ancient ROM hack by comparison. But fast forward to the year of 2016, the website was hosting a contest where people submit their hacks to judgment. Someone going by the name of Underway began to cryptically post messages in the threads, attaching screenshots and GIFs with strange names, but never really explaining them. Out of the blue, a ROM hack was posted on the 5th of January, simply called THE with an apostrophe. The ROM hack was created by the previously mentioned Underway, as well as users Medic and Torchkus. As I understand it, Underway was the primary writer for the game's story, Medic was the primary programmer, and Torchkus created a custom soundtrack, though I'm sure with such a small team, they were able to help each other out from time to time. The title was nondescript, the description was cryptic, and the screenshots were… strange, to say the least. It doesn't look too dissimilar to how the proper game looks, but something's missing. The map is empty. There's a strange fog that coats the forest of illusion. It seems unassuming and pedestrian on the surface, but the more we dig, the more macabre and haunting it all becomes. All that's left to do is to click the download button. One of the best horror experiences I've had is completely free, as long as you have an emulator. I'll leave a link to the description in the hack, as well as another video covering the ROM by longtime collaborator and sleuth KTB. Brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen, because we're going to take a very, very deep dive. There is absolutely no way you will understand anything without watching this video through until the end. So make sure you do that. Maybe even stick around to the channel to see more deep dives into strange and obscure video games. Now, a lot of people thought in my Urban Spook video, people actually thought I stole their IP addresses when I said they did. And I'm here to say that I was totally wrong to say that. And the reality of the situation is, I was right! <laughs> I still have your IP addresses! You'd better subscribe or else I'm signing you up for illicit websites. When you boot up the game on your emulator, you'll notice that the internal name is actually Coronation Day. As in, the date of a monarch being officially recognized as the formal ruler of a nation. What that actually means doesn't matter at the moment, but keep it in your back pocket. Instead of a title screen, we get a scene of small Mario standing alone in a misty forest, with a grainy, static-like sound playing. Again, appears on our screen. We aren't sure if this is Mario speaking or another character, though if you hold down the right shoulder button just before the text notification, it scrolls the screen, and we see a faceless, ominous Princess Peach just off to the side, silently observing Mario for unknown reasons. The static you hear is part of the custom soundtrack, and it's called exclamation point one dot SPC, SPC being the sound files for the Super Nintendo console. If we use a program called SBC 7000 Player, developed by Degrade Factory, we're able to open all of the audio files included in the separate release of the soundtrack. Curiously, we're given a couple new names to dig into. The title is Name Mmm, and the game tag is a jumbled sentence that means the world. Curiously, all of these tracks have been edited to be created on July 31st, 1992. 
probably means nothing. We can convert all of these files into dot waves, and opening this one on a spectrogram reveals a hidden message. Start anew where the light vanishes. Hold on to this, it will come up later. Before we even start playing the game, we're given several different avenues to explore how the game's story is told and the tools required to dig in deep. You will simply not understand what is going on without a deep dive in the game's internals, and even when you do, what's going on is so abstract and non-linear and perplexing that it intrigues you to look even further. No punches were pulled during this creation, and I feel obligated to highlight the exceptional amount of effort put into every bit of this ROM hack. So far, we just have Mario and Peach in some kind of hazy forest. We have someone speaking dialogue, though they are currently unknown. The music that plays directly ties into what might be going on, that Mario, the player, us, have to simply start again. This is the beating, fleshy heart of Coronation Day. Never does it settle for a simple, easy to understand explanation, not even for the names of its music tracks. The clues are all laid out, but intentionally muddled so we don't know what order to put them. This is a thinking man's story that requires a lot of ROM hacking knowledge to crack open, and potentially a degree in English to decipher all its complicated symbolism, themes, and motifs. But let's actually start playing the game, shall we? Mario is alone in this forest, with no way to switch levels. Whatever level you're on doesn't have a name, either. A haunting, droning track called Zero.SPC moans ominously and draws you into its somber melodies and dissonant strings, truly making it feel like the forest extends past the screen and has begun to permeate inside your home. The title is labeled Collection, but the game tag is a little harder to decipher. It likely translates to The Crawl. Before we even enter the level, there are still plenty more secrets to see on this map screen. We need to examine the ROM in Lunar Magic, the primary level editor used in ROM hacks, but also as a nifty feature of opening up said ROMs to explore the files. Once it's opened, we can spot some differences in the overworld. The same faceless Peach sprite is hovering above only our location, strongly implying that no matter where you move, you're always being watched. If we open the palette editor and turn off custom palettes, we're surrounded by text on all fronts. Don't you know hacking is a sin? Is a crystal clear message that the developers fully intended for people to crack open the game looking for clues, and that they're very aware of you doing so. He did not know. Witness and don't trust the voices don't really seem to make much sense without having played the game, so I want you to hold on to the text here. Perhaps write some of it down, but I especially need you to remember this sequence here. This looks like gibberish, and even knowing what it is in advance, it still kind of is. But without this cipher, we will not be able to fully understand what's going on in the world of Coronation Day. I hope this was enough setup, because we haven't even begun playing the game. But now, there's absolutely no turning back. The game starts, and we are alone in the forest. Mario is small, and his moveset is severely limited. He cannot run, and his jumps are short, which forces you to take your time and explore the location. There are no enemies, just mist surrounding the trees as you walk to the right, alone. Nothing but your jumps and the sound of rain and thunder, just drink in the atmosphere. The song playing is listed as number two, or the caller, or alternatively, the seller. Because of what happens later on, I think the seller is our ticket. The more you walk, the more you notice that you might not actually be alone. We see distant peaks at a shadowy figure flying past us, resembling the princess, but something is deeply wrong. There are bones picked clean of flesh, realistic looking bones, as in as real as Super Nintendo graphics can allow it to be, that is. They don't look like cartoon skeletons, this looks like the work of a wild animal on the loose. The music swells as we see the only enemy in the level devoured in front of our eyes and left as bones. As we walk, we are accosted by several message boxes, but with no clear speaker or anyone ever mentioned by name, it is a little difficult to interpret the series of events. I will read them as they come up by section. 
Something unique about the game is that the text is pulled from a pool and several different messages can appear in the same area with the same trigger, which encourages you to play the game multiple times. Each spot has a specific pool it pulls from, but I'll combine each section in the level for convenience. Leave this to me. Bring me back up. Well, honey, he pulled the plug. Have you heard the good news? They made it all from scratch. Please stop. I can't breathe. Please leave. I won't mind. Is that him behind the- You really are a shadow of what you were back then. Well, every good thing has to end. I asked about it, but he didn't hear me. Ha, I'll be fine. I would check if he lost them, but his hair covers everything. They told me all about you. Bring me back up. Where did all of them go? He came way before you. This place is his home. The place they- Everything is fine. Oh, that look is precious. You'll make it big for sure. It will be tough, but you will get your second chance. Most of these passages don't make much sense, but the recurring he is mentioned in bold letters and in red. Could this refer to Mario? He's Italian, so likely quite hairy. I'll explain some of these further on, but we've got something of a wall on our progress. A black void lies past this point, like reality around it has collapsed. Once you enter, we can't turn back. Text follows us, which implies the text is visible from Mario's perspective, because it isn't a dialogue box. I believe I am the god of this forest. Are you looking for me? I am the one that- Again? We're beginning to see what's going on. Something calling itself a god, a god of the forest, Mario's inside tormenting him, and potentially behind the island, a far cry from what Mario is used to. The lack of enemies, likely whatever happened to Peach, if that is her, mind you. Just take a look at what happened to the world. The distorted graphics and textures are crudely butchered on screen with no bones and blood fly freely through the air, all while this monstrous, hideous Peach writhes and chases you all throughout this jumbled hellscape. The horrifying track that blares at you is called 111.SPC, or The Ladder. It really amplifies how horrifying of a scenario you're in. Mario can only slowly walk and avoid Peach and her little head clones. Him is displayed in flashing text all around you. The game has been so deluded of a proper Mario experience that a platforming challenge feels alien and frightening. I must empathize the challenge part, because it's quite hard to dodge Peach because you move so slowly and can't see anything and don't know what pattern she's moving in. Her patterns are about as predictable as Marasmus appearing at Ghost Fort. If any of them come even a pixel of contact with you, it's bad news. So we have to avoid her until we reach this pit we can safely escape from her. Any semblance of reality and sanity is broken down as we walk like a shadow through the valley of broken graphics. If you remove the layer 2 graphics of this section, the words drown her are visible. We have more dialogue to cycle through. Get in the bag. Don't you dare touch my prey. Thank you. Here I lay. You bow to me, crook. Stay away from. Is that really me? What color is your favorite? Welcome to my forest. My lungs hurt. Please take them out. My throat is all closed up. Won't you please cut it open for me? I am the true king. We're thrown into a flashback sequence, made obvious by the mid-2000s FPS yellow filter over everything. We play as Princess Peach on her own, exploring the same forest as Mario before she came... uh, that. There are actual enemies this time around, and you can take them out. We're accosted with more cryptic dialogue, depending on our actions. Please help me. I can't stop cutting! You smell so red. What did you do? Bring me your lungs. The crop this year was horrendous. Except for you. Crown her. Oh yes. Now's the time. Go back and show them who you really are. If you don't squash all the enemies, you're outright told that they want all of them. But you're free not to do so. 
Once we continue, we finally figure out Peach's fate. The original music in the track was called The Death, which serves as a not very subtle hint as to what's happening, but the track switch that happens once you start stomping on enemies is called The Beginning, and should sound eerily familiar. Take a listen. Interesting. You really had no idea, did you? You built it. And after that, you... Tried. Again? We return playing as Mario, but the forest has become coated in red mist, an ominous sign of the mysterious him. As we walk, we get some more text. Hey honey, come over here for a minute. What do you think? Isn't that color a little harsh now? No. He loves red. The game cuts to black, and we get our ending of the game. Press the right shoulder button for another secret. This is Coronation Day, the ultimate, most disturbing Mario game and ROM hack ever created. It's hard to find a starting point to explain how this hack has absolute mastery over tone and atmosphere, but let me start with the visuals. The game is proud of its origin as something to come out of a ROM hacking contest, and its developers let their talent shine by sublime usage of proper level constructions with well-paced textures and graphics demonstrating absolute understanding of the game's files and lunar magic. Often these type of horror hacks, or .exe style games if you're familiar with the Sonic community, are you just walking into the right with Game Maker with interesting level design. The authentic level design and platforming is used intelligently to make you feel like you're playing a warped, cursed copy of Mario World, which works wonders for immersion. The custom assets are something to behold as well. The corridors of graphical murder and mutilated bodies seen all throughout the game are genuinely terrifying to see the first time around. Even more so impressive that the art matches so close to the original art style. The distinct differences between the classic Mario sprites and environments with the violence and corpses strewn about renders such a primal feeling of hopelessness. Like an object of affection from your childhood being exposed to the unforgiving morbid reality. Being inside a spooky forest doesn't sound super engaging when you're told about it, and it doesn't look too scary when you're first playing, but every time you must re-enter this area, you feel more and more like you're being watched and recorded, like a hunter ready to shoot you in the neck for his supper. Put yourself in Mario's shoes. You can't fight back, you can't run very far, and you can't leave. Have you ever felt like this before in your life? felt like an animal being hunted. <sighs> the music really helps tie everything together. Some tracks are demented, warped versions of classics, while others are entirely custom composed, but none of them feel out of place. The soft ambience of being alone in a forest and the pulse-pounding desperation of being chased by a possessed friend are matched with equally fitting tones and keys that tie the whole experience together. Ambience is something I find especially noteworthy because the Super Nintendo is when music and video games began to hold melodies and become more complicated and memorable. And I think a lot of people yearned for a time when music sounded like this, where the limitations were just wide enough that one could flourish but just claustrophobic enough where innovation and clever tactics had to be employed to succeed. Above all else, the story is what deserves so much praise. It manages to strike a formidable balance between feeling like a traditional Mario story set in the same world, but introducing clashing elements of horror, violence, cannibalism, cult activity, and mind-bending monsters and ghostly locations that make you forget exactly what game you're playing and how to play it which tears away any comfort or confidence a player might have in their abilities to play the game. You can't fight this threat, 
You're merely a pawn in whatever insidious game it has planned for you. The dialogue we're given is the only way to understand the game. It's cryptic and nonsensical and awful to behold in the belittling sense, but we can begin to make sense of what's going on. Mario and Peach were together in some kind of forest. Peach was on her own when someone, or perhaps multiple people, or something, was using her in some kind of ritual. The Shadow Peach and having to fall into the pit can only mean so many things, but from the sounds of it, she's been sacrificed to someone called him. Some kind of king or entity that inhabits the forest. The specific comments about the crop being terrible this year except for her implies that this him figure couldn't get any worthy people to sacrifice except for her. Peach's body seems to have been taken over by this monster, which would explain the horrible state it's in, as well as her new supernatural powers. The monster inside her has taken full control and is tormenting Mario by watching him through all possible angles and directly chasing him out after and trying to potentially eat him, but Mario is often able to evade. We must address the elephant in the room. Who is him? We don't really see him, but clearly, he is a horrible, vicious monster that calls itself the god of the forest Mario and Peach entered. He has some kind of power or dominion over reality, potentially limited to just the forest, but still strong enough to warp it all around, and potentially manipulate time. Seeing again every time we start the game could be hinting at kind of time loop Mario is stuck in while this king, him, addressed in all bold red text, resets the clock to torment Mario. That might be a lot to take in all at once, but have faith in me when I say it only gets more complicated and darker as we progress. Because I haven't been entirely truthful with you. When I said ending, I was only technically correct. But this is just one ending. We have several more to explore in any order we choose. For now, let me take you back to the section where you play as Peach. Recall the message telling you to go back to show them who you really are? Backtrack and press the select button on a bridge and we become Mario. Notice that we much larger, underwater, and building some kind of house. Before you start, you have to pull up the weeds. Oh yes, that's it. Now gather wood for the walls. Oh yes, just a little bit more for the roof. Oh god, yes! Amazing work! They love it. The game freezes from here, and we've reached another ending. All it's added so far is that we're given a scene of Mario building a house, but the mysterious they are aware of him doing so. Who they are is best left a mystery until later. Let's rewind a bit further. Let's go back to being chased by the possessed Peach. What happens if you're caught by her? The game resets and we're transported back to the forest, but it seems like winter has come early. The water is frozen over, there's a blue tint over everything, and faint snowflakes are in the air. Combined with the somber music, it feels just a bit comforting, like we're given a small relief from the consistent torment and allowed to take in nature. Don't get too comfortable though. A green peach is seen just to our left under a frozen body of water, for some reason. Continuing. The land becomes dark, and we start to see other Marios popping in and out of existence, except for this one, which seems to be negative space with the word I'm above. Running past that for now, we see more Marios and a bloody door up on a hill we can enter. The underwater cabin from the previous ending has returned, and we see the spashed, mangled corpse of Mario on the floor. Recall how the previous endings had Mario fall through the roof of his house, which implies that after the screen was cut, Mario was victim to gravity and died on impact from the floor. Entering the door, we get to walk underwater and listen to a track called The Dark. We get some more dialogue spoken from an unclear source. Oh god, who is this guy? I tried yelling at him so he would go away, but my voice was gone. We see a ghostly Mario above. Now he's just staring at me through the window above and… The game resets and sends us back to the very beginning, to the non-frozen forest. With each ending so far, we're unlocking more and more details, however scant they may be, of what happened and what's going on. 
Mario was responsible for building a house, which may have been his final resting place if that corpse was truly his. The ghost of Mario above might imply that it was Mario standing through the window, but whoever saw him likely wasn't Peach, because she should have recognized him, so perhaps it was someone else entirely? I think that conversation was between Mario and Peach, but who did they see? I'll reveal part of my hand and say that I think the they and them figures denoted in bold blue text throughout the game are cultists who worship the king. They're always mentioned in relation to his goals, and some kind of dialogue I believe to be the king's refers to other people, likely his followers. This would explain Peach's fate, as a sacrifice, likely drowned, carried out by this cult in the name of the king. It's curious the game resets, like it's telling us to keep replaying again and again to find other clues. I kept getting the Frozen ending, but I was stuck and couldn't find more details. When I kept playing the game, I couldn't help but notice every time I passed a certain area in the Frozen Forest, the light would dim dramatically. Dim? Like the light was... vanishing? It's here where I remembered the spectrogram image from the sound that plays when you restart the game. The light vanishing part makes sense, but what does start anew entail? I replayed the game again and again, thinking I needed to reset the game at a specific spot, but then it hit me like a brick in the back of the head. Start anew. Start. The start button. Oh. I played the game again and looked for every part where the light would dim in the level and started mashing the start button. What you need to do is go to the winter forest section. Notice how much darker it becomes once you pass this bridge. If you press the start button, Mario will fall through, but you'll start from the beginning again. Now, remember the shadow, Mario? If we line up the sprite perfectly, it reads, The heart. I'm the heart. Go back to the bridge, break it, and... We're stuck. Mario has found his way into a realm of darkness, fire, brimstone, and isolation from God. Mario has entered hell, and there's no escaping. Try as you might, there's no escape from this area, because Mario has died and been cast into eternal damnation. The trumpets are likely being blown from angels from above, but they sound warped and horrifying to the wicked who have been cast into eternal darkness. The sound file might look like gibberish numbers, but it's actually decimal code that translates into hell, with the tag, the rage. To eliminate all doubt where you are, we have a lot of dialogue down here to cover. The dragon can't think, it can only act. The cat was only mad when we first met, and after that I had forgot we had met at all. Poor cat. Its shadow towered in the light, horns larger than its head. Sounds that weren't from this time, what a staggering sight. The cat tried to save me, for it kept taking the fish away. The fish that poisoned me. The text is almost definitely Mario's inner thoughts as he's stuck in hell, completely alone. Whatever words he may speak defined by the trumpets of angels celebrating Christ gathering the faithful to be at his seat in heaven with God. It feels disturbing to see such a clear-cut reference to real-world religion, traditions, and beliefs in a fantasy land like Nintendo. Kind of like a C.S. Lewis wrote Mario. Something about the revelation of Mario being the heart, something I will explain later, and the bridge breaking caused him to go to hell. Or at least played a part in it. If you try and reset the game, Mario is still stuck and unable to leave. You can't escape from this area. The only way to leave is to either have a save state in your emulator, or by deleting the save file altogether, essentially erasing the reality of the game world to start over. Mario is forever stuck in hell, and we can't do anything to help. Unless... Curiously, there is one piece of dialogue that is always displayed no matter how many times. The answer lies on the collection of worlds. It simply goes from front to back. Collection of worlds? Front to back? At first, I believe this to simply be an explanation for the again text, implying that each time you see it is some kind of different reality or universe, which has more of an implications for the breach of the king's powers, but stay with me on this one. 
We know the in game hints can be a little cheeky with wordplay from the spectrogram image. Breaking the paragraph down, what does it all mean? The collection of worlds is talking about the overworld, where Mario travels to each level and world. We can't see it normally, so we must return to the start of the video where I mentioned all those words and numbers on the overworld by opening the game in Lunar Magic. This series of numbers right here. It looks like chicken scratch, but remember what the text box said. It goes from front to back. If we read it front to back and left to right, we get O P E N space D. The second line, O O R space, open door. The rest of the numbers seem like gibberish, but are actually decimal numbers that translates into nothing. But if you convert that decimal code to hexadecimal, then convert the hexadecimal to plain text, we finally get a phrase. Yield all upper xanthic bodies left behind rotten anthropy. This sentence is a jumbled mess with no real meaning. But don't forget about the code cracking method, front to back. Read each first letter in each word. Y, A, up, X, B, left, B, right, A. The Y button, A button, up on the D-pad, X button, B button, left on the D-pad, B button, right on the D-pad, and A button. These all correlate to the Super Nintendo controller layout. Now we just need to find a place to input the code. Hell seems like a good start. We're teleported to a completely white void. July 31st, 1992. The same date is listed on all the music tags. I am truly impressed by their detective skills. The evidence bestows me. This must be what it feels like to be king. And I did not need his help. Where you is he, I am the king, for he is not you. Feast upon the flowering organs, for he is king. The king, the god of the forest, is addressing us. Even though Mario seems to have found a way out of hell, the king seems aware that we figured out how to help him, and through incorporating and implicating ourselves on this fable, we have a target on our backs. Even the music signifies what's really going on. This droning static noise is decimal code that translates to six, end. Oh. The open-ended nature of the title invites us to question what's going on even further. It's very nebulous, but the recurring date of July 31st, 1992 is incredibly important. It's the date listed on the music, likely the day that keeps repeating in the forest, the coronation day where the king was crowned and his reign of terror has begun. But there's still one more ending. If you stay still during the very beginning of the game, you get a unique scenario. Someone berates Mario, or the player, for refusing to play, and the game freezes. These are all the official endings of Coronation Day. We're finally getting to see the bigger picture, what's truly going on in the story, revealed in magnificently strange and unique ways. Creepypasta games often lack subtlety because of the largely young developers creating the games, but the experience of the developer trio here runs circles around how most people try and communicate their stories regardless of how esoteric everything is. The deliberate contrast between the fantasy of Super Mario and the real threat of demonic possession, eternal damnation, and the machinations of storytelling mechanics like a potential time loop used as a vehicle that can only be communicated in the realm of video games ties a wonderful bow around the entire experience, something we are graciously allowed to experience for free because of this nature as a ROM hack of a very old game. It's a powerful example of the limitless creativity people can produce within a confined environment. There's only so many things that could be altered and changed about Mario World's code, so seeing the results and how they went from creating is just as interesting as the game's events themselves. On the topic of code alteration, there is one more thing I feel I should mention. I found this out only from the comments section of the ROM hacks page on SNW Central. Opening Looter Magic one more time, we have to set the starting level at the 15 value. When we do that...
The forest is coated in red mist. Mario's head is upside down, and enemies have been changed to resemble human hearts and other organs, as well as more mutilated versions of Peach. Our last bits of dialogue not found elsewhere in the game are left for us to interpret. That you need. Take it. Pillage my carcass. Oh my god, yes! Rip it out, I beg you! Oh, it's coming out! Oh my god, yes! It's... Wait, did it fall? The game crashes. There is a way to avoid this crash if you scroll the screen to the left and sneak your way into the pit, which leads to Mario falling on himself from the house ending. The entire level was deliberately not included and could only be accessed by modifying the game, so this part might be a glitch in something that's already not canonical. But look at the state of Peach, horns larger than her head, enlarged, looking depraved beyond all belief, and butchered past recognition. The king has fully embraced his vessel and taken complete control of her body, turning it into a disgusting mockery of what it once was. Coronation Day has a plethora of secrets in the game proper and in the game's files. I haven't exposed all of them because I want to dangle some interest for everyone to play this game on their own time, because it's worth doing, even so if I've showed the entire story. There are other oddities, like if you use a cheat code to play as Luigi, he appears quite shadowy on the level select screen. Here's what the special bonus level looks like. There is more to uncover through snooping around, but I'll cut it off here because there's something incredibly important I need to explain. We have all the key pieces of the story on the table, but naturally, given its ambiguous nature, the exact order of events and structure is hard to decipher, and to this day, ever since it released in 2016, there's no official answer. The developers have stayed relatively quiet about the meaning of everything, only breaking a silence to mention that the Pink Forest level is an unfinished asset, and that there was apparently more they were considering to include, but chose not to for the sake of time and brevity. With no whispers of a sequel, it seems we're entirely on our own to put the pieces in the correct order. How many other games would require you to do that? To play detective with all the dialogue to even understand what's going on? For any other game, this sounds like a pretty tedious chore that would kill anyone's interest. But to see every ending, you can get that done in under an hour. It's easy to forget how long this game is because of the length of this video, but the game's very short, so asking someone to piece everything together here is a much tamer ask. Given that the game is so dialogue heavy, figuring out who is speaking and who they are referring to is crucial. I'll be covering every single piece of dialogue, determining who is speaking with the context clues and referring whom they are speaking about. This is going to be a doozy, so bear with me and be patient. I'll introduce more context as required. Let's start with the beginning area with Mario. Leave this to me. This line is extremely ambiguous. It could just mean about anything, but I'm putting all my chips on this line being spoken by Mario to Peach. Let me explain. Mario and Peach are never seen together before her possession. Peach walks alone, and Mario builds the wood cabin without her, and this line is something Mario says to Peach, confident in his ability to build the house. There are more lines suggesting this might have been what played out. The house represents something greater in terms of the king's rituals, as you'll see later. Well, honey, he pulled the plug. This one's a lot more cut and dry. The specific usage of honey and the pronoun he only means one thing. Peach is speaking to Mario and referring to the king who she is now aware of, while he stopped doing something. Since they're not in the Mushroom Kingdom anymore and have moved into a secluded forest, it's highly implied the two got together, which makes the situation a lot more tragic. Mario seeing his wife possessed by a monster. What the plug being pulled in this situation is questionable, but I think what it means is that Peach, either aware of the king's presence or after she was possessed and just momentarily hiding it. Bring me back up. 
This could be anyone's line. My game theory is that this is also Peach speaking during or after her organs were harvested for her sacrifice. Have you heard the good news? Another incredibly nondescript line. I can only assume the good news is something relating to the king. Either he gets to eat people, or he has begun his reign of terror through Peach's body. I'll use this text to introduce something I've been holding onto. I believe there's a character I've yet to mention until now, who is much more aware of the cult's proceedings and the true nature of the forest, which allows him to act as something as a narrator who can speak freely, and I've elected to call him The Witness, based off the text hidden on the world map. I'll explain more about him when I explain which texts I believe he's saying and why. I kind of like to think he looks like a lunar cultist from Terraria. They made it all from scratch. This connects quite neatly with the first bit of dialogue, explaining that they, whom I believe be worshippers or cultists of the king, have created something, either referring to the ritual they've prepared or the forest itself. Or, most interestingly, perhaps they've made the king himself, somehow, if he's some kind of mechanical creature. Please stop. I can't breathe. This is either Peach complaining about being unable to breathe when her organs are being taken out, or this is Mario, cracking under the pressure of having to run away forever in this forest. Please leave. I won't mind. This could be almost anyone. Either Mario or Peach could say this in any context before the possession happens, or it could be the witness talking to either or, or it's not very clear and doesn't forward our understanding past what we already know and can at least assume. Is that him behind the- Best guess this is either Peach or the witness seeing the King of the Forest approaching. Interestingly, the censored bit isn't concealing anything, in Lunar Magic, it's entirely unreadable. There are several times where something is mentioned, but blurred out for unknown reasons. It could be an object, or person, anything really, but has to have some deep connections to the king because we know that his mere presence seeps into reality, things tend to become corrupted and scratchy. You really are a shadow of what you were back then. Well, every good thing has to end. The you in question is almost certainly Mario seeing as his normal gameplay abilities have been severely neutered, making him a shadow of what he could once do. If Peach is speaking, she could be insulting him before the possession during the fight that caused them to leave temporarily, or afterwards as a cruel mark from the king. If it's the witness speaking, then it's likely when he met Mario much later, which I will explain with further dialogue. I asked about it, but he didn't hear me. I think this comes from the Witness, who I believe to have connections and contact with the cult, if not directly a part of it in some sense. I could explain his knowledge of the game's events, his ability to be so close to the king and speak directly with him, or at least try to. What the Witness asked about can either be the house Mario built, about Peach and Mario themselves, their sacrifice plans, basically anything referring to the king. Ha, huh, I'll be fine. This I want to say comes from Peach. When she goes out on her walk, there are still enemies on the island at this time, so she reassures Mario she can handle herself, which is really dramatically ironic because she can't. I would check if he lost them, but his hair covers everything. This likely comes from the witness questioning something about the king, potentially speaking to other cultists. Them might refer to other sacrifices, or potentially Mario and Peach temporarily evading capture. The hair is interesting because the king didn't have a lot of hair when he was possessing Peach that wasn't already on her head. Maybe he shaved? I would still find it funny if he was talking about Mario's body hair hiding something for some reason. Leave this to me. This could mean absolutely anything. Perhaps Mario said that to Peach when he said he could build the cabin by himself? It's a little bit too nebulous, anyone could have said this for any reason. They told me all about you. I don't think this is the king speaking, because it sounds a little too coherent for the simple-minded god, but the witness could make a good candidate. The other cultists might have told him about the new prey in the forest, which also means that the witness might be in contact with Mario at some point. Where did all of them go? This could either refer to the lack of enemies in the area, which either Mario or Peach could say in the beginning, or the witness saying something about the other cultists who might have potentially left when things went sour after possession. It would make sense that we don't see any of them in the game for this reason. He came way before you. This is his home. The place they- Witness dialogue, explaining to Mario that they unintentionally intruded on the king's territory, who claims lordship over the area. 
they referring to the cultists, and the blanked out word likely meaning built or created or some other term that implies at this place of worship or at least where they were involved. He came way before doesn't give us a tremendous range of when the king was created or born or grown or whatever, but we do know that he is very, very old. Everything is fine. This must be Peach reassuring Mario that she's okay after the sacrifice, while the king is pretending to be her without changing her appearance too much. Oh, that look is precious. You'll make it big for sure. This is either the witness or possessed Peach seeing Mario's horrified facial expressions when he's being chased down. What make it big can depend on who's speaking. If it's Peach, making it big could mean, could mean a good sacrifice. While if it's the witness, making it big might be the opposite. It could be making it out alive and potentially stopping the king in his tracks. And I'll explain with the final text box in this section. It will be tough, but you will get your second chance. This one had me scratching my head for a while. The second chance likely doesn't refer to Peach because she seems kind of busy being a meat puppet for a god, plus some drama about the ritual I'll explain later, but what about Mario? The words must come from the witness, but the how and why are still up in the air. If he's close enough to the cult to understand how the king works to an extent, why does he want Mario to succeed? Is he somehow aware of the tribulations Mario must go through to get that second chance? Is he somehow aware of Mario going to hell at some point? You're able to escape hell by entering the secret code, so was this what he was referring to? Does he want Mario to use the second chance to somehow impede or defeat the king? Who really is the witness? Maybe he isn't a cultist. He speaks of redemption with so much conviction and certainty that he might be able to see past some kind of time loop shenanigans the king can do on earth, so maybe he's an angel. There's a lot of biblical references in the story, so is it too far-fetched to suggest that Mario has a guardian angel sent by God to stop this world-ending monster? And what does that mean for who the king is? Mario still went to hell, maybe because he got which might be a sin in the traditional sense, but if he did it because he was aware of a commandment of an angel, then his stay was fated to be temporary, because his mortal body died a martyr, and perhaps he can move on to the spiritual realm to continue the fight against the king. Let's move on to another section, the part where Peach chases Mario through the glitchy area, and when Mario is walking alone in the corridor. Fortunately, we can divide all the dialogue into two neat categories because I believe there are only two characters speaking, Peach and the king. Don't you dare touch my prey. Obviously, the king speaking. He really wants Mario for a sacrifice, or potentially something even greater. The you is a bit ambiguous, either what remains of Peach's mind, or potentially he's aware of the witness's plans somewhat. You bow to me, crook. More king dialogue, demanding to be worshipped. Him calling Mario a crook is interesting. If Mario and Peach are married, would that make Mario the Mushroom Kingdom's king? Perhaps he's jealous of Mario's status, or he's aware of his heroic nature and sees him as natural opposition. Thank you. This one, I think, is Peach, thanking someone for ending all the pain and suffering during her body being taken over. Stay away from. The sentence is cut off, but we all know it's the king demanding someone, either Peach or the witness, to keep their hands off Mario. There is another interesting theory though, that this is Peach during a rare moment of awareness trying to vie for control so that Mario doesn't fall victim to the king. Is that really me? This one is upsetting. I see this as no one else other than Peach, somehow aware of what her body has become and seeing the actions of the king through her former eyes, tormenting Mario. It has to be a disgusting, horrible fate to see your own body devour people you once cherished because you were spiritually unarmed. What color is your favorite? King dialogue. He's likely asking Peach what color her favorite is, and might be delighted to hear that it may indeed be red, his favorite color. Which would be very funny to consider if this was his breaking point where he decided to take her as his vessel, just because she liked a color. Welcome to my forest. Self-explanatory. The king is feeling proud of his domain and welcomes Mario to try and eat him. My lungs hurt. Please take them out. This is Peach, just moments before she was possessed, pleading for an end to the pain, letting herself be taken by the king and his cult. My throat is all closed up. Won't you please cut it open for me? This very graphic line should be belonging to a suffering Peach, and seems a bit sarcastic, 
like she's taunting the cult to sacrifice her faster. Unless she's already possessed, then the cult would probably love for her to be cut open. I am the true king. The Demon King is quite insecure about anyone else claiming royalty, which might lend to some credence to the theory that Mario and Peach being married. He doesn't call himself a queen or a princess, so he wouldn't be jealous of Peach, but if she's married to Mario, then him being the king would greatly upset him. That's one version of events, but it could go even deeper than that. He might not detest Mario as lord and king, but instead try and rebuke the name of Jesus Christ the Messiah, who is off called Lord of Lord and King of Kings. Demons know exactly who Jesus is and detest him for it, because he has dominion over them, and they know they will be cast into the hellfire. Trying to deny Jesus' divinity might be a way to try and corrupt Mario. Let's take a look at the dialogue when you play as Peach. Please help me, I can't stop cutting. Peach has been caught by the trap the king laid and is struggling for control over her own body. Bring me your lungs. A commandment from the king for Peach's lungs to be given to him so that he may feast on the flowering organs. Oh yes, now is the time. Go back and show them who you really are. This one was tricky. It happens after you squash all the enemies, which is being used in this context as a representation of Peach's character. Like someone who likes to step on others? Or perhaps defile nature in a way by attacking wildlife or something like that. It seems a little too intelligent for the king to say, perhaps. Maybe it's from the witness? Who saw the true contents of Peach's soul and let her freely choose to fall. But the theory does assume that Peach is not a very good person, not deserving of redemption. The crop this year was horrendous, except for you. The king says that Peach is the only worthy candidate, presumably for sacrifice and possession. What makes her worthy isn't known, but if it isn't the contents of her soul I mentioned previously, then it might not entirely matter. Whatever it is, it worked. I see you are trying a little bit, but they want all of them. This comes up when you don't stomp on all the enemies. I think this is coming from the witness, who might be coaxing Peach to do so? There's a question of how aware everyone is in this scenario, how aware Peach is of the cult and the king. The last couple dialogue boxes are interesting. I believe this to be the witness speaking to Mario. You built it can only refer to so many things, so perhaps it meant the cabin being built, which had some kind of adverse effect on the island, possibly alerting the cultists to their presence, while the witness chastises Mario. Interesting to note that tried is the last bit of dialogue. Is it cut off from something? Is the full sentence tried again when the game resets itself? Did Mario try and do something afterwards? Tried to stop what was happening? The ending where Mario stares at the pool of blood likely contains a conversation between himself and Peach. The two likely met up after she wandered off and got possessed, but she kept it hidden for now. Mario asks Peach for advice on how the cabin looks, and Peach assures him that he loves red, referring to the king's favorite color. Mario has no idea who the king is by this point, but it serves as a deadly prelude to the game's events. Mario building the cabin is interesting. Someone is speaking to him and guiding him through the process, either the witness or another cultist. Mario is large and the cabin is still being built, so it's likely our first event in the game chronologically. Why the witness would do this is unknown. Maybe for temptation? Was Peach corrupted even further back? I've already spoken about the Ghost Mario dialogue, so we'll skip that. What I can do is start here. Remember the shadow. I'm the heart. If we take that literally, as in Mario is the heart, what does that mean? I believe it means that Mario is the heart. The heart the king needs. The king devours organs all the time. So him needing a heart, possibly a pure heart for Mario, might be the last thing stopping him from escaping and enacting his devilish plan, which might be to spread more chaos and have people worship his idols until the Day of Judgment. Speaking of, let's go to hell and see how that looks. Most of the paragraphs given to us are descriptions of the king, almost definitely coming from Mario's internal thoughts. He calls him the dragon, calls him simple-minded, and notes that his horns are larger than his head, which we see in the pink forest section. The cat being mentioned is strange. We never see a cat in the game, that I know of at least, 
So maybe this is extra backstory? The cat seems to warn that the fish were corrupted, taking on some kind of role of someone looking out for him. Could this be the witness in some kind of disguise, or a metaphor? Or it could be just a random cat that knew the vibes were off. I know the Pink Forest might not be entirely canon, but since it's in the game, I want to talk about it. We know it is Peach slash the King talking about the organs, but what exactly fell in this context? We don't see anything fall, other than Mario. My theory is that Mario, the heart of the king, fell and escaped his grasp and prevented him from reaching his full power, which explains why he must keep chasing Mario. Mario fell, and there's some kind of ambiguous time loop where the king keeps trying to catch him, but can't. Maybe Mario falling through the bridge was deliberate, so he could never properly retrieve him, but Mario still damned himself to hell, at least temporarily. Finally, we have the text in the white void. This seemed to be from the king himself, but what sets me off and honestly makes me a little uncomfortable is that he's aware of someone peering into the game itself. Like he's breaking the fourth wall and speaking to us, the player. Maybe he's bluffing, but the king says he didn't need his help, either referring to Mario as the heart, or us, the player. He didn't need us snooping around in the files to escape, but he did anyways. The lines of for he is you and others referencing awareness of us can only imply so many things. We can't forget about the infamous date, July 31st, 1992. What could this possibly mean? Now that we have everything, or just about everything, let's start putting everything together. Mario and Peach got married some time ago. While the royal wedding would happen, Mario would be crowned king and Peach would be queen. They decide to retire and move in together somewhere far away, presumably letting a vassal or an heir rule for them. They decide to build a house there, with Mario in charge of the construction. The two get into some kind of alteration, or at least want some space from each other. Mario's building seems to get the attention of someone, or something, which influences him to build it. Peach thinks it's strange that most of the enemies have vanished from the island, but she takes care of the few ones that remain. Little does she know, she's being monitored by a cult, in worship of a primordial, demonic entity known as the God of the Forest, or the King. She's led into the ritual and used as a sacrifice, her body and mind becoming the new vessel for the King. Meanwhile, back at the house, Mario keeps seeing a strange cat that warns him of it its own way by taking the fish away he tries to catch. The fish that have become corrupted by the king, whom he still doesn't know about. Peach returns once more and Mario has finished building the house, but her mental state has quickly deteriorated. She exhibits more and more monstrous behavior until Mario begins to take notice, but it might be too late. The king rallies its cult and pursues Mario, trying to use him to become the king's heart, until something goes wrong. Mario falls out of the way. Either he escapes on his own, or the cat, better known as The Witness, a spiritual entity who has been watching him all this time, has bigger plans for him, and he escapes. Remember in the pink forest where Mario falls inside of his own cabin, and recall the smushed Mario corpse. I believe that he died the first time the king failed to obtain him, but Mario came back once either the king or The Witness reversed time. Mario, through a time loop, keeps evading the king, with the eponymous, again, text appearing each time, which I posit to come from the witness, who continually monitors Mario, and assures him by telling him that despite his troubles, there will be a second chance. An aim for redemption and potentially a way to beat the king. It won't be easy, he'll have to take his own life to escape. He's temporarily stuck in hell which means that Jesus has come to Earth and all the demons and sinners are cast into the fiery pits. But Mario is alone with his own thoughts. Something may have gone wrong, so based on the otherworldly information, we, the player potentially acting as God, are able to let Mario know there is a way out of hell. By inputting the secret code, there's an escape, but it comes with a cost. The king seems to have found a way out. Time is supposed to have ended what with the world ending, but the life after death seems to have a place for Mario. But what we're allowed to see ends here, and the game is brought to a close. There's nothing more for us to do. 
That's how I interpret it, at least. There's no actual, official canon explanation for anything that happens, so feel free to make up your own chain of events. Still, how many other games do that? I was able to come up with so much detail based on just text and piecing everything together. I might have some unique interpretations of said text, but so do others. I'm not the only one to come up with a grand sweeping theory on what's actually going on. Someone has to, because this game hasn't been explained not even almost eight years after release. I highly recommend you play this game on your own and you come up with your own theories down below. There's some stuff I intentionally left out, but there might be things I failed to notice because of how detail-rich the game is. Even if this is all true, and what I've described is accurate even remotely, there are still two big elephants in the room. The King and the July Date. Let's start with the King. Demonic. Monstrous. Primordial. All of these words describe the King to a T. He is simple-minded, ferocious, prideful, and spiteful. He won't accept anything past absolute obedience, and even when you do, he's still got an active date with Doomsday. It's no surprise that he shares many demonic qualities with biblical devils, but what if I told you he has many qualities that actually resemble THE devil himself? I really have a devil-focused channel lately, don't I? But he shares more qualities than you'd think, you see. He's something of a tempter, leading people to commit sins in his name. He tries to deny the divinity of Christ. His depiction as a dragon specifically calls back to the Book of Revelations where he is given the same description. Possession is an extremely common thing for demons to do, and we see that center stage for the main belly of conflict in the story. I would be remiss to mention the specific way of worshipping him. He demands that his domain not be trespassed, he likes to devour human flesh, and is very connected to nature. There are just as many signs of him being an ancient pagan god as a modern demon. Consider this. Many beings considered demons or otherwise evil spirits in Abrahamic religions were once beings of worship for other cultures. Take Beelzebub, the Lord of the Flies. He was once Baal, a god of the Canaanites. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's another topic for another day. His forced association and pagan worship rituals remind me a great deal of several Celtic deities who haven't been worshipped in over a thousand years. Do we truly know the name of this being? If he is the devil, then we know him by Satan, but if he's from an ancient forgotten religion, then perhaps we should call him Kernanos. I have no idea how to actually pronounce that name. No members of that culture are left alive to correct me, so I don't care. That word, he is literally named after the word horn, which fits a description of the dragon pretty well. He's associated with serpents, which should need no explanation to explain that comparison. Though understandings of his god is muddled because the only written records of him are in the writings of later Christian scribes, or neo-pagans just making stuff up. So it's tough to separate truth from whatever nonsense Tumblr came up with 10 years ago. His worship is shrouded in mystery and only told us from the biased view of the Christian scribes, but perhaps this was considered by the game's developers. Maybe this character was shaped by the biased understanding these later authors had for older religions, becoming this otherworldly monster the developers could draw inspiration from. Regardless of his true identity, there is one thing that remains consistent. The world has ended, because hell has opened up and swallowed people whole. The king, or Satan, or Kernanos, seem to have evaded this fate for now, but if we're still on a biblical throughline, his days are still numbered. Revelations 12 verse 9 and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Mario was able to escape from hell alongside the devil, and mayhap he will be a powerful soldier in the fight against that devil and be the final boot that kicks him down to hell. But there's still one more burning question that hasn't been explained. The date. What is July 31st, 1992? I searched high and low for an answer, but nothing seemed to come up. What if we look deeper? It could mean... It means that the Hey Peter Patreon is officially launched and it's ready for action. Get your wallets ready, because even donating as little as a dollar a month makes me more money than watching all of my ads. Subscribe and get exclusive videos like the original Dark Rive video that was too saucy for YouTube. 
get sneak peeks at what videos I'm making next, maybe even early access videos? Untold treasures are ready to be bought on the Patreon, so let me grift and make you more money so I have more funds and time to create even bigger and better videos than ever. <clears throat> Sorry about that, I got something stuck in my throat. Anyways, I don't think July 31st, 1992 has any real significance in the real world, but is rather the date the game's events take place in. It's the day Peach was possessed and the king took over. It was his coronation day. It was the end. I do hope you've enjoyed my analysis of the most disturbing Mario game I've ever played. There are plenty of other creepy Mario games out there, but none quite like this one. This is some inspirational stuff. If I could draw and make music and program and have a work ethic and have some good ideas, I would love to make my own creepy ROM hack, but that's another journey for another day. This has been my favorite episode of Strange Gaming I've ever made. If you've enjoyed this, then this is what I specialize in, strange, weird, and obscure video games. You should stick around if you want more of that. And until next time, have a lovely rest of- Okay. I think I'm out of the woods for now. What's going on? Chances are, if you click on this video, you enjoy a lot of violence in media. Violence is just the natural escalation of physicality, which still stems from the beating vein of all storytelling, conflict. It appeals to our monkey brains to see violence on a thematic level for storytelling, and it's also something that reminds us of the general human experience. People get butchered all the time in real life, might as well make it line up with a character arc in fiction. It used to be a lot more of a controversial subject in media, but now it's so commercialized that television shows meant for 35-year-olds with the minds of 13-year-olds get to enjoy guilt-free. <laughs> Movies became pretty graphic and boundary-breaking sometime in the 70s, at least for popular culture, but video games, being a far more recent medium, weren't able to achieve such heights until the 90s, unless you count Custer's revenge on the Atari, which speaks for itself. Everyone knows about Doom and has heard of people moan on and on about Mortal Kombat, creating the ESRP, being dragged to Congress, and yada yada. Violence in video games is such a big topic and I don't want to read Wikipedia for an hour. Just think about all the most violent video game franchises. Manhunt, Postal, Splatterhouse, the list goes on. Many of these games take themselves seriously. Most of these games, at least. But did you ever stop to think, what if extreme hyperviolence was funny? And off the back of that question, what if hyperviolence against children and animals was funny? Oh, w w wait, not like that. Most violent video games just involve you killing people with a lot of blood and gore with mindless abandon. But how many choose to take that extra step and let you commit something particularly, especially devious? What if there was a game to let your child protagonist be put in the electric chair and be victim to all sorts of gruesome fates, and it was funny? What if you got to show little kids adult magazines as an easter egg? Not just funny, completely absurd, and so over the top that you don't know whether to gape your mouth in shock or laugh uproariously because of the swell of emotions you just went through in the course of 10 seconds. What if there was a game that featured shock and horror so much that it made its cult-like following debate amongst themselves the line the sand had to be drawn. We're talking about a game that had its creators beg to include a 90 study on the most violent video games ever made in a study done by a family psychologist. This is 1996's Harvester.
From the description I've given it, this sounds like a mid-90s shock jock project that Anthony Cumia would play for a laugh. But believe me, there's more substance than you think. It's a 90s computer point-and-click game with digitized actors. Anything is possible. And what Harvester chose to do was to tell an ultra-violent story meant both as a shameless indulgent of the medium, but also a somewhat thoughtful critique on the nature of violence in media and how that may affect general human behavior. Is there something deeper going on, or is this just urban spook style slop made to intentionally offend people and nothing more? How does it accomplish being debated to this very day, exactly? Most people can't tell you because most people haven't played it. The barrier to entry is steep. Point and clicks filter a lot of people, and the graphic nature of literally everything is another filter. Imagine trying to explain this to your mother in 96. What you playing, sport? I'm playing a game where I butcher slaughters cats for meat and feeds them to unsuspecting citizens! People know the name, but they don't know the game. If people know what I'm talking about, they either know the game from one of the various memes it's spawned over the years, or from the old Retsupre. If you have played this game, either the questionably functional Steam port or all the way back in 96, then cool. Most of us Zoomers have not, so I'm going to have to take us back to the past and reveal who and what was behind the most absurd and violent video game ever made. 1996, a year before $3 bill y'all was dropped by Limp Bizkit, so comparatively, it was the Dark Ages. 90s computer games were flourishing, especially with the point-and-click genre that allowed people to immerse themselves in fictional location in ways that role-playing games were previously inadequate to handle. Enter Future Vision, or DigiFX they renamed themselves to, or the development studio formerly known as Future Vision, whatever. They were a little company formed in 1991 based in the scariest place in all of Texas, Dallas. DigiFX made a couple games beforehand that are certainly games alright, but everything changed when Gilbert Austin pitched a new idea for the company with himself at the helm as writer-director, though he would end up doing a lot of the extra camera and coordination work himself. He was tepidly called the David Lynch of electronic games, which is hilarious, but I think I'll let him speak for himself through this magazine article interview. Quote, my feeling was that Future Vision, being a small company, would need something high concept to compete with the industry giants of the time, and I argued that Harvester was exactly that idea. It was really the only idea that I pitched. I remember that it came to me in a flash. That's how I got a lot of my ideas, in creative rushes where I can barely write fast enough to get it all down. The concept of Harvester, the idea that the end of the game I wanted the player to mull over whether he eternalized the over-the-top violence and surreal imagery of the game in the same way that Steve had, and the primary ending, all this was in the initial concept that I jotted down in one of those small reporter spiral notepad in about 30 minutes. That's what I pitched to Future Vision, and they bought it. End quote. I'm sort of mocking him here, but he does have some genuine credentials here. He was involved in the iconic game series Ultima, which is easily worth of respect. Maybe it was just the media painting him as a bit foolhardy, but I do think Austin is quite the visionary in a lot of ways. So we've got an auteur at the helm, we've got the latest in 3D scanning technology FMV, and the desire to push some buttons and boundaries. What could possibly go wrong? Harvester completely flopped, got mixed to low reviews, and the company dissolved a year later after it was released. Gilbert Austin faded into the wind, probably the same breeze that swept up Mike Dawson. Night Dive Studios acquired the game later, which is why you see it on Steam to this very day. Now, what does Harvester actually feature? It's uber violent and crass by design, but what about the giblets and the details? There were no trigger warnings in the 90s, but if you had tried to attach warnings to Harvester, it would probably go like this. This game features murder, child murder, animal murder, defiling graves, child kidnapping, child grooming, cannibalism, incest, a ton of non-consensual sex, sex scenes, cold war symbolism, blackmailing, human trafficking, vandalism, cults, prostitution, and worst of all, no one in town is subscribed to Hey Peter. Better correct that by dropping a like and sub to the channel for more coverage on strange and obscure video games. If you don't want to do that, that's okay. I just need a favor from you all. To all my seven-year-olds watching, go into your parents' bedroom and wake them up and say I need their super chat money. I, I can't explain what that means. Make sure to do it at 2 a.m. They'll love that. 
Now, without further ado, let's take a morbid journey into Harvester, the most insane and violent video game ever made. Our introduction comes in the form of an extremely loud FMV opening showing off some interesting 90s graphics for the time. And then we start the game. Have any clue what's going on? Neither did I the first time I played. Harvester has a wicked cold opening that I believe is best to just play and not knowing what's going on and let the game introduce everything on its own. You really don't have to bother with the manual. First thing you'll notice is, good lord, the video and sound quality. The game naturally looks kind of muddy and blurry because of the software it had to run on, but the Steam port isn't exactly a shining example of what the game can offer. You can get better versions on GOG and... Zoom? The game runs on DOSBox, an open source DOS emulator that does indeed work, but not without several metric tons of jank. So this aspect ratio is the best you're getting. Oh, also, the sound is just distorted beyond all belief. You should talk your father into buying some. He can afford it. And I can't stress enough the value of Pastorelli Auto Look. If I can get through Calamity Trigger's bad PC port, I can get through this. Despite how awkward it sometimes is, the game's basic controls and movement are basically untainted, which is fortunate because we're given ample time to explore our first location in the game, our room. We play as a young man dressed in a flannel shirt and jeans, the classic sign of someone being a hick. The game controls like this, you use your mouse's cursor to interact with and examine with things in the environment, and you click on the ground to walk around. The exit signs are meant to signify a transition either between the screen or locations. Right-clicking the mouse allows you to- Oh! Look at those moves! This guy's got Asriel combos! Keep these hands in mind for later. This symbol here- Please remember this, by the way- lets you know what items you can interact with, which usually gives you a description of what it is, or if you can interact with it in the form of a puzzle or obtainable item. You'll come to notice how surreal everything is. Everything in your room carries such a weird energy to it. The lines about how the clarinet in your room likely belonged to that fat high school girl and the watered plastic plants are so uniquely surreal that it's both laugh-worthy but also makes me a little uncomfortable. Your room doesn't feel lived in. An old-schooled record is inside your room. The dust ball basketball and the main character's attire scream Midwestern. And when we examine our drawer, which you really should do before you leave unless you want to kick yourself really hard later, we can get a pen and a coin, and the coin reads 1952. Pressing the I key or clicking on yourself brings up the inventory screen, where you can do all sorts of cool stuff with items, and includes a snazzy little photo of yourself that acts as a health bar. Yes, there is combat and a health bar in this game, but that will not be important until like, halfway through the game. No, I'm not kidding. Completely serious about that. Why don't we leave our room? We descend downstairs and see a young boy dressed up as a cowboy watching something on TV. The lips icon here indicates when we can talk to an NPC, and we get to the real bread and butter, the core of Harvester. Talking to demented NPCs. And the voice acting is really... something. First comes love, then comes Ned, then comes Steve in a baby carriage. What the hell are you talking about? Mom, Steve said hell! Young man, don't you dare use that kind of language in this house. Conversations go like this. You can get a list of topics you can ask each NPC about that branch off as you progress into more dialogue. But if you remember the individual terms, you can simply write them down in the text box to start from any point. If an NPC doesn't understand what you've just said, they have a funny voice clip and you just have to try again. This little snot is named Hank, and apparently he is our little brother but we don't remember that, because we've come down with a particularly nasty case of amnesia. So we don't remember him, or where we are, or even what our name is, until he tells us. Our name is Steve, and Steve is quite confused as to what's going on and why these people he's never met claim to be his family. Hank doesn't believe in Steve's amnesia and calls him a kidder, which is something you're going to get used to, because just about everyone in town has heard of Steve's lack of memories and calls him a kidder. Our first hint that something may not be right in this small 1950s town. 
Steve tries to pry answers out of a distracted and bothered Hank, who lets it slip that Steve is apparently engaged to someone named Stephanie, and that the wedding is in less than a month away. When you talk to Hank about the TV, Steve will find it odd that it doesn't have a remote control or that it isn't in color. All of which suggests he might not be from this time, but doesn't quite remember where he's from. If you watch the TV with him, you'll find that his cowboy program is shockingly violent. At least for a program meant for kids. It involves a cowboy gunning down Native Americans with wanton abandon, silly string blood and guts flying everywhere. It's an itchy and scratchy type of violence where it's so over the top that it isn't shocking and is actually hilarious. But when we revisit the show in the future, it might not be as funny as it looks on TV. Steve is a little worried that a young boy is watching such a morbid show you wouldn't assume would be intended for kids, but he refutes quite plainly and tells you to kick rocks and that killing people is in fact awesome. Even strangers, when you change the channel, you get this weird advertisement. Join the Hey Peter Patreon today! It pays to be a strange gamer. Get access to videos early, the chance to vote on the next video, see uncensored content too spicy for YouTube, and be equipped with the knowledge that by supporting me, you are personally contributing to my ability to finance better, longer videos, more consistency. Put simply, the more money I get, the more videos you get. Picking up what I'm putting down? Bully! Join Patreon and become a stranger gamer today! Hmm. Even in the 1950s, we get annoying, intrusive advertisements from grifters who don't want real jobs. That's pretty sad. Searching for more answers, Steve goes in the kitchen and interacts with someone calling herself his mother. A caricature of a sitcom mom character that is obsessed with baking cookies for Friday's sketchy bake sale by baking them today, which is Monday, and throwing them out because they get stale, as you'd imagine, and immediately baking more to replace the ones she just threw out. The bake sale is being run by a group called the Order of the Harvest Moon, which is supposed to benefit the apparently absurd number of vagrants who wander into town and mysteriously die. It's probably not a cult ritual or anything suspicious, so I wouldn't worry about it. She chastises him for pretending to have amnesia, especially not remembering his little brother Hank and his unnamed baby sister, who sometimes likes to eat bugs whole if you start shouting at your mom for any reason, which is blamed on the mysterious wasp lady that lives somewhere in town. We find out quite a bit from Mom. We hear about a mysterious organization called The Lodge, which seems to run all of the town's affairs, as well as figuring out the name of the town we're in, Harvest a town unlike any other. The Lodge is running a mandatory blood drive that is compulsory to attend, even for children, unless you're a Lodge member, which you are encouraged to become vehemently by your mother. All this info is told in a very comedic way, but your conversations with your mother can become very sexual if you steer the conversation in that way. Asking about your father reveals that he apparently got so battered by sleeping with your mother that he's been locked in his room for days and won't come out, so we can't visit him at all. Additionally, if we take advantage of the text box and write the word unprompted, we get a really interesting conversation. What a thing to say to your mother. Was that an invitation now that your father is out of action? Maybe later, dear. Right now, I have housework to do. Though you can watch if you want. My jaw hit the floor, and I felt compelled to leave my house as soon as possible. When I ran into a sort of paper boy, Jimmy, who just asks for steal the papers from our house because the local newspaper building burned down some months prior. He harasses us over it and tells us that he had better be given the papers every day, and perhaps a new pair of sneakers if we have any, and everything will be Jake, alright? The outside of our house is just as surreal as the inside, perhaps even more. Electromagnetism waves affecting our dreams and glued plastic discs to our roof mix the suburbs with nuclear fallout. From here, we can leave and explore the entire town of Harvest through the map. Was this a lot to take in at once? Without fail, every conversation with an NPC at any point in the game feels like an absurd fever dream with how much info they dispense and how much shocking information is laced inside. It's like someone smashing a brick over your head and expecting you to respond to them explaining the machinations of your local municipal government with a straight face. Oh, there's a bingo spot checked off. You play as this young amnesiac, Steve, 
acted by Kurt Kistler and voiced by Ryan Wickram, with no idea who he is or who anyone else is in town. He interacts with an environment he has no memories of, but he's quite certain that he doesn't belong here. He must grapple with several questions. Who is he? Where is he? Who is Stephanie? And what's going on in Harvest? The premise is mysterious and instantly intriguing. Anyone can put themselves into Steve's shoes as a fish out of water stuck inside of a demented town that gallantly parodies tropes of the 1950s with as much subtlety as a carpet bombing campaign. Steve's world of color televisions has been taken away and replaced with an alien world full of warped people completely consumed by the casual conception of hyperviolence, graphic sex, all under the thumb of a midwestern town controlled by a shadowy organization that promotes it all. Harvest wants you to question the inclusion and depiction of violence and sexuality in media by showing it at its most absurd state, inside the family home and your own very hometown. In the introduction part of the game, we're introduced to all of this very quickly and not left with a lot of time to process it, both for the benefit of the experience and perhaps negatively for player retention. It's no secret I chose to review this game because I like it and had a lot to say about the topics it discusses and explain why I enjoy its core gameplay loop, but I would be foolish to say that this game doesn't have a lot of flaws, many of which can prove too troublesome for people to continue playing with. As much as I like hearing about all the shocking information about our mother and brother, it's a little difficult to keep track of, at least for my peanut brain. This is only one location on the map. There are about a dozen other locations full of objects to explore, characters to talk to, plot points to follow, things to memorize, all of which are left up to your own devices to remember and connect. Aside from the tips section of the menu, half of which are just jokes, the game assumes a lot of the player and requires you to keep track of just about everything and look under every nook and cranny, both for mandatory story progression and extra activities only the most resolute players can discover. I've elected to format the video like this. Every time I enter a significant location or talk to a significant character, I will keep making a note to keep track of things they say and mention to catalog in my playthrough. Not everything will get a spot, mind you, because if I was playing this comprehensively, we would be here all day and it's very easy to be distracted and lose course. I'll introduce topics as I play, and I'll try not to repeat myself. So, each day is split up by topics as I feel necessary to introduce them. If you've made it this far already, strap in. It's only gonna get longer and more violently psychotic from here, so don't go anywhere. The rabbit hole only gets deeper. You can freely go wherever you please, but the game does nudge you in the right direction. You just need to keep track of these terms on your own, because there's no glossary or any real help. This is how the game is for each day. You must play through a week of Steve's life, gradually exploring the town and getting to know its inhabitants, many of which have changing dialogue trees and scenarios depending on each day. Think of it kind of like a Persona game? Except, instead of social links, you just pry into their private lives, they try and gaslight you into believing something or doing them a favor. It's honestly quite surprising how Harvester managed to accomplish something we've seen a lot more of modern RPGs today back in the 90s. Which made the comparison I made about its level of detail back in full circle. Though, unfortunately, Harvester just isn't remembered as fondly as something like Final Fantasy VI because it hasn't been preserved nearly as well. People like us, with nothing better to do than explaining their favorite games, are the real ones just keeping it alive. Let's start digging deep with the important details about your house. We can find three items here, the pen, the quarter, and a newspaper. The newspaper we must give to the kid outside of every day, or else, actually, I think I'll keep that part a secret for now. Just keep giving the kid the paper. The pen and quarter's usage for now is unknown. No better place to highlight how confusing the game can be sometimes with the first couple of items you are required to find to get past the very first day. Both items are in the drawer, and there's no way to know that without having to manually click the dresser, which is already hard to see, twice. Once you get the flavor text and a second time to operate it, meaning to interact with it and actually see its contents. If that sounds unnecessarily confusing, it's because it absolutely is. This is a problem that persists throughout the entire game. Even if you know where to find things, which often isn't the case because of the game's general lack of direction, you must jump through some weird janky hoops to obtain a critical item or piece of information, 
or else it's really gonna bite you in the back when you have to go looking for it. But what can I say about the family? Hank, played by Ben Morgan, is a creepy little snot-nosed brat obsessed with violence, and Mom, played by Mary Allen, just gave us a crash course on Harvest's history, giving us several different locations to visit, as well as objectives. And letting us know she's okay with incest, that was necessary. Should we try and find out who Stephanie is? What about the Lodge? I decided to ignore all that, and then head to the newspaper building immediately that the kid mentioned burned down some time ago. Three fire hydrants, and still burnt to a crisp. Barely detectable on the ash is a suspicious shovel, which we can equip as a weapon, because this game has seldom useful combat mechanics. There are several different weapon types, ranging from melee to firearms, which require ammunition, all of which activate by the right click on the mouse. I'll talk more about the combat later because it isn't really relevant until later. We can also use this shovel on the debris pile and find two key items a burned flyer for the big sale, and a button belonging to the post officer. I decided to pay a visit to the wasp woman instead of following through. Really interesting that your icon changes to an exit sign when you try and enter a new location, which really threw my dumb ass for a loop. Our wasp woman is actually named Tetsuya Crumb, played by Paris Forster, and her hyperfixation is, unsurprisingly, wasps. About how selfish they are, weird connections to religion, and a bunch of spirit science nonsense. The wasps also have the cursor symbol in their eyes for some reason. Despite that, there's actually nothing important here, so I went to the next door and visited this bug-eyed freak Mr. Johnson, played by Bob Crawley. He spends his entire day watching over his premium Tucker car parked outside, which I do not blame him for because I also admire cars that were built before 20 million pounds of garbage electronics were added to them which makes them more expensive and heavier for no good reason. Steve mentioned that he's always wanted a Tucker car and finds it strange that Harvest is absolutely full of them, when they were already limited when they were created back in the day. Mr. Johnson also offers you to plow Stephanie in the back of it. A lot of people in this game tell Steve to stop lying about his amnesia, usually by saying the iconic meme, you were always a kidder Steve, and to just plow his fiance and take over his family business. That's all very funny, so I'll overlook everyone in town being so interested in 18 year old sex life. Mr. Johnson has weird incel rage over a woman named Edna who runs DNA's diner. Penis is an option you can discuss with him, showing just how depraved these people are. Visiting the general store, Mrs. Phelps, played by Doris McKellen, tells you that the only thing the quarter you picked up from home can buy is an adult magazine, which she happily sells to Steve, at least much happier to sell to him than Deputy Loomis, a police officer who has the reputation of being an obsessive gooner. Also, take note of this photocopier. Free copies, eh? Whatever will we use it for? I decided to investigate the post office, where we meet Postmaster Boyle, played by Charlie Beecham. Apparently, we can find our application for the lodge inside here, but Boyle doesn't print out copies until a specific day of the month, which we happened to miss some time ago. He won't make an exception for you because of those flimsy rules or all that stand between a functioning civilized society and total chaos, as he puts it, and he isn't entirely wrong. Imagine if the place you live now, which is statistically America because of my viewership distribution, was just allowed to do anything all the time. Without rules, and by extension laws, what really is preventing people from going completely primal animal mode and listening to their instincts? How much of things we are naturally repulsed by, like incest and extreme violence, things that are much more accepted and commonplace in Harvest are founded by religions in the area and cultural standards, rather than just an inherent human feeling of being grossed out? If someone was in a virtual reality environment, how quickly would their morals fall apart if they're exposed to an environment with little to no boundaries or punishments? Do we only do good things because we expect to be shunned if we don't? Foreshadowing is a narrative device in which suggestions or warnings about events to come are dropped. There's a blind lady trying to read her mail in the post office. There's nothing of importance at the barber shop, except for the fact that one of the hicks here apparently shoots down aliens, even having one mounted on the wall. Oh, yeah, there might be aliens in the game. But for now, don't worry about it. The aluminum foil this guy talks about is unironically more important than the apparent threat of extraterrestrial life invading. I love this game's sense of humor. The military outpost based might be the most absurd location in the entire game. 
you can talk to this half-man, Colonel Buster, played by Graham Sash... Sash... whatever... Who is operating an active nuclear missile program which will instantly bombard the entire town and kill everyone instantly if he presses the button. And that button, to activate this, is strapped on his torso and hovers mere inches off the ground. Just look at our options for dialogue. We can talk to him about him having his legs blown off in World War II, how much he hates aliens, how much he hates communists even more. If you refuse to give up your human rights at this part, or he just thinks you are communist, he just shoots and kills you then and there, which sets off the missiles and gets everyone killed. There are many, many times Steve can be randomly killed by an NPC, and every single one of them are very funny, but a little frustrating if he didn't save. Save often. You can spend a lot of time listening to the more unhinged, esoteric kernel, but there still isn't any progression to be found here. Inside the butcher shop, we can find- Oh my god, that's so many dead cats! This fat ass over here is cutting up cats and whatever else to serve for the people of Harvest. Apparently, our dad owns this place, and we're expected to take over once we're done with Stephanie. We can take home a slip of paper that if we get our dad to sign, we can take some meat home, like being given paper to sign for attending a class trip in school, a symbol of how normalized slaughter and degeneracy is in Harvest. Actually, speaking of school, let's take a visit there. There isn't anything to do here other than implications that the principal is a pedophile and the teacher practices nuclear missile drills and regularly beats children bloody with a baseball bat for rowdiness. It was the 90s, and making jokes about school shootings weren't funny yet. Funnily enough, Postal 1 used this at its shocking ending just a year later in 97, but they both use the example of innocent children being brutalized, or at least the implication of that to get their point across of the effect of violence in media and its consequences. Harvester makes it considerably sillier than its pitch-black representation Postal has, but perhaps the sort of cartoon logic it runs with might muddy the point a little bit. I'm just saying, maybe we should see some dead kids earlier on in the game, in Minecraft. Interesting to note that the teacher remembers Steve as a model student, which lets us know that Steve has enough of a presence in the town to have a reputation and history with the town, making it all the stranger that he doesn't remember anything about his life. If he was from the 90s, how could he remember color TV, but also have as much history in the 50s? The TV station is immensely interesting. You can meet a lot of Indians in line for something, and that something is getting their guts ripped out by Ranger Ryder, the sheriff on the TV that people are always watching. When he isn't giving you worthless autographs, you can have a fascinating discussion on the nature of violence. Steve criticizes just how violent the show is, but Ryder says that the violence is as American as apple pie and low SAT scores, and justifies it by saying that if Americans hadn't treated the indigenous population the way they did, then America wouldn't have formed at all. So violence has tangible benefits of keeping people secure in their homes. Using indigenous people is a surprisingly wise decision, because if you know anything about American history, you'll know just how bad they got it relocated, exterminated, and mistreated all throughout, all just to make way for colonies which became nations through war, leaving them as the leftovers. Examples like the Trail of Tears paint a bleak, black picture of the Indian removal part of American history, and using it satirically by having this cowboy character butcher them casually serves an example that isn't entirely alien to real-world history. Ryder's debate is inherently funny and flawed because he points out the cultural decadence of the states, how people can rest easy knowing that whoever came before them were slaughtered to make way for a failing education system. There isn't an exact right answer present because no one really considers everyone on the globe to weigh the scales accordingly to balance out when violence should be used for the benefit of one group over another. How do you reconcile and repent for terrible events that happened hundreds of years ago, when all the perpetrators and victims are dead, with their descendants having to figure it out in their steed. Harvester doesn't have an easy answer for that and lets us think about it in a way that very few other parts of the game really let you internalize in such a poignant way. The entire game is formatted like that, sometimes you'll just find an area or a character that really makes you stop playing and just think for a while. DNA's diner, or Edna's diner as it's actually called, has almost nothing interesting in it. Just grab the screwdriver from the drawer on the left, and if you think it's funny, you can show the little girl in here, Edna's daughter Karen, the adult magazine, and get you arrested by the sheriff. Turns out, Harvest is actually quite progressive and lets you get away with grind and groom children, just as long as you say you won't do it again. 
Man, that would be crazy if Steve's actor tries to do that in real life or something. The police station in Harvest is a critical location to visit. On our first visit, we don't have much to do other than learn that the police don't lift a finger to solve any of the arson attacks or murders around town, because most of them are victims are just vagrants who wander in the town, and immediately die from unknown causes. But those unknown causes are more than likely related to the Lodge. Sheriff Dwayne Dwayne is a small town lazy cop with a shady past, and Loomis is a gooner king just begging for a girly picture book because his shrew wife won't let him buy any. If you wait until noon until the sheriff leaves to go to Edna's diner, which just means leave the building and come back, and give Loomis the mag. He leaves the desk to go find a quiet place to goon, and we get to ransack the desk, which includes a key to the evidence room, the sheriff's checkbook, and a note. The checks and notes detail a history of Dwayne blackmailing Postmaster Boyle over… something. The key lets us get into the evidence locker, where we can pick up a bunch of items, only if one of which is actually pointed out to us at any point in the entire game, the gas can. Collect that along with the barely visible camera on the shelf and that pair of sneakers. Two of those items are absolutely compulsory, but literally nothing points this out to you. You had better hope you don't forget. The entire game has this issue of you easily being able to miss crucial items, which leaves your ass stranded and you gotta go all the way back to this place to pick it up. So please, just keep your eyes peeled, and for the love of Jaw, if you really need to, just look up a walkthrough for the mandatory items. No one's gonna blame you. But when you try to leave, you get to see Loomis punished like a hound dog for jerking off on the job by Dwayne. What you need to do is go back to the post office and show Boyle the button and accuse him of being involved with the newspaper fire. He does a pretty bad job at lying and implicates himself in the fire, but cuts you a deal. If you can bring back a certain can of gas that may or may not have his fingerprints on it, he might give you an early lodge application form. Hand him the gas can we picked up from the evidence locker, and we get our form. But what are those copied notes implicating Dwayne? Find him at Edna's diner and show him the copies, which you can produce by using the photocopier at the general store, but not the originals because he won't accept it for some reason. And in exchange for your silence and giving the items back, he gives you a literal get out of jail free card, which allows you to get away with committing a crime, usually just murdering someone, but not a story important character, and we have no real way of telling who is important or not so it isn't really that useful on a first playthrough. Oh yeah, did I mention that? You can kill a bunch of NPCs in this game, it's really funny. Harvest has a three strike system. You can goof around and get some mischief done just twice, but on the third time, you die. This card just ensures that one of these times don't count. Remember when I told you to get the pen? You must use it to fill out the application form, which you can actually view, need attention to detail. All you must do is to hand in the form to the Lodge's Sergeant of Arms in the giant Lodge building in the middle of town, who was also voiced by Wickerham. Once you hand it in, day one has been completed, and you're ready for Tuesday. The biggest issue I have with the game so far is the lack of direction. There are a lot of places I didn't even mention, like the fire station where all the firemen are extremely gay, or the mortuary where you can find the mortician voiced by Gilbert himself in all of his awkward glory, or the creepy church because none of these locations are relevant. We get a lot of different clues, but these just lead you in circles or have nothing of value. The character interactions are entertaining at least, but the game expects an astronomical amount of patience from the player. You're encouraged and expected to explore at your own pace, but it still feels a little frustrating to be so stuck when the solution is just to find the pen in the drawer at the literal beginning of the game to complete the day. The actual route boiled down to its bare parts is this. Collect the money and pen from your room, use the shovel to dig up the button for the newspaper building, buy the adult magazine from the general store, go inside the police station twice to wait for Dwayne to leave and give Loomis the mag, steal the gas can, give the can to boil, fill out the form with the pen, and give it to the Master of Arms. Only your house, the general store, post office, police station, and lodge are required to beat this day. It was very enjoyable putting all the pieces together, but the process could be greatly thinned out if it wasn't for all the 90s jank we had to sift through. If there was a reason I kept going on for this long, it was simply to detail how tedious and long-winded the game can sometimes feel. And 100% not because I wrote out a lot and editing is really unfun, didn't want to reorganize the whole script. 
You probably aren't even watching, who cares? You're asleep because you put me on as background noise. Also, you don't even need to find out who Stephanie is on this day. Getting married in a couple weeks? Yeah, who cares? Let's go talk to the gay fireman instead and ask him why their background music has a dog being slapped in it. Raj defines color coordination. Hello, Steve. Welcome to the House of Flame, as we like to call it. Some may find this experience charming, and I certainly do to an extent, but it's a flaw I can't entirely overlook. Day one does prepare us for a lot of the violence in movies and sex on TV, but in a way that whets the appetite. The need for a good eye, if it hasn't already filtered you already, will need to be renewed and prioritized from this day on. Day one is like 15 pages of my script, I think. Leave a like for that one. At least the dream Steve gets at the end of the day is pretty damn funny. I suppose seeing his treasure trail is additional shock value. We wake up for another day, and kept all of our items. I guess Steve slept with his shovel last night. Going downstairs, I can't help but think, Oh god, what are these freaks going to say to me next? Which you might think is a bad thing, but this is a sign that the game is conditioning you, which is a good thing. You should feel constantly afraid and uneasy playing this game. It means you're immersed. I don't often play games that make me feel uneasy the entire time, but Harvester managed to do so with flying colors, which is high praise. Dad is still sick and locked inside of his room. Mom's got nothing new to say to us, and Hank has apparently been spying on Mom and Dad, observing whatever they're doing in their room after dark. Gross. You'll notice that a lot of NPCs don't have a lot of new things to do on day two. It makes scouting each area looking for puzzles or things to do a lot quicker, but also a lot less entertaining. There usually isn't a way to check if someone has anything to say that doesn't involve spending a lot of time just looking blindly. The paper boy, if we give him the paper again, still pats us down for a pair of sneakers, which we can find back in the evidence room. We get a broom closet key for our efforts because this kid knows that the pedo principal and the school teacher are getting smutty inside there every day because he likes to watch. A lot of little kids are voyeurs for some reason. The catch is, they only do this in the afternoon. How can you tell when it's afternoon? I don't know, it just kind of happens. Let's get acquainted with our neighbors we missed last time, the Potsdams. This is Ethan Ralph. I, I mean Ralph, I mean Mr. Potsdam played by Travis Miller. <sighs> Looks like Ralph, and that's what I'm calling him, all right? You're pretty sad, honestly. Ralph is obsessed with raw meat, so much so that he wants Steve to marry Stephanie, his apparent daughter, so she can get closer to the butchery we will likely be inheriting from our father. He loves meat so much, that's all he talks about. And he has a framed picture of him squeezing some raw beef hung in his house. He and his wife have grounded Stephanie for some reason. It's not entirely clear, but she's confined to her room the entire game, and you have to ask Mrs. Potsdam for permission before you go upstairs. All the conversations are very disturbing with these two, but a little birdie told me of a very specific word you can type and get some truly shocking results. Type the word molest, and just look at her options here. This isn't really followed up on either. Poor Karen, Ralph doesn't even look one bit guilty. But as for the first option, you can make him squeal like a pig if you don't tell anyone else there's a peephole in the bathroom window, one that we can't access until later if you're a freak who enjoys that kind of stuff. 
squeal for me, Porky. <laughs> Told you he was really Ralph. I don't really have an issue with the grooming. Insane sentence, by the way. I just realized that in post. Oh my god. <laughs> Because it's not like they aren't treating it like the disgusting thing it is. I think they even managed to make it reasonably funny, considering the subject matter. Steve is rightfully pissed, and he isn't exactly scrambling to tell the obviously corrupt police about this issue, so he can take some frustration out on Ralph. I'm honestly impressed how they use such a topic to such comedic effect without pulling a Garth Ennis and wiping your ass all over for pure shock jock. Sometimes the game is very witty and clever in its usage of taboo, other times it is not. Think of it like this, when you hear a fucking curse word when you weren't expecting it, it grabs your attention and makes you jump, kind of like a verbal jump scare. This technique is used by public speakers like Tony Robbins a lot, and to great effect. That might have been the first uncensored f-bomb on the channel, don't get used to it. Mrs. Potsdam is also played by the same actress who plays our mother. It's something you can intentionally say to her, which she obviously doesn't understand. We can ask her for permission to see Stephanie quite easily. But before you go upstairs, make sure to enter her bathroom and raid the mirror cabinet for everything you can grab. Especially the tampons. Grabbing those has a huge payoff at the end of the game. We finally meet Stephanie, played by Lisa, I can't pronounce the surname because it's way too Italian, who is in the same situation as Steve. She has amnesia, and is just as confused about the wedding as you are. The two of you can find some solace in your similar situations, but since she's confined to her room, she can't do much about it. Steve tells her about his decision to join the Lodge for more info, which she disapproves of because she thinks that the Lodge, and the entire town of Harvest, is some kind of setup or trap designed to ensnare them into… something. The only thing missing is a motive and a face. Who would do that, and why? You can do all of this either on the first day or the second day, because one of the bathroom items is mandatory for completing the second day. If you come back on day two, Steve informs a worried Stephanie about him joining the lodge and the two have a nice little back and forth. I decided to explore around town until I went back to the post office and met a very pissed off postmaster, who isn't happy that people are finding about his pricklier qualities. This manhole key is attainable if we use one of the items to lube it up and take the key. But doing this activates Nightfall and Harvest, which means 99% of places that you can't interact with because they're locked down. Oops. Guess we aren't getting to see the principal clap some cheeks. One of the most pervasive issues with the whole game is how inconsistent it can feel sometimes. It can often be difficult to see Harvest as a living, breathing town when only half the time it has any dynamic elements, while the other half feels very static and fetch quest-like. What we can do is visit the Colonel again, who tells us to investigate the fire station. The male model spotted in the earlier days is very suspiciously still, even with the building empty, and he urges us to join the lodge before it's too late. Out of everyone in town, a gigolo is the one who makes the best case for joining a lodge. Fear of dying over… something happening on Sunday. Probably either the nuclear missile outpost going off, or the blood drive. You can report back to the colonel, and if you tell them the firemen are indeed Fanooks, he shoots you right away and launches the missiles, and you got a game over. You can make a little game out of how many times we'll just regularly kill you and everyone because he didn't like the color pink, and every single time it's worth seeing and funny. I reloaded a save, and went to the school after I visited Stephanie, and I ignored the manhole key, which would activate Nightfall. I used the broom key in the closet, and indeed found the teacher and principal together. Here's the catch. You need to use the camera item on them to take a photo of their affair. Nowhere are you told this. You just have to remember you picked it up from yesterday and use this. In exchange for that photo and your silence, you get the teacher's baseball bat, which is our first weapon worth a damn in the game. It isn't compulsory, but it's loads better than the shovel. Let's test it out in the wasp lady and- Oh my god, her neck was torn open by blunt force! Steve swung that bat so hard, he decapitated her. Her actually being a wasp is the least shocking part of this revelation. The funny thing is, no one cares if you kill the wasp lady. Murdering in this game is surprisingly not fun, because people need to be around for the story, or you just instantly get caught in jail. But some NPCs are totally fine to kill. The wasp lady has absolutely nothing to give. However, 
you can just kill her and leave her body there. If you go to the TV station and kill McKnight, another NPC you can kill without punishment, you can find the deed to the TV station in his safe, which reveals that the sheriff is now the sole owner of the TV. You can pull the same blackmailing routine as before and get the same get out of jail free card, but he tells you this. Being in law enforcement means you have a real legal way to kill someone, because murder is just unlawfully killing someone meaning you can lawfully kill someone. Most common example is in self-defense, where someone trying to kill you can be legally killed by you to protect yourself or your family. Harvest definition is a bit shaky, but someone who wants an easy way to get a gun and kill people can quite easily become a cop, and we've seen it from time and time again in our own world. One must imagine how a police officer feels knowing they had to shoot someone down, even if it was to protect someone. Dwayne likes the feeling, but how does the average Joe react to snuffing the lights out of someone until their eyes lose their spark and they just become an organ, until the person becomes a body? I grab that manhole key again, and night falls. I take more time to explore the nightlife of Harvest, and I can find Ralph burying something in the cemetery, filled with the countless graves of hobos who died in the area. I'll just keep holding, you he's acting quite suspicious and is very clearly lying about what he's burying, but we can't find out much now. There is, however, a box of matches we can grab for later. Also, notice the building here, the Potsdam Family Crypt. We can't enter for now, but it might be the most suspicious place in the entire game. You think it'll come up later? Finally, we get back to the lodge and meet the Sergeant of Arms, who communicates through telepathy. Oh yeah, did I mention that? He's, he's psychic, and that's a tertiary part of his character. All we have to do is scratch Mr. Johnson's prized Tucker car and report back. Not total the car, but just scratch it, because initiation to the lodge involves a couple malicious pranks on the townspeople. Side note, look at the symbol here. The one in our cursor, on the wasp's eyes, the symbol is absolutely everywhere, presumably as the symbol for the lodge's total control over absolutely everything at Harvest. It's on the animals, the buildings, and even all over the church, which worships not the Lord and Savior, but this emerald-clad figure holding a scythe. The town being called Harvest doesn't get any points for subtlety, but it does get points for being cool. Did I ever show you that monologue Edna has to say? The Lodge is the repository of all wisdom. You should join the Order of the Harvest Moon, Steve, and soon. Why? The wheat ripens and waits not for the scythe. The farmer who waits too long, it were better that he use the scythe to rip his own stomach out than to stay his side when the wheat ripens. The harvest moon wanes and then comes winter. An empty belly, the body sun's belly, gurgling within or bloody on the ground. What does it benefit a man if he gains his soul and loses the world? You hunger. Feed yourself before it's too late. Oh. Edna? If it wasn't blatant enough, the Order of the Harvest Moon is a cult that has totally taken over, and they get to do whatever they want, and the only people who have any real say in the town's affairs are other Lodge members, but we don't know who is a member and who isn't. Anyone in town can apply for a position, which casts suspicion on anyone who isn't explicitly said that they aren't a part of it. Stephanie tells us that women can't join the Lodge, so our suspicion is cast on the men of Harvest. Unfortunately, you can't ask most people if they're a member, which is a huge missed opportunity. Imagine playing detective and piecing clues together who is a part of the Lodge from as early as day one on a second playthrough. Going to Johnson's house, we use the manhole key to get into the sewer, which leads you to a huge tunnel. Smack the weak part of the wall with a weapon and go through the cave until you get to his garage. Steal his pitchfork, check out his table, where you can steal a screwdriver and check out his plans to burn down Edna's diner if she rejects his advances. One of the license plates is for Texas, which is weird because Harvest is set in the Midwest. Just use this screwdriver to scratch the car, leave, and report back to the Lodge, who instructs you to get a good night's sleep and then steal a scrap of fabric from the fire station tomorrow. And that's all there is for day two. Doesn't it feel dramatically shorter than day one? I know that the first day should have every reason to be one of the longer chapters to establish a tone and feel for the gameplay, which it manages to accomplish the first one, but we don't get a lot of new events or dialogue to explore. 
There's more to find in the future, but the combat mechanics are lampshaded hard. Not that they're useful, or fun for that matter. You must awkwardly aim your mouse in whatever direction you're facing, and then just spam right click until something dies. You can't even tell what your health is until you check your inventory, and there's not a good way to gauge it unless you attack someone who won't put you in jail right away, but will fight back, like the Mortician or Mr. Johnson. The reliance on highly specific items might have been worse in this chapter. I really hope you just guessed and happened to raid Stephanie's bathroom before you found the manhole key, because there isn't spit that tells you what to do there. Assuming you didn't grab it day one, the quickest route is Stephanie's house and grab everything in her bathroom, then the post office to grab the manhole key, to the lodge, Mr. Johnson's house to scratch his car, then back to the lodge. Depending on if you grab the lube from her house, you only need to visit three locations the entire day. I highly don't recommend you do that, but damn, the game flies past if you know exactly where to look, which means you miss loads of context and deep lore about the town and its residents, which is quite forward thinking and ahead of its time for 1996 PC clicking games. I mean, look at Darkseed. We managed to wake up another day. Mom tells us that someone scratched Mr. Johnson's car, and someone killed the wasp lady. Both things she finds pretty amusing, but didn't connect the dots back to us. She also tells us very nonchalantly that Karen, Edna's daughter, has gone missing. She actually warns us against going to look for her, telling us that our time in harvest won't be pleasant if we keep doing so. The mask slip from Mom momentarily, and Steve begins to suspect everyone even more. Talking to Hank, we get this disgusting, morbid story about he heard Karen went missing, so he went to Edna's diner and intentionally asked to see Karen just to torment her mother, which ended up working because she started crying out of desperation. Hank demanded that she made him a sandwich, and he raided her room to look for any valuables while she did. You unfortunately can't kill Hank, which is a real shame because that story genuinely got under my skin. Maybe it's Harvest's effect on me, but I really wanted to bash little snot's brains out with my shovel. How many games include that level of psychological gaslighting in Fountain Hank's story? Can we include more gaslighting and psychotic manipulation in video games, please? Oh, yeah, don't forget the paper again. Heading to Mr. Johnson's house, he's super peeved about his Tucker car being scratched, but not as pissed as Karen being abducted. Not because he cares about her, but because if there was a man in the house, it simply wouldn't have happened. Something really neat about this day is that a lot of your actions will be noted by townspeople, but they just don't know it's you. It's a great detail that really makes Harvest seem like a living, breathing location. For example, killing Mr. Knight and talking to the deputy and sheriff will reveal just how much they didn't like him and how they don't care. People have individual things to say about everyone else. Anyone else think most residents of Harvest kind of look like Seattle Seahawks wide receivers? Also, I really recommend you notice that Mr. Johnson's garage is open because you absolutely need to steal this dolly. You can barely see in the corner here. You will not be able to progress if you don't get it. I didn't even notice that stupid thing last night where scratching his car. I mean, how could you? Look at it. There's no hints about finding that too, and it's not optional. You need it. It is compulsory. Let's check in on the Karen situation. Edna is distraught and doesn't want to talk about it, but remember when we saw Ralph in the cemetery? Revisiting, we can move this picnic table and find a poorly covered lot, which we can dig up with our shovel, and find Karen still alive. Ralph did some utterly disgusting events with her. Playing house only has one definition in a game like this, and if you remember the previous conversation we've had with Ralph, we can return Karen safely to Edna, who gives us an unspecified amount of reward money, which we can use to buy some items that will be important in the future, a roll of tape, and a new weapon, the wrench. I went back to the Potsdam house, and we confront this disgusting pig of a man in his house, who flat out doesn't care that we know what unspeakable things he did to Karen. The police won't help us, and Ralph and his wife will tell our mom if we act up, so our hands are kind of tied. There's something about people so casually and callously discussing their molestation of a child and being completely unrepented about having a casual, ambient music playing while they relax in their house. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know what that crazy little bitch said, but it's not true. I was at home that night. Mrs. Potsdam. That's right, Mr. Potsdam. Hello, Steve. Forget the pot roast, Mother. Pot roast isn't for backstabbers. My meat! It's the truth. That's why. It did a lot worse than get under my skin. It made me genuinely breathless. They aren't really making jokes about it, it's a dead serious situation. The way Karen sort of goes dead-eyed and Steve speaking with such fiery conviction in his voice really got to me. Put yourself in Steve's shoes. Imagine being the only one trying to help this obviously abused girl and your entire town and law enforcement simply doesn't care. You have no other choice than to live with the fact that her abuser can live unrepentant and unimpeded. For such a fantastical and ridiculous game, it's disturbingly jarring to have a genuinely real example like this. Without going into detail, I've seen a lot of situations like this in my own life, so this part of the game struck a real chord with me. We can at least speak to Stephanie about it. We told her about our Lodge application drama and about Karen. It's a very sobering conversation that calmed me down quite a bit after having to swallow such an insane pill out of nowhere. Do you see why this game's content was a contender for one of the most violent games of all time? My title really wasn't clickbait, this is ridiculous! Okay, so our task is to get a bolt of fabric in the fire station and give it to the lodge. Problem is, we can't seem to find it. What you must do to obtain it is so ridiculously specific and impossible to guess that I honestly don't know how people were able to get past this day without following a guide. What you need to do is go to the school building and set off the alarm, which gets the fire truck parked in the garage of the station to leave, then go back to the fire station and retrieve the ladder and a fire axe. But the door to the station is locked. So where do you go? The meat processing plant! You need to get a meat permission slip from this guy and bring it to your dad. But how do you get to your dad? Go back home, use that furniture dolly on your cabinet, and it activates a secret switch. Go outside, use the Phillips screw specifically to unscrew these bars. Talk to your dad, get the slip signed, go back to the meat plant, get some meat, go back to the fire station, which you can now enter because it's nighttime. All of a sudden, give the meat to the dog, then use the ladder on this specific light switch here, and then get the piece you need. You don't even need to hand it in. Once you get that bolt and leave the fire station, done, start day four. Did that sound like a lot? Because it was. This whole sequence defies all logic and it made me physically ill trying to figure out where the hell to go. What does your dad have to do with the fire station? Who could have guessed all to do that? I can't even see the damn things I need to collect, let alone where to use them. The male model in the fire station does give you hints on where to go, but most people don't have spit to say about the meat plant. So you're up the creek without a paddle. The game's out to lunch! Speaking of your dad, let's talk about him. Joshua Graham over here is bandaged from head to toe and locked inside of an insane BDSM dungeon. He's deathly afraid of our freakish mother, and I can only imagine the CPT going on here. Why do they need a cow? Apparently, it's normal for sex to look like this in Harvest, and I think this might be the only game in history that makes me say, never mind, go back to the molesting, that's more understandable than whatever's happening on here. Dad signs your meet permission form and urges you to leave as soon as possible, which you probably should. <laughs> when you get the meat from Pat, you can also just kill him, nobody cares, but he fights back. Active combat in this game is terrible because you can barely tell when someone takes a hit or when you get hit. At least we get to kill this cat killing piece of work. That felt pretty good. There's interesting stuff you can do with the dialogue on this day, but so much of it is a gated through an awful progression system. When you talk about Harvest, I honestly recommend breaking it up day by day, preferable in chart form. Some days are just more interesting than others, and much better. More opportunities to explore, funnier dialogue, more interesting results. Some days feel like eating an entire fool's gold sandwich, and other days feel like eating avocado toast. There's a pretty tangible difference in how full your stomach feels after eating like a king and eating like a millennial. This day is a real low point because of how convoluted everything is, but remember this. The bake sale is on Friday, and apparently we have until Sunday to join the lodge. We're running out of time.
routine has started to become monotonous, but perhaps in a good, immersive way. I can tell you firsthand that after graduating high school and still living with your parents, the routine you had for years can feel awful and claustrophobic when you think we should be ahead in life, or at least not stuck in the Midwest. Just give the paper to the kid. Mom is definitely peeved that we rescued Karen from Ralph, and she isn't happy that we're accusing our future father-in-law of being a pedophile. Oh yeah, the wedding. I kind of forgot that was happening because people stopped bringing it up. Steve, and us, the players, have been so focused on joining the lodge that we both kind of forgot to care about the wedding. Oops. Funny to know that Mom calls Ranger Ryder the moral high point of Harvest. You know, the guy who butchers random natives for entertainment. It's not a very subtle comment on how young people take way too much influence from whatever media they've been stuck in front of. If Harvester was made now, I think Hank would have probably been an iPad baby watching some YouTube pranks to pretend to shoot people for videos. Hank has another gruesome story to share with us. He tried to ask Karen how it felt to be buried alive, but she's apparently gone catatonic from the abuse. Not that Hank would care, mind you. We head over to Stephanie's house, where from this point on, you can just have sex with her as much as you want. The isolation of being stuck in a room is getting to her, and she begs Steve to plow her, which you can choose not to do, but if you do, you get an FMV cutscene of them undressing, all while Ralph watches through a peephole and jerks off. First off, I had this idea last night that I was going to do my own ambush. Aside from Stephanie's house, there's almost nothing to do in all of Harvest. A lot of NPCs have no new dialogue whatsoever, and if they do, it's just flavor text about whatever vandalism you committed at the behest of the Order yesterday. You can't even visit the fire station to check out what's going on. In the daytime, at least. If you visit the fire station at night, the male model had his face torn off. Why? I don't know. You can't even find the fireman anymore to ask, he's just dead. It's a real shame the dialogue has already become a little repetitive. Not all of it must be for a clue or for something like advancing the story or character development, but there's still a clear division between people you want to talk to to play the game versus people you talk to purely for entertainment, and it's become a lot more biased towards the humor from this point on. I understand that development in this game was rushed all over the place and things had to be cut, but it's not something I can just ignore. Going back to the lodge, we hand the scrap of fabric and we're told to break into the barber shop and steal that fancy pole the Italian barber has. In order to pull off the pole heist, we need to head to the barber shop at night and secure the door with the tape found in the general store, then use the fire axe. I, I think the tape helps to keep the glass from smashing the little shards and just big shards? I, I don't know, I haven't robbed many people. It's unintuitive because if you try and break the glass, we can. Once you're inside, just remember to flick the light switch, then use the screwdriver to take the pole, if you don't instantly get caught and must load a save on account of the police execution. All the way back in day one, we're told about the faulty alarm system, so I don't really have a problem with how this part is set up. It might be a little aggravating when you realize it, but if you haven't started taking notes by this point, that's on you. Right after that, day four ends. Yeah, that's it. There's nothing to do on day four. You're likely thinking, did they run out of steam? Did the developers just have no time to include anything interesting beyond this point? The answer is yes and no. We are in a pretty bad depression for interesting things to talk about, but there is a peak later on, we just have to thug it out for a bit. Today is our bake sale. Our mother tells us excitedly, we finally get to see what she's been baking all this time. Remember, the bake sale that will probably end up killing a lot of vagrants so the mortician can find some new work. After our daily routine, we can check in on the barber shop where we find holy smokes that poor Italian hairdresser got fried to a crisp. Apparently, Steve forgot to move some open electrical wires out of the way of some water. So when the barber opened up shop the next morning, he got electrocuted to death. And now he's a little past al dente. Nobody sincerely cares that they had died because he was an Italian immigrant. They're kind of glad that WAP, as they put it, is now dead. Bull cuts it is from now on, I guess. Anti-Italian discrimination. 
Steve is pretty miffed about having accidentally committed manslaughter and blames the Lodge. The Sergeant of Arms smashes Steve's argument and says that he probably should have just been more careful, and he says that it wouldn't have happened if the faulty alarm system wasn't rigged the way it was. Classic gaslighting tactic. It isn't your fault because it was an accident. Even if it was an accident, the barber is at fault because he set up the system wrong. You can tell all of this to a horrified Stephanie, who thinks she's losing Steve to the madness of Harvest because of his actions, which may be true, or at least coming true. I know that the game is suggesting that Steve's pursuit of truth is leading him down a dark, violent path, but I've been killing a lot of people you don't need to kill because I think it's funny. Killing people is surprisingly not important and doesn't come up very much. The sergeant doesn't comment on that, which is odd considering most other NPCs do in some form. Missed opportunity, eh? Imagine this guy taunting you for deliberately choosing to do horrible things. There's almost nothing funny to do in the game at this point. Try as you might, people just won't engage with you, and I think it's a damn shame. Because it makes exploring, something you can already feel a little tedious with the lack of direction, infinitely more frustrating. You just have to wait till nightfall until the bake sale begins. The only way to trigger nightfall is to go into the mortuary and use the camera item on a mutilated corpse inside of a coffin, and then show that picture to the mortician as blackmail and exchange it for a tube of glue. Naturally, you just have to guess to do all of that. I'm sort of numb to complaining about being in the dark when progressing the game, and I just want to see more action happen. We get said action when night comes, and we attend the bake sale pool. Several moms, who all speak in unison and sound exactly like our mother, tell us what a good thing it is to put bodies in the grave. We attend the bake sale for maybe five seconds when disaster strikes the TV station, because it's on fire. Postmaster Boyle is running from the scene with the gas tank we gave him. Why did we do this? Probably on the sheriff's orders, since he owns the TV station, or at least partially shared it with McKnight, regardless if I took off his head a couple days ago. That fire might end up saving our bacon, because our final initiation task is to set fire to Edna's diner. First her kid got molested, now he burned down her business. Brutal. Using the tape and axe trick again, we get inside. I really hope you have 2020 vision, because our solution is right there. Oh, you don't see it? Let's zoom in. Yeah, that. The cake cover I couldn't spot for damn near 15 minutes is the only way to solve this puzzle. Do I even need to explain why this is absurd? Come on, guys. I, I know development was so troubled to the point where one of the main programmers wanted to punch Steve's actor in the face, but would it kill you not to enlarge in the item? Or just have it sitting somewhere less obscured? All we need to do is use the glue Moyahan gave us, and combine them with the lid to snuff out the fire alarm or smoke detector above. Using the matches we obtained from the cemetery, I really hope to grab those by the way, turn on the gas stove and use the matches on it, and now the building is on fire. After committing arson on the least deserving people in town, we'd head home. Overall, this day is considerably underwhelming, which is funny because we just set someone's business on fire. It's a shame how the game is structured, with a high starting point and end point, and a low middle point. You can think of the middle of this game as Harvester's Trial 3, or third case. It basically feels like trying to decipher Mikon's motive and explain how she moved location so quickly without having to lose your mind. If you know what I'm talking about, then you know. I stopped making those charts because from this point on, figuring out where to go is easy. For the most part. The Lodge tells us exactly where to go, and we've been taught, perhaps unkindly, how to explore our environment and hold on to our items. Inconsistency is the biggest learning curve and snag we have to swallow, because sometimes puzzle solutions are clever and sometimes you're as blind as a bat, and sometimes people tell you where to go and sometimes you're on your own. Maybe they were just striving for true Midwestern accuracy, as in there's nothing to do for young people than other than watch everyone around them die. The bake sale may have been interrupted, but we still have the blood drive, and Sunday may be our last day to join the lodge. Past that, who knows what's gonna happen to Harvest. People are dropping like flies, and we might be next. This weekend may be our last. Do I have to switch discs? That is adorable. I love it when games that originally came out on multiple discs have these little screens that tell us where the disc swap is supposed to occur. Even when technology has progressed so far enough not to require it, it is so charming. 
Since the TV station burned down, Hank just sits and watches an empty screen numbly. Mom has also gone pretty stir-crazy since the big sale was a disaster. She tries to find comfort in her children by- Oh my god, her eyes just popped out! All those bugs she ate in day one laid eggs in her skull and now she's blind and probably gonna have her grey matter feasted on. Steve is revolted but knows that there's no chance to get her through to mom to take her to a doctor. Not like there's a hospital in Harvest anyways. You know what? I'm tired of this paper boy. I'm killing his ass. Holy smokes, he's packing heat! Attacking this kid reveals he's got a goddamn Draco on him. He pulls it out on you, he tries to shoot you dead if you keep forgetting the paper. His blicky makes gunning innocent people down a lot more fun, I'll have to say. We know that the postmaster burnt down the TV station, but we can't really get answers out of him. The cops are no help too. Wait, Edna did what? I rush over to the diner to where we get to see a cutscene where Edna hung herself and her daughter. Since she can't provide for herself or her child, she feels that the only way is to escape is to die and she takes her child with her. She doesn't know it yet, but it's your fault this happened. This cutscene is a superb example of dark comedy. The crying sheriff eating a pie and the sign losing power are both funny, but don't entirely detract from the reality that a business owner was pressured into death because of your arson attack. Look at the composition, it's very well composed. Afterwards, I head over to see the damage at the TV station, and look at that, Ranger Rider turned into a ghoul. He survived the fire, but not without the damage, and is looking to split town. Fallout came out just a year after Harvester, actually. I wonder if Interplay played that game. The town feels so lonely now, but with a lot of people dead and kind of just reacting to the news. I actually don't mind this feeling on the sixth day compared to the fourth and fifth. The sixth day reminds me a lot of the section of Persona 3 where everyone is kind of just depressed and miserable because they knew if they're gonna die if Nyx isn't stopped. It's very sobering, and at least feels like the result of your actions where people are kind of depressed and lonely in the sixth part, whereas 4 and 5 was just kind of awkward and middling. Returning to Ralph's house, we could finally talk to the family about the recent fires. You can actually confess to being behind it to Mrs. Potsdam, which will instantly land you a game over. If you confess to Stephanie, she's pretty pissed off and wants you to knock off joining the Lodge. Three people are now dead because of Steve's actions, or inactions in some cases. Even if none of them are intentional, he has blood on his hands. Not counting any of the NPCs we killed for fun, mind you. This isn't Postal 2, you are forced to get these people killed every single time. The people telling you to do all this ensure that it isn't your fault by gaslighting you, but the equally delusional townspeople think otherwise. Steve has to repress it all and pretend his actions aren't entirely his own. That blame and responsibility can be shirked or at least placed in the hands of fate to avoid punishment or consequences or just plain feeling bad about it. The only thing we have left to do is go to the lodge, where the sergeant of arms tells us to wait for an invitation, and that we will know what the signs are. Wandering aimlessly, we return home, where our mom tells us something horrible has happened to Stephanie, but won't tell us what. We run back to her house, where Ralph is freaking out. Now wait a minute, Matt! No! Entering her room with the sheriff, we find a spinal cord in a head, presumably belonging to Stephanie. Next to the body is a lodge invitation. Steve is furious that the Lodge may have killed her, the only other sane person in Harvest, and rushes to the Lodge with the application, but it turns out that wasn't what we needed. The card was just a clue. What we needed to get inside the Lodge was her spinal cord and skull itself. If we read the application, we find out that the Lodge knows our surname, Mason. With this, there is no doubt that the Lodge doesn't know the truth of what happened to Steve and Stephanie. What you need to do is walk to the cemetery and use the ladder on the Potsdam family crypt. You know, the thing that no one's ever talked about before hiding in the last screen of the cemetery location. Break the glass with the weapon and hop inside to find- Oh my god, what is that? Some kind of rabid dog wants us dead, so we better equip one of our many weapons and cut that thing apart. What's up with this place? A guard dog inside of a crypt. A crypt that kinda looks like a location in Planescape Torment for that matter. Inside the coffin is the spinal cord and skull, which we pocket. After getting this far, and having done so much, pocketing a human skull and spine is no big deal for Steve Mason. Fun fact, you can show people the spine and skull you carry around for some interesting results. 
If you show it to Miss Potsdam, Stephanie's mother, she calls you a dumbass, and you get to see what the blood drive actually looks like. Returning to the lodge, we give the skull and spine to the armsmen, and we're allowed into the lodge, finally. Something very critically important to mention is that from this point on, the game switches genres entirely. It goes from point-and-click exploration on a day-by-day -day cycle to a dungeon crawler, and I'm being completely serious. There's no town to explore, NPCs to speak to are limited, it's just you, your weaponry, and puzzle-solving skills going through a colossal dungeon that will test everything you've learned thus far, and perhaps ask a bit more for you. I really can't stress that enough, the game just gets bored of its previous gameplay style and switches entirely, and is the best thing ever. They really did not care what anyone else thought, they went for it and put caution to the wind, and it's fantastic. The decision is really something special, because the game completely course corrects without warning and you just have to deal with it, just like Steve has to. It is wonderful how immersive the decision is from a storytelling point and how it works with the unexpected to pull the rug out from under your feet. There's no way to get back past this point, so let's have a little fun at Harvest before we go. The blood drive is on Sunday and we'll probably end up killing everyone anyways. So here's a small montage of people being killed. Hey, uh, post-production, Peter here. I think Steambox's, Steam's uh, DOS box is so wonky that I couldn't land a lot of hits on people who are supposed to die, so I stole some footage from the internet of people dying. Please, for the love of God, you should probably just get the GOG version, because Steam's version is so broken, I did not find out a lot of things you can do just because it didn't work. <laughs> Fun fact, did you know this game has cheat codes? There's an option in the menu for cheat codes, but entering them there doesn't work. Just typing them normally in the overworld does work, however, and you'll hear a shotgun sound notifying it worked. With passwords, you can give yourself all the obtainable items for whatever day you're on, get max health, even teleport to different levels of the lodge early. I've put all the codes on screen. Most of them are named after infamous serial killers like Manson or true crime cases like The Son of Sam. Very disturbing stuff, and not exactly a subtle clue for the potential fate of Steve. Through this, we can find that a lot of things that take multiple days can be done instantly. If you killed the paperboy in day one, you can get the broom closet key early and the bat. There is a shocking amount of experimentation you can get away with either by killing someone early or just knowing where to go prior. I would argue Harvester is even more fun on a second playthrough just for this reason. It eliminates the guessing game of where to go and focused so much more on a condensed, much more enjoyable experience. I recommend you play through this section of the game at least twice because we won't get anything like it when we enter the lodge. Before we're admitted, we're stripped of all of our items. Sorry, I lied about the tampons being important. <laughs> and gives you this, the Harvester Blade. A blade resembling the symbol found all over town. Am I dumb for only now realizing it's supposed to look like the letter H? We're told one last thing. Stephanie may not actually be dead, and we can find our answers on the second floor of the lodge. Without anything holding us back now, and not so much as a goodbye to our family and community, we enter the lodge to escape the blood drive and figure out the truth. But you've been watching this video for a while now. Thank you if you have, by the way. Depending on your skill level, this part can either be the last third of the game or its second half. I think we need a little breather to put us at ease. Part two of the Harvester video will start right after this break.
After another disc switch, we meet with the valet, surrounded by busts of influential American figureheads. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Barbara Bush, all important old men crucial to the founding of the country, implying that the lodge is very, very old. The valet calls you an exterminator, here to eliminate all the pests inside the building. Subtle. He tells you to have a strong stomach for what is ahead, and I extend that warning to everyone watching. You fall into a trap door, and the dungeon crawling can truly begin. We end up in a disgusting, undulating tunnel made entirely out of flesh and bone. Blue veins coat the interior, pools of acid hiss, and puckering sphincters gurgle open and closed. We navigate this living spaz kid drawing until we run into an uh combat is something you should absolutely get used to now because it's only going to get crazier from here always have a weapon with you equipped no matter what and be prepared to mash that right mouse button wildly and hope your hits connect slice this giant blue eye open in the room and you get to escape the flesh tunnel but don't relax just yet this ornate hallway looks nice but you have a layer of acid currently dissolving your health and the only way to clean it is to talk to this Rob Schneider looking guy who will clean you for $5. Where do you get $5? Go in the middle door and kill a monster dog in this room full of strewn corpses and go to the right, which takes you to a bar. Drink the strong beer and fight off your reflection, which is armed with the scythe for some reason. I guess the beer was spiked. Killing him gives you a small key, which opens this minuscule and nearly impossible to see cash register, which gives you a separate items of $200 and $5. Now just run back to the attendant, give him the $5, and you're good to go. If you don't do this quick enough, you just die because your health is steadily draining. You'll probably be near death anyways, so I honestly just recommend typing Nick on the keyboard to restore your health. The Lodge has so much nonsense designed to sap your health, and you get so little healing items that you should never feel ashamed to visit the Pokemon Center via cheat codes. Now that there isn't a timer, we can take all the time in the world to explore. The door on the right leads to a calming study filled with books written by Third Reich authors, mounted busts of mutant animals watching over you with their four-eyed malice. If we take a left in the dining hall area, we meet a chef who complains about us killing a lot of people because he needs to make meals out of them for the high-ranking members. We need to take a leg and torso flesh parts, as well as the sandwich on the counter, which can heal our health. Yes, there are ways to heal your health naturally, and the sandwich is one way. The medicine you found in Stephanie's house heals you if you interact with it. You don't really get into a lot of mandatory fights, so I don't blame you for thinking this is a bit of an impromptu tutorial. If you kill the butcher, we can get his butcher's knife. We need to kill the attendant, because he has a shotgun for you. Probably the best weapon in the entire game. Range is king in combat, and this does a load of damage from very far away, so the only drawback is the limited ammunition. Before you leave, adjust the cloak on the rack here to this spot here, and we can enter a secret dungeon to pick up more shotgun shells and the scythe, the best melee weapon in the game. The only weapons you will need to use in the entire game past this point is the scythe, the shotgun for some tougher enemies, and maybe one more weapon later. Press the switch on the wall and unlock the door to continue and prepare for a tough fight against whatever the hell that is. Interact with the gumball machine to heal your health and collect the pool stick and baseball bat weapons for fun, but don't actually use them. See these bubbles in the swamp water here? Walking past it leads to instant death from some kind of giant leech monster. What you need to do is feed one of the body parts you picked up from the butcher to the bubbles, walk past it, and enter this disgusting pooey bathroom and grab the weed killer. Go back and feed the other body part to the bubbles again, or you will die again. Then go all the way back to the bar, and enter the door on the right and use the weed killer on this giant man-eating plant. Oh yeah, monsters are extraordinarily commonplace in the lodge. Remember how weird it was when that starved dog was in the Potsdam crypt? Steve doesn't even flinch when seeing giant plants, skeletal monsters, whatever the hell the flesh monster was. To be honest, I should be shocked and maybe a little confused why there are suddenly creatures and beasts all around me, but being exposed to the human monsters in Harvest makes me kind of appreciate the animalistic, fantastical monsters you don't have to grapple with slaughtering. Believe me, a skeleton monster is the least weird part of being here. Open the fountain gate and engage in the stupidest, most frustrating, and illogical puzzle in the entire game. 
What you need to do is find a key to open the door, and you need to spot it inside the water of the fountain. Can you see it? Look closely. There it is. It's right by your shoulder. I spent damn near 30 minutes looking for this bull key. Did they even play test this part? I was ripping my hair out when I finally found it. Even when you do have it, I honestly don't know where the keyhole was. I just randomly clicked over this wall until it decided to open up for no discernible reason. Rip out the Sam Squanch's guts and then climb the rope to level 2 of the lodge. We find ourselves in an art exhibit shepherded by someone who looks like Lex Friedman. He has a lot to say about the nature of art. Specifically about how art made intentionally to disturb and shock someone is necessary for people to appreciate art meant to please and inspire. The most extreme works are the hardest to dismiss, is the brilliant line that encapsulates the entire game. He isn't wrong, either. People often don't give disturbing works recognition or analysis because of their topics or subject matter, which presents the bias people have against controversial pieces of art. This is not lost on the man telling you this because he understands the desire to destroy something that makes you ask questions you might not be comfortable with, calling it a valid form of expression for such art. That statement comes to life when you realize the only way to progress is to cut him down. The art exhibit has become a living, breathing metaphor for Harvest itself. When something grotesque and demented is presented, there often exists a barrier preventing people from engaging with it because of the natural human instinct to be repulsed by depictions of violence, social taboos, and everything Harmist immerses itself in. Topics like child abuse and sexual depravity are comedic and in your face in this game, but still have statements to say about society and how people deal with it. People ignore pederasty, violence is entertainment to small children, these are still things alive today. There's a reason why this game takes place in the 50s. It's mocking the often idealized view of American society by presenting contemporary problems, showing how rotten to the core America was even back then. The Colonel says it best. There are no safeguards. This is the 50s. This brief section of the game because something of a self-fulfilling prophecy for Harvester. People didn't look deep into it because of the disgusting nature of its artistic expression and wrote it off. The developers were aware of this and put their thoughts into the game, regardless of the game's success, which was none. That move was beyond gutsy. It's a step above bold. It's damn near self-harming, and I have to admire it. We're allowed to stroll through the art gallery, looking at incredibly minimalistic paintings and sculptures. We don't get to see any of them up close, just Steve's reactions. Some statues are repulsive, erotic, intimidating. We aren't given a good view of any of them, so the ambience of the scene fills your mind, allowing you to come to your own conclusions. Previously, the music was tertiary at best, but when you're given a lot more freedom to explore in the lodge, the soundtrack comes to life with astounding sounds. The soundtrack was composed by Zorch Productions, an indie music group somewhere in Northern Europe. They don't have a lot of media presence apart from Harvester, but let it be known that their work is not underappreciated. I feel like a lot of the Lodge's environments are what the kids today would call liminal. Many of these places feel sort of familiar or comfortable, but they're sparsely populated and not trustworthy. Everything just looks off in a genuine way not from the artistic intent, but simply how the game looks because of its rushed and development chaotic cycle. It's something that can't really be replicated through effort, and I haven't seen another game that does it like Harvester does. These clay dolls, or robots, whatever they're supposed to be, roam these halls and you must take care of them. One of them holds a key, which lets you leave the exhibit for a lounge that's tough to navigate because of the incredibly awkward perspective. The whole game kind of looks uncomfortable and strange because the draw distance is all messed up and basically nothing is proportioned correctly. It might look uncanny to some, but it's charming to me. Except this place. Having to click the center of the screen and not fully understand that you're moving in a circle is a huge pain in the ass. One of these doors leads to a room where you can challenge a chess master, who is played by one of the artists of the game, Timothy Higgins, to a game of chess. I, I think you can play chess with him? But Steam DOSBox freaked out so bad that I pressed something, which made the chess master angry, so he sent the giant king chess piece after me, and I hit it once and it died, but the chess master got an axe to the face. That was entirely accidental and I had no idea what was going on, because it was too damn fast. You must examine his disgusting split open head to receive the key. 
Why this key was in his brain, I don't know. I actually had to censor this for YouTube because it's so detailed for no reason. You'll come to notice that there are many ways to progress without killing people, but killing them is usually the quicker, more convenient option. We meet a janitor down a set of double doors, who you really need to take out with your shotgun because he has his own gun that can melt you quickly. He drops a nail gun, which isn't very good because it doesn't deal a lot of damage, but we're really strapped for ranged weapons, and there is a place or two to use this. Use the chest master key on this door and oh god, oh god, oh god, blast that clown to hell and back. Then pick up his chainsaw. A melee weapon that runs on gas. QB? I don't, I don't know how to say it. And another key. Love his death animation too. This entire room is a creepy child's birthday party I don't want to be a part of. A lot of rooms in the lodge are meant just to scare you, and I know I've been on tangents about the artistic nature and violence and whatever, but I think there is a lot of content that's just there to shock you like this clown party is very fun, because there's a clear line when you're supposed to take something in and think about it internally, and when you're not you should just play the game and have fun. A lot of video games that try and have a deeper meaning kind of forget to be video games and let you have fun, so it ends up being something of a walking simulator, or they use game mechanics obnoxiously to convey its stupid story, which Harvester doesn't seem to do. I'm very impressed by how easily you can switch from thinking about a topic deeply to slicing crazy clowns in half without being whipped in the face by its rapidly changing tone. There is a little side quest of sorts where you can talk to this librarian who isn't a member because women can't join the lodge, but just manages books. She wants a book from a Mr. Kane, but it honestly isn't worth it because she and her clues are dead obvious, so I would just say ignore it. That Kane figure you have to deal with is sort of implied to be Kane from the Bible, but it's pretty underwhelming. Yes, Kane being alive in the 50s is underwhelming. Harvester is a pretty crazy game, guys. Another set of red double doors unlocked by a new key leads to a stage. Exploring, we need to grab the two flags here, three planks of wood here, and a sandwich for health. Go in this room here, kill the zombie, I think that's a zombie, and grab the lighter fluid. Click on these absurdly tiny masks and operate them. Have their faces like this, and a secret door opens. I went over that pretty rapid fire, but if you aren't following a guide for the lodge, uh, good luck. If you miss any of these, you are completely boned for later puzzles and either have to run all the way back to pick them up, or die and have to reload a save. Save often, remember? Remember when I said the lodge can feel like the other half of the game depending on ability? You had better clear your damn schedule for some of these puzzles, bud, because they do not play around. In the secret door room, we can find Stephanie's clothes, but not Stephanie. We enter a boiler room that blares at us because we just activated a timed puzzle that will kill us if we don't solve it. No, we can't see the timer, because there is no timer. You just gotta do it quickly. I guess it was too hard to program, Sparky? Oh, please. Grab the wrench on the ground, grab three pipe pieces, spin the valve to stop the steam. Use the wrench on the broken pipe, combine all the pipes in your inventory, put it where the broken pipe was, and spin the valve again. Now you're done. This process isn't too hard, but still sucks ass because of how annoying the sound is, and you have no idea how much time you have left. We get another key to the door on the left, kill the electrician in the generator room, and continue left to a room full of molten lava. Unless you want to see the hilarious cutscene of Steve on fire, use the wooden boards to create a safe path to travel on. The ceiling is closing in on us, and this room, so we gotta use the two flags on these stone pedestals to stop it, which automatically opens a new door. Kill this random police officer and climb up the rope to enter the third level of the lodge, our final section of the dungeon. Really glad I'm done with level 2, because past the art exhibit and clown room, the puzzles were a huge pain in the ass. Level 3 is especially weird, because nearly every room has a different theme going on. We can listen to the host of each room and do what they want, or just kill everyone inside, effectively refuting their argument. The first room has an enormous fat midget downing a bunch of burgers. These burgers can restore our health, but make everyone in the room hostile to us if they try and eat it. This room is called the Temple of the Mystery of Abstinence. You're supposed to let the guy eat the food, but that means you won't get it and not get the free health. The moral here, spoken plainly by the Secret Service men, is that those who advocate for abstinence 
in this case refraining from eating food, are those with an abundance of it. In this case, the obese man with way too many burgers who won't share them for Steve, someone who desperately needs them much more than he does. The meek will inherit the earth once the strong are done with it is a cut and dry statement that those in power subject people beneath them from staining what they can already not receive. Not exactly a subtle metaphor for class and power instead of a secret society building. Remember what you have learned. Next is the temple of the mystery of motherly love. Three identical children are eating their mother while she muses about how motherhood is taxing and children are parasites in a cynical sick sense. There is a lot of FMV cutscenes of this woman's kids eating her legs like she's a buffalo wild wings platter. There isn't much else to do but kill her children once they start attacking you. No real debate to be held other than exposing that some mums see their kids as leeches who feed off them. The simplest way to refute an antinatalist is simply to kill them. The Temple of the Mystery of Religion is next, filled with false priests representing a warped view of Christianity. Answering the question was wrong means they will attack you. Answering the biblically correct questions, like the Lord dwelling in all of us through the Holy Spirit makes them all attack you. Showing the hypocrisy of those who call themselves holy and closest to God couldn't be further from spiritual cleanliness, instead believing some nonsense about wombat except their twisted visions. The next room is a straw hut with strewn bodies all around, a woman and her two children. A large man, a veteran from Nam who just slaughtered his wife and kids from the stress of trying to acclimate to a normal life after years of killing people. This is the temple of the mystery of morality. Is it moral to serve your country by killing people and simply go back to being normal once your scheduled war is done? The nail gun is very useful in this situation. Next room we meet... Ralph? The Temple of the Mystery of Flesh reveals that Ralph burying Karen alive was his initiation, and that he let Lodge members into Stephanie's room, which had accepted him as a member. Twist came right out of nowhere, but is superbly done. I was so focused on everything else that I forgot that Ralph kept trying and trying to get into the Lodge, and now he's made it as a member. He doesn't even know if she's alive, and he doesn't care. The metaphor here is that you have to give up meat, in this case Stephanie, to gain meat, as in all the fresh meat Ralph could ever want from the lodge. The nature of sacrifice is vile, so we can thankfully cut him open and finally put the rage pig down. Do I look five one, bitch? Right after that is the Temple of the Mystery of Lust, where we are accosted by prostitutes. Just as often as they are desired objects of lust, as in Ladies of the Evening, are scorned for the exact same reasons, desire. Some men cave in to their lust, while some weaponize it as disdain. Both men are guilty of intense desire. The nature of the prawn industry is no secret, given that Love Palace is obscured by a disco ball that spells out Lovelace, as in Linda Lovelace, an adult actress who blew the whistle on a lot of the disgusting acts in the industry once she published her book and became a born-again Christian. I think you can sleep with the women here if you give them the $200 item, but the whole environment just makes me queasy. It also gives you STDs. The Temple of Beauty is really funny because if you don't keep feeding this woman compliments, she immediately tries to kill you. The Temple of the Mystery of Pain has a strange man inviting you to torture a random man because, in his own words, the sensation of pain is a shared experience that motivates the human experience for daily life, societies, and all human interactions. I think you can torture this guy, but the game bugged out and didn't let me, so I emptied all of my nails into the strange guy instead. Don't forget the syringe on the ground here, which heals all your health and cures the STD status if you have it. You take a shot of the vaccine. The cure was definitely worse than the virus. Harvester once again predicts the future, I guess. The Mystery of Charity is next, a room that says that charity just makes one man poorer and another richer, that charity is inherently selfish because all of the benefits charities get to reap like being tax exempt and getting fat paychecks. Even considering the blind beggar in the room is selfish for demanding free things instead of working for them. It all comes to light when he asks Steve to get him something, which he has nothing useful to give, which enrages him to the point of attacking Steve. Might seem weird, but a lot, if not most charities, are actually just scams designed to consolidate wealth. Why do you think celebrities and companies support charities all the time? 
People just see the words non-profit and think it's true. The Temple of the Mystery of Mercy is a coliseum look-alike where a gladiator asks you to kill two elderly lodge members for your initiation. Sparing them makes him speak about how refusing to take their lives has made you yourself vulnerable to his wrath, which means you must kill him in retaliation. Either way, blood will be spilled, and that true mercy doesn't exist because someone must be dead by the end of the day. Any act of mercy from you just shifts the focus of violence and contempt to you. Sparing the old people's lives means yours is on the line. You did get a cool sword though. Please save your game by this point, the next room is horrible. This room is supremely retarded. This wanker points a TV remote and summons some guy who pulls out his six shooter and melts your health right away. For the love of God, keep as many shotgun shells as you can and empty them in this twat. It doesn't end there. Same guy summons a robot that isn't much easier to take out. If you manage to survive this encounter, the guy vanishes or gets sucked in the TV or whatever, and you get to catch your breath. This room was infuriating. I kept restarting and mashing my right click in vain that all my hits would connect fast enough to kill both enemies. I was thinking a lot about each of the mystery temples while doing this part about how they tackled different subjects and how consistent it all was. Steve doesn't have the answers or even really care about what's going on. He just wants the answers to his own quest, which none of them can provide. Novel concept, an ideological debate against someone who doesn't care. Steve's role as the guy we're supposed to project onto helps us think about a solution ourselves. I can't say I have the perfect solution for all the problems being presented because they're all embodied by people. The traumatized war vet, the selfish mother, the blind beggar, all caricatures of their own symbolism. So trying to solve the issues they embody without tailoring it to everyone is a fool's task. What I'm saying is there might not be a solution. We're just seeing all of this to be crushed by the weight of these problems existing. There's something to be said that all of these rooms reflect the hypocritical aspect of something that should be positive in most contexts. Abstinence and motherly affection seem like very positive traits, but they're being exposed to the cynicism of harvest and have become warped and polluted. Some temples are more fun than others for combat encounters and conversations, but none overstay their welcome or feel too drawn out, at least when they function properly. Each room looks vastly different to one another, so it's not likely one of them would get too stale or repetitive. If you've gotten to this point in Harvester anyways, you're in for the long haul. Once you leave the TV room, there is absolutely no going back, so I highly recommend you save this one last time. Our last room is the Inner Sanctum, where the school principal greets us, revealing his lodge membership. His indoctrination of Harvest's children has not gone unnoticed. But there's one more encounter to fight, this… uh, wizard? I, I think he's a wizard because he shoots magical bolts at you, and you had better take him out quickly. Once you slay him, the game is effectively over. Did that feel anticlimactic? It does, to me, and I thought we'd get to at least talk to the principal, or do something. But Steve doesn't stop for love nor money, and he confronts the armsmen at the end. The cutscene here is very long and shoots a lot of info very quickly, so I'll summarize. We ask about Stephanie by giving up the doll we picked up from the clown. Stephanie is alive, but undressed and held hostage. This weird iron lung contraption she's in was connected to the ropes we had to climb to progress as a final F you to Steve. Stephanie is released, but Steve wants one more thing. The truth. The armsman explains that the monsters, the askew nature of Harvest, absolutely everything, is a simulation that's been affected by the subject's mind. Meaning that Steve is somewhere hooked up in a lab by the Harvest Moon Cult, which does exist outside of the reality of Harvest being tested for initiation, meaning that everything you've done, people you've met and killed, has all been fake and a test specifically for you. Steve has completed the tasks and is allowed to join the cult and become a killer, a part of a secret society of serial killers and elites with the sole motive to sue chaos into the world through death and destruction. You're given one last choice. You can become unhooked from the machine and go back to the real world and join the Harvester cult, but Stephanie cannot come with you. The second choice is to live in Harvest forever, married to Stephanie, but the both of you will be killed in the real world. The choice is freely yours. The cult wants you to join them, while Stephanie wants you to reject them and live together with her. 
you are free to choose either. First off... What the fuck? Let me break this all down. Steve and apparently Stephanie are the only real people in Harvest, hooked up to a machine that simulates reality programmed entirely by the cult, which exists in the real world, as in the world outside of the virtual reality of Harvest, made to test future candidates for the cult. We don't know how they got these two in the first place, and it doesn't really matter. I must ask, if the machine's purpose was to create new Lodge members who are also serial killers, why even give the option to refuse? I know the question flies in the face of the entire game, but if you're going to do a virtual reality twist, I highly recommend you at least make it more consistent with the game. But somehow, this twist worked better in Harvester than in Danganronpa 2. Huh. Regardless of if you kill anyone, you don't absolutely have to and follow all the orders given to you in the Lodge, you pass the test. Maybe that was too advanced for a 1996 computer game, but I feel like it's a sorely missed opportunity to have all your actions flipped back on you. If you played like a sociopathic freak, should you even get a choice in becoming a cult member? If Chrono Trigger could remember your actions for a cutscene, I feel like Harvester should have too. Or perhaps include some kind of alignment system like Shin Megami Tensei where taking specific actions and choosing specific dialogue contributes to an alignment that decides your ending. Perhaps an effect of the chaotic development of the game means that many features that would have greatly benefited it had to be excluded from the release. Now, that being said, armed with all this information, I chose to kill Stephanie and escape myself. Why? Well, we haven't been shown any proof that she exists in the outside world, we can at least see this, a part monitor flatlines when Steve is killed in the blood drive, so he exists, but I'm not so sure about her. Choosing this ending means we must beat a quivering, begging Stephanie to death mercilessly. And by beat to death, I mean tear out her skull like scorpion. Damn. Steve awakes in a lab and is congratulated by the Lodge on becoming a fully fledged member. Unfortunately, Stephanie is revealed to be a real person hooked up. But for some reason, she's in her underwear while Steve is fully dressed. Steve hitchhikes with a random woman, until he mercilessly butchers her with a knife. Cut to Steve, presumably at home, playing Harvester. The game we... game we're playing right now! Yes, Harvester does legitimately exist in the real world of Harvester. Steve's actual mother chastises him for playing such a violent video game meant clearly for breeding more serial killers, which Steve sarcastically denies. He, start he starts laughing about Roadrunner cartoons, and we see that he also ate the woman he attacked in the car. This is the bad ending of the game, where Steve joins the Lodge and becomes a serial killer, attacking random people to spread chaos. What can we learn from this? We learn that the Order of the Harvest Moon is a real organization in the real world of Harvester, and that the Harvester game which seems to both be playable as a video game and as an interactive simulation, was designed to recruit new members, with Steve being the newest one. This twist starts to become clearer when you realize this, and that the simulation aspect can often change depending on the person hooked up as explained by the Sergeant Arms. Steve admired Tucker cars, and apparently lives in Texas, so these things manifested in the simulation the cheat codes being named after famous true crime cases like the Manson family and Son of Sam murders also implies that these codes were manually programmed by the cult, potentially implying that these murders had something to do with them, either their influence or suggesting these murderers were members of the cult. The suggestion that this cult is behind many of the most infamous mass murders in human history simply because they felt like it is very eerie, and just maybe not entirely unsubstantiated. There are a lot of theories, many of them more ridiculous than others, that these killers are connected in some way to a greater cult or organization. Program to Kill is a book all about this, and Gilbert Austin would probably be delighted to read it. The idea of playing Harvester turning you into an instant serial killer may seem silly, but it is a very strange coincidence that Steve's on-screen actor later got arrested for possession of cheese pizza. Not a joke or exaggeration, that seriously happened. I've never seen a game prove its own point correct so many times that it made me dry in the mouth. He's even wearing this same flannel, it's absurd. Was he method acting? He did it again too! He's been arrested twice for cheese pizza and spent like two years total behind bars. 
maybe we're all in Harvester too. But what of the good ending? Loading a previous save, we are given the choice to marry Stephanie and live the rest of our lives in Harvest, but be killed in the real world. Him and Stephanie get married, buy a house, presumably after Steve got the job at the slaughterhouse, and have a child together. Things seem peachy until we cut back to the real world, where Steve and Stephanie die coldly on observation tables with the two lab workers working on them watching, while a cabal of shadowy figures watch above them. They comment that the virtual reality sims are inconvenient, and they wish to go back to the old-fashioned way of creating killers, eugenics. The game ends, and this is our good ending. This is supposed to be the intended ending, the way to prove that just because you played a violent video game doesn't mean you'll start killing and eating people, but I have some issues with it. I would assume the FMVs were recorded early and didn't account for a lot of the specific details, but how can Steve and Stephanie live a happy life in Harvest? Depending on your playthroughs, a lot of people in Harvest are dead, and even without you being a sociopath, the town's boned. A lot of the buildings are burned down, countless people are dead, including Stephanie's fake father Ralph. I know there's more of the town we don't get to visit, but can the two really live easily? Especially knowing that everything is a simulation made to test them? Think about it, if you and your wife are the only real human beings alive in town, would you be happy enough to raise a child in it? Actually, that idea might be the basis for like all the marriages in the country. I don't think there even is a world past the mountains of Harvest anyways. That's got blow. Would Stephanie still marry a Steve that freely killed people for the lols? Or is that part non-canon to the good ending, but canon to the bad ending? Also, the lodge looking the exact same in the real world as the outside world is hilarious. The mentioning of eugenics is interesting because remember the busts of the Founding Fathers when you first entered? If the Lodge truly dates to at least the 1700s, who knows what their goals are and how long they've been around for? This is one of the darker secret societies I've ever seen in a game, and Lodge could use their own entire video connecting to true crime and conspiracies and whatnot. With those two endings, we have reached the very end of Harvester. It is extraordinarily difficult to try and summarize the entire game in one sentence, and most people don't even try to. Chances are if you ask someone about it, they'll just tell you you were always a kidder, Steve. Let's do a rapid fire for the quick goods and bads of Harvester. It has a wonderful story. As in told, entertainingly, the content itself is unhinged. It's unorthodox and confusing, sometimes not paced the best, but the clues are laid early on, and the tone is rock solid and established right away. The twists and turns feel unexpected, but never unearned. There really isn't anything like it. The game does something really impressive and manages to be hilarious about things you probably shouldn't be making jokes about, but damn near every joke is laugh out loud funny because of how hammy everything is. The performances from the on-screen actors work so well because everyone is so silly in delivering their lines that the quality of the acting sorta of doesn't really matter. There aren't a whole lot of FMB cutscenes in the game, so you won't really get a chance to see them walk around and engaging with other characters, but that's the Harvester's benefit. Some may say it's janky and clumsy, but I say it's entertaining and witty. Harvester balances phenomenally well in having a deep purpose and also being a video game. It didn't pull an Undertale and make a really tedious game where storytelling comes first and playing a game feels like anal torture. Even if the combat is bad, there aren't huge swaths of gameplay that are solely conversations or just combat. Even when one is clearly the focus in the moment, the other is never thrown out. The Lodge swaps from room to room like this, conversation to bloody murder. That purpose as well is something we don't often see. It might be unorthodox to critique the usage of violence in media and also use it as a selling point, but the entire point of the game, referring to the in-universe version of Harvester, was to program serial killers, while the version of Harvester we have was meant to critique the very idea the evil cult wanted to use it for. There are so many ways to progress at your own pace. You can go through day by day to collect items in their intended path, or just kill people and skip it early. You don't even need to do that whole permission slip nonsense at the butcher's place if you just kill Pat and take the meat off the counter and give it to the dog. There are endless examples of ways to obtain items early on and getting around to doing an arduous task that I simply couldn't show for the sake of time. The dialogue is out of this world. Such a unique blend of old-timey slang and delightfully strange speaking patterns and mannerisms. Everyone sounds distinct and the actors speak nothing like each other. 
Aside from the shocking violence, the writing is what people remember the most. Even the description for background items is superb. This game was a nigh uncompromised vision from its developers, and especially from Gilbert Austin. Nothing quite lines up with it because it was made in its own league without showing many inspirations. Except for Twin Peaks, this game is basically just Twin Peaks. But it's far from perfect. Combat is a huge pain in the dick and results in frequent rage quitting from me. It's so finicky and uncoordinated, only made worse that it's on DOSBox. There's a huge variety of weapons, but some are so much more useful than others that experimenting with them it just isn't worth your time. There are no reasons not to just use the scythe when you get it all the time and balancing out firearms for tougher enemies. Not that you would know which ones are tougher by the random nature of each encounter. There isn't any way to tell who will deal more damage than what, not from your neighbors to the monsters in the game. The animations are often too quick and you only know when someone has a gun when they shoot you dead without expecting it. Many if not all the puzzles in the game are total guesswork and take much longer just to figure out what's going on than trying to solve them. I respect this game for letting you figure it out on your own and not treat you like a fool because your game was made for Twitch streamers, but the total lack of direction is a real pain and leads to a lot of wasted time. The fountain puzzle especially makes me regret not throwing myself at a moving car when I was 5. I'm aware the game's full vision was at least a little cut for time and budget, which is normal in the world of game development, but it's still a shame. It's animated strangely, proportioned strangely, it kind of looks like you're looking at a game through a funhouse mirror the entire time, and not intentionally. I also honestly wasn't a fan of the good ending. It feels like some pages of the script were kind of missing, and I really wish it counted for how we treated Harvest and her people. Stephanie as well really felt two-dimensional. Being confined to her room and later confined to the lodge means she's entirely static, but I wish we could have gotten more out of her perspective and see her change and develop alongside Steve during different segments of the game. Like having the two argue about Steve's actions while he's about to do them, like burning down Edna's diner. Even with these flaws, the game manages to have an incredibly dedicated and powerful cult following that has single-handedly kept this game alive. If Night Dive hadn't released the game on modern platforms like Steam, GOG, and Zoom, it would have been left up to fans sharing the game files around like it's Toho. Kind of surprised it never got a physical PC release later, but Monkey's Paw would determine to be from artificial scalper company like Limited Run. I have no better example to show how dedicated people are to Harvester than to showcase Lodge Level 4, a channel solely dedicated to discussions around the game. The guy running it straight up has a copy of the original script, containing oodles of details that never made it into the game. I didn't know that France enjoyed the game so much, or that it has a somewhat larger fan base in Russia due to an insane unofficial translation, or that it was bundled together with the seventh guest in France. There is absolutely no better place to find out hidden details than Lodge Level 4. The video covering the original 94 script is truly fascinating. Even when the game hasn't been relevant since its release, even if it wasn't popular when it came out, its small fanbase keeps pumping it alive, and I'm more than proud to consider myself a part of it. Even with all the game's flaws, I still thoroughly enjoyed my time with Harvester. It makes me sad that such a unique and convention-defying, artful video game wasn't recognized and led to its developers flunking out. I don't know where Gilbert Austin went, or the rest of the team, but I can only hope for good things for everyone involved. Personally, I would love to see Austin's return to video games. This video was initially planned to be around 30 minutes, maybe an hour, but something compelled me to document my entire playing process experience because it had such a tremendous effect on me. I simply felt that my analysis would not be complete if I didn't go over the game with a fine comb, which is why it is the preposterous length it is now. My previous upload, the Mario ROM hack, took maybe an hour to complete 100% if you knew what you were doing. Harvester took me around 8 hours of playing casually, and that didn't cover everything. There are still oodles of details I probably didn't know or just didn't cover because even with this video's length, I had to cut it off somewhere. Oh, this is just a 2 hour plot summary- SHUT UP! The entire point of the game is to play it from start to end. How else am I going to show that without you showing you that from start to end? Go watch Super Eye Patch Wolf if you want a giant nothing burger. And then, Steve starts doing something interesting. He starts crying. There was simply no way I would be getting any sleep if I wasn't able to include absolutely everything I had to say about its topics, gameplay, 
everything. Even now, I'll probably play the game later and notice something I missed and will probably add in the comments section later. Some people are concerned the shocking content in Harvester would be simply too much for this modern age, but I don't think that's the case. I mean, the game was re-released on modern PCs in 2014, and no one really cared. It was banned in a lot of countries when it first came out, but most non-fun countries like Germany banned things anyways. In our current age, the exact violence it features and criticizes and uses to make a point has become the standard and not nearly as offensive as it once was. Look at the boys TV show. A show meant for people who enjoy superhero sets media, and there aren't really movements to get that off of Amazon Prime. I really don't believe that people would be upset or offended if something like Harvester was released today, because it already is just without any of the meaningful commentary that made this game stand out amongst violence as entertainment media. Violent media is at an all-time high selling point, but people justify it with narrative inclusions like everyone dying brutally was a bad person, or something that allows our minds to rest at ease and not wrestle with the concept past flashing red color lights. I'm not saying I know best, or even that Harvester is a flawless way to teach the message, because it isn't. But if we aren't careful and let our youth consume endlessly violent drivel, then we might end up like Steve. And as always, thank you for watching Strange Gaming, and have a lovely rest of your day.